spot. Dear, dear colleagues, I'm very happy to welcome you today for this great symposium, Metaverse and the Law. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank warmly the organi organizers of this ambitious event, Larry Di Matteo, professor at the University of Florida, and Michel Canarsa, professor at UCLE and a dean of the law faculty. The program is dense, and uh, international and multidisciplinary perspective promise fruitful discussions. Thanks uh, also to the University of Florida and our research center, Confluence Sciences and Humanities, for the funding of these days. Thanks to our communication service, for the great organization. This symposium comes uh, within the framework of the digital and technical thematic of our research center entitled The Mutations of Law, The Mutations of Standards. It represents also a straight continuation of an overall research studies carried out by the members of our research center and focused on new technologies issues. A symposium on NFT, a symposium on AI and consumer protection, a colloquial and collective book on business law and AI, a research cycle on vulnerable, vulnerable persons and AI, a collective book on smart contracts, blockchain, and digital platforms, and a collective book on global perspectives on law and ethics about AI. It is finally connected with our prospective legal clinic which this year dealt with the applicability of positive law in the metaverse and the status of the avatar through a practical case involving a city duplicating itself in the metaverse. The discourses on new technologies are omnipresent. They are entirely turned on the idea of a revolution, something original and elusive. This is especially the case with the metaverse. The work of the lawyer is probably to take the necessary step back to analyze on the one hand the impacts of these technologies on legal situations and on the other hand the ability of positive law to grasp what is happening there and the need to think a new way of regulating this space. We have a day and a half to reflect and I have no doubt that your reflections, dear contributors, will greatly help us to better understand the reality of metaverse. So thank you again for being there, and I hope that this symposium will be a rewarding experience for you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madeleine. A few words of uh, introduction by Larry uh, and myself, just to welcome, please. Uh, we welcome you here. It's an exciting project. Uh, uh, this is really exciting because we have some new people here, younger people, the next generation of, of scholars, and it's nice to see because we have a tendency to invite the same old people over and over again. So it is fun to have some new blood. I would just say one last thing, and that is these conferences that we've done three now, here in Lyon. We've done others Long too. Chain, yeah, chain. yeah. And uh, uh, Michelle is the idea person. Uh, so the first one was on uh, smart contracts and blockchain. And he said, would you like to do a co-conference on smart contracts? And I said, what the heck are those things? You know, what do you mean? What is that? And then this time around the same thing. Well, how about a conference on the metaverse? And I said, what the hell is the metaverse? <laughs> so uh, I definitely would like to thank him for his, uh, uh, his ideas and his insights, and uh, we enjoy doing these conferences together. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. No, thank you. Actually, yeah, we, when we started in 2017, yeah, it was uh, like, you know, smart blockchains and smart contracts. So it was uh, at the time uh, a quite new subject. And uh, um, in part, it can sound like uh, or look like uh, legal surfing. You know, when there is something hype, you, you try to, you know, do something uh, on it. Uh, but uh, actually, I think it's a fair contribution to um, a systematic analysis of what uh, are the, the legal issues raised by uh, some of the new technologies. So. 
when we started to think about the metaverse, you know, it was, it was still quite hype. And then we, we had chat GPT in the meantime, so it's a bit less hype, but probably will uh, become again. And what is interesting with the, uh, the metaverse, among others, is it is it's still, you know, uh, an unknown uh, flying object <laughs> to a large extent. Uh, so the, the market is not m mature uh, at the moment. And I think it's, it makes sense for us lawyers to start to um, analyze, you know, a, a bit uh, deeper what are the main legal issues uh, uh, raised by, uh, by this uh, technology. As Marjolaine said, uh, we uh, started indeed with the uh, two of our colleagues to tackle these issues on NFTs last January. Uh, so it's a, a, a kind of continuity from that uh, perspective. Welcome to Lyon. Uh, so it's a former uh, prison here, uh, a, a, a real prison, uh, not a prison on the metaverse, fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so from the, the 1860s, okay, so we, we entered this building in 2015, so it's quite, uh, still quite recent, uh, but you, you have to know that uh, it was indeed a prison, yeah? I including during the Second World War, you know, with partisans and so on, so there is a kind of history uh, in, in the place and, uh, and we might continue, you know, to build uh, the history of, of the place again. So welcome to Lyon, welcome to the university. Thank you very much to Larry and to the University of Florida and our research unit for uh, the funding. And now I might give the floor to uh, my colleague Jolene, who will keep the time and chair the first panel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here with you this morning to chair this uh, first session, this introductory session, um, The Metaverse Beyond the Universe. Uh, we'll be listening to three interventions uh, this morning before a short uh, questions and answers uh, session and a coffee break. Uh, three interventions, um, three introductory interventions. Um, we are going to start with the, the most obvious, maybe, uh, a first intervention on the metaphysics of the metaverse. Uh, no, our, our, our friends and colleagues, uh, Sylvia Louche and uh, Mathieu Guillaume, uh, will be uh, presenting us an intervention on technology and philosophy uh, of the metaverse. They are both associate professors at UCLI here uh, in uh, philosophy, uh, and, uh, and I think Mathieu, you also have a PhD in physics, um, but it'll be mostly, uh, mostly Sylvie uh, who will be introducing us, uh, well, it's the, the philosophical issues and dynamics uh, that, that are behind uh, the metaverse. And then we'll move on with, uh, with two other interventions, uh, more of a, a legal introductions uh, to the metaverse. We'll first listen uh, to Tristan uh, girard Gemma, who is also associate professor in the house, uh, and who will be uh, explaining as well the, the role, the function uh, of NFTs and cryptocurrencies and, uh, and more generally blockchain technologies and, uh, and how it relates with uh, the metaverse. And then uh, we'll have a, a dual intervention uh, from our colleagues coming all the way from the Netherlands uh, to be with us uh, with, uh, this morning. Uh, thank you to welcome uh, Daniel Ope. Uh, who is an associate professor at Tilburg University and uh, who will be presenting us uh, on uh, introducing us uh, to the metaverse and uh, contracts, smart contracts, and uh, how the metaverse could be understood as a network and contracts. Uh, and with her, uh, we will have an intervention uh, remotely uh, with her colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Chong Chin Tai, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name, uh, who will be joining us uh, remotely, uh, also from uh, Tilburg University. So without further notice, uh, I'll uh, leave the floor uh, to uh, my colleague, Dr. Sylvia Luce, thank you. I just apologize, I have a class to give. It was not possible to move it, it's at 10, so I will let uh, you in the very good end of Sylvia. I uh, want to precise that she's the, the one who made the, most of the work on our paper, so she's the best place for, for that. And I apologize, so I saw my name here, so I said I, I, would, I would be here just for the beginning. Uh, to say hello and then you can put a, a face on the 
a face on the, on the name, but then uh, I apologize and I will follow the rest of the conference with great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. Twenty minutes for talking about the metaphysics of the metaverse. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> um, so I, I will present uh, as I finally sent in the, the paper, <laughs> and uh, it's like fifteen pages long. Uh, I won't have time, obviously, in twenty minutes to present it all. So I try to select parts, but uh, yeah, let's go. Wow. I'll try to do my best. So as is well known, the term metaverse was coined by Neil Stephenson um, in his 1992 novel Snow Crash, a year or two after what is considered to be the birth date of the internet. The term metaverse came back to the fore after Mark Zuckerberg announced in 2021 his decision to transform um, Facebook into Meta and to declare as his flagship project the creation of a Metaverse. The vocabulary concerning the Metaverse is however not clearly fixed. Etymologically, the term Metaverse comes from the contraction between Meta, as in metaphysics, and Universe and therefore conveys the idea of a universe beyond the usual universe or real environment Yet the term metaverse does not seem to refer to anything beyond our usual world. The universe is concerned refer to digital virtual universes. But just talking about virtual universe still seems too vague. Is every video game already a metaverse? Do we ult ultimately browse a metaverse when we browse the internet? From the outset, it might be interesting to consider two additional criteria which seem to be characteristic of the use of the term, both according to Neil Stephenson and according to Mark Zuckerberg, to be a metaverse, um, a virtual universe must both be immersive and social, where you can meet other users. Although it would require further study, this characterization provides a good starting point for thinking about the notion of the metaverse in all its richness. Let us note that all, um, all the same already that the original metaverse of Neil Stephenson has an additional characteristic uh, that we cannot ignore in our attempt to specify the notion. The Princeps metaverse in the book has the particularity of giving access to other virtual universes, social or not, according to the principle of a hotel corridor, which gives access to a multiplicity of rooms. And Neil Stephenson's metaphor being that of a street, uh, in, and even the street with a capital S. It might be tempting to make this characteristic being an immersive virtual access channel to other virtual universes, the heart of the notion of metaverse, by relegating the social uh, uh, dimension to the background. Nevertheless, this position seems to be at odds uh, with the uses as they are emerging, which also make it possible to speak of metaverses in the case of isolated virtual universes, as long as they are social and immersive, as Second Life, for example. In addition, we uh, will see later that if the immersive and social aspects uh, lend themselves to relatively simple characterizations, the same does not apply at all to the notion of connection between virtual universes, which supposes those of identity and difference between universes. We will therefore restrict the term, so it's, it's a choice we made, the term metaverse in the following um, argument to social and immersive virtual universes, with or without connection between several universes. And we will speak of multiverses in the case of connected virtual universes, 
whether social or not, and linked to each other according to the corridor model, model or otherwise. A, meta a metaverse may therefore be composed of connected virtual universes, but not all connected virtual universes will be metaverses. Like many, many major technological developments, the issues of devising a standard is, that is binding for all players in the fields and of who imposes these standards is at the heart of the interest granted today to the notion um, of metaverse by major di digital players. However, given the technological constraints uh, involved in the development of a metaverse, it is possible that not one metaverse, but several metaverses will develop, possibly in a limited number, incompatible or not easily compatible. As Fred Cavazza um, uh, points out in a, um, a paper in French, but uh, I, we did a translation, cartography of metaverses and virtual uses, so I quote what is on the slideshow, from a technical point of view, compatibility between universes is an extremely complex criterion to implement. To be convinced of this, just look at what happens in video games. To make it short, video games are not coded from A to Z. They use engines that are not compatible with each other. For example, Unreal Engine, Unity, CryEngine, Frostbite. As a result, it is impossible to recover my character in Call of Duty to play with it, uh, with it in Fortnite. It's very simple. Compatibility between games has never been considered. Just the portability of backups from, uh, for the same game is a real headache. Uh, end of quotations. If therefore it therefore seems safer to speak of metaverses in the plural, rather than assuming that there will be only one metaverse, at, at, as it is usually the case when we hear about the metaverse, um, um, so um, then assuming that there will be only one metaverse uh, in the future, as in Snow Crash, even if we will allow, uh, we will also speak of the metaverse in general, but not in the sense of a unique uh, metaverse. In order to conduct our investigation of the concept of metaverse, in the paper, we will, you will have the opportunity to read, uh, we begin by further exploring the immersive aspects of the metaverse, and then turn to the question of the user interfaces of metaverses, and, and then we go on with, with a discussion on the ontological and topological aspects of the virtual universes involved in the metaverses. And on this, on this, so it's the more metaphysical aspects of the questions. And then on the basis of this effort of clar clarification, we will, um, discuss, we, sorry, we will discuss various important issues raised by metaverses, which are more ethical, political, and. Uh, from a, also a lawyer point of view, the question of violence in metaverses, the question of freedom, and finally a certain number of uh, economical questions, in particular concerning the transferability of goods between virtual universes. So um, I will go through the papers, uh, sometimes insisting on certain points and sometimes going over quickly, and I probably won't be able to finish. So. <laughs> um, upstream uh, of the 3D experience in first-person view uh, that is usually associated with the metaverse, an important factor enabling the immersive nature of a virtual uh, world uh, is the fact that it offers a situated representation of the user, an avatar in short. So it's another important element that is obvious, I'm sure, for everybody, that usually when you talk about a metaverse, you have something like an avatar, a way or another. A second defining characteristic for qualifying as a metaverse, the social aspect I already mentioned, perhaps calls for less comment, uh, but to advance further in all characterization of the notion of the metaverse, 
it seems necessary to explore the different possibilities for users to access metaverses and to interact it, um, in it and with other users. Um, yeah. So I didn't develop the immersive and social virtual universes, but I will develop a little more the question of the interfaces. Uh, it seems indeed possible to categorize the different types of immersion using three main types of character. First uh, parameter, the type of interface. The user can act in the metaverse in the traditional way via a screen, a mouse, a keyboard, or a joystick as she immerses herself in a virtual universe via an avatar or even several characters if we include games like The Sims within the scope. Or she can immerse herself in the virtual universe via a virtual reality device, uh, which itself can be of various nature. In general, it is a virtual reality headset um, uh, that offers audio-visual immersion, but this immersion can also integrate other senses, such as touch via dedicated gloves or smell in, in an even more immersive version as imagined in science fiction, for example, in the upload uh, series you can see above me. Full body suits can be used. Another avenue widely explored by science fiction consists in relying on the more or less invasive interconnection between the brain and the, techno between a, the brain and the technological device so as to directly stimulate the sensory center, sensors of the brain uh, with, uh, that is, brain-machine interfaces, BMI, which already exist but are not used uh, for uh, purpose, purposes other than medical at the moment. Uh, a second parameter would be the activity of passivity or passivity of the user. Some virtual environment, I tried a few uh, virtual experience myself, are essentially presented as films. It's usually what you are uh, uh, confronted when you, you do VR nowadays where a certain scenario unfolds over time, the user having the possibility of moving uh, to varying degrees in the environment without her actions profoundly affecting the course of the film. But the user can also interact with the environment, the type of possible interaction being itself var variable, as in the case in video games. Either only specific ash actions are likely uh, to be taken into account by the environment. Um, either, so, sorry, either only certain specific actions are likely to affect the experience or the virtual environment was built as an open universe where all sorts of user actions are likely to be taken into account. In the case of BMIs, the interface can then make it possible not only to stimulate the sensory sensors of the brain, but also to interpret into actions in the virtual universe, the decision expressed by the users. A third parameter would be the interaction with other users, of course. The metaverse accessible to a single user at a time. Uh, is the metaverse uh, accessible only to a single user at a time or to several? As we have defined the metaverse as a social virtual universe, it must be accessible to several users Otherwise, it is just a virtual universe and therefore not a metaverse. We can, however, keep this case as a borderline case, especially since that we can imagine that different users can connect successively and communicate via the world modifications, which could be considered as an elementary form of sociability. As a result, many of the ideas we are developing on metaverses should also apply to non-social virtual universes, so in the paper we sometimes speak of virtual universes in general rather than metaverses, and the proximity between both uh, explains, uh, probably explains the confusion that reigns nowadays um, in the public perception of what a metaverse is. To come back to the canonical situation, um, that is, the metaverse is indeed accessible to several simultaneous users can they meet, 
It is not necessarily the case, and I recently read a science fiction story where it wasn't originally the case. It is a, a, a shared uh, virtual environment, but people are alone because it's about um, watching uh, it's about watching uh, sports in, in, in a virtual stadium. Um, so, uh, can they interact? Not necessarily. How many users at a time? Do users all have to be close to each other? For example, uh, physically connected to the same device? Or is the metaverse accessible by anyone from anywhere via a telecommunication ne network? So, different possibilities of combining those, all those parameters uh, I mentioned um, lead to a multiplicity of, uh, of types of experience which uh, we, uh, we, we try to group in a table you will be able to read. Um, the, the table uh, is intended, is the first draft, is intended to be supplemented and where necessary to be corrected. But above all, um, the, this general um, uh, vision, which includes uh, real technologies, but also science fictional technologies, uh, has two main objectives. First, to give an initial idea of the variety of devices that are actually involved when we speak of metaverses. They underline the need in this constantly evolving field nourished by the imagination of science fiction to take into account not only the current state of technologies considered, but also their possible developments. If we propose, as we do in the paper, um, to develop a philosophy of the metaverse, it seems important to include from the outset in our reflection the possible developments of access devices in order to develop a robust conceptualization. Of course, we are not immune to unanticipated developments that will call into question our conceptualization. Uh, but in any case, it seems necessary to do everything possible to avoid this situation by incorporating into our thinking the technological development, developments that serve more or less explicitly as long-term obje objective to the players in the field. So as I'm supposed to end already, uh, I would still, yeah. Uh, then, in the paper, we go on with um, various interesting <laughs> um, considerations about what we call the topology and the ontology of the met metaverse. We more particularly develop um, a reflection of the concept of threshold, what happens and how do you enter a metaverse and how do you leave a metaverse and is there a difference when you, uh, when you pass from a, the real world to a virtual world and when you come from a virtual world and go to another virtual world? So what allows you to say that two connected virtual universes are different, are two different universes or should we say that as long as they are connected they are in fact one? So we have, yeah, so I won't have time of obviously to develop these aspects. And um, yeah, so it's what I was talking about. So I had various um, uh, pictures. So then we, we, we develop a, a, more, uh, a more precise reflection on uh, the precise topologies of the metaverse with two metaverses or two universes virtual universes and then three universes and um, then based on these metaphysical considerations we go to as I said uh, in the introduction to more theoretical uh, to more ethical and political considerations regarding uh, violence in the metaverse but I'm sure you're going to talk about uh, these questions uh, during the day. Um, yeah, and uh, also freedom in the metaverse. And uh, yeah, as I said, economical aspects. One, if I may, I just want to make at least uh, one, uh, I, I want to, to draw your attention to something uh, which I think is really interesting, important. 
and comes from uh, Neil Stephenson's snow crash. It can be discussed, but I think it's an interesting idea to be considered. Um, in, we, we can imagine if it, everything goes well, um, to my mind at least, uh, we can imagine that if um, metaverses indeed develop, which is not a certainty, um, it might be the basis of a radical revolution in our political mode of existence. In the real world, we are born with such nationality and reside inside a determined territory, which is itself subject to a certain number of geographical, political, social, and cultural conditions on which we have very little margin of action. Um, however, um, if, if you have access to metaverses, you can imagine, as Neil Stephen does partly in Snow Crash, that metaverses could offer the potential to free oneself from the um, material um, constraints of one's life uh, when inhabiting at least the virtual world. In other words, one can very well imagine that, that if several metaverses are in competition, which is something we discuss in the paper, and uh, there is the possibility uh, that a kind of natural selection between universes happen, uh, as in a market situation, metaverses with distinct rules will be proposed and users might have the opportunity to select the metaverses that suit them best or propose new ones with the hope to attract other people. Some metaverses would probably try to offer rules that would attract as many participants as possible, while, while others might cater to niche market. But uh, all this uh, possibility would allow people to try and live uh, different uh, political situation according to their tastes, and it, uh, it could be a way for uh, democracy to progress if everything goes to, uh, along this utopian perspective. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sylvia Luch, for, for this presentation. It's a feeling of frustration, mostly, that I feel at the moment, uh, that you cannot go more into depth, but we're all very looking forward to, uh, to reading the paper uh, and get all the details that uh, we couldn't, uh, unfortunately, go into uh, today, this morning. Um, without further notice, uh, I'm going to leave the floor now uh, to my dear colleague Tristan uh, Gérard Guémard, uh, who will be introducing us on the, the, the technologies uh, behind the metaverse. Uh, how, how can we conceive the exchange between avatars? Uh, how, how do we conceive the appropriation of things uh, in this uh, parallel world? Um, well, Tristan, this is for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jolene. Um, first of all, I would like to, uh, to thank, of course, uh, Larry and Michelle for uh, having organized this beautiful and um, avant-garde event, which uh, shows us that uh, far from the conservative uh, image that some may have of lawyers, we give an, an important place to precursory thinking. So thank you for that. I will begin my speech by saying that uh, the, the history of Internet can be summarized through the major stages of its uh, development. The so-called Web 1 was the internet of reading information. The Web 2 was the one of interaction, of sharing information. And the Web 3 is the one of disintermediation and above all of immersion. It is within this third phase that the, the metaverse emerged. The purpose of the metaverse is to allow an unlimited um, number of internet users to share virtual reality experiences simultaneously via their identifiable avatar for the purpose of a social, recreational, economic, professional, artistic, or cultural activities. It is uh, quite difficult, uh, I would say, to give a definition of the metaverse. At most, we can um, simply state its main characteristics it's an uh, online service that allows access to a virtual world in 3D in real time and which is persistent and shared. To date, some um, metaverse are non-immersive, while others are immersive and require the use of um, a virtual reality headset, as Sylvie just uh, told us. 
uh, and I'm sure Yoni is uh, uh, going to uh, talk about um, a lethal virtual headset. <laughs> yeah, uh, quite scary actually. Um, moreover, not all um, metaverse use blockchain technology. In the field of uh, culture and concert, concert broadcasting, for example, metaverse rare, rarely rely on uh, blockchain. Other metaverse, on the other hand, use, uh, use it constantly. Uh, this is, for uh, example, the well-known case of Decentraland or the Sandbox. These are um, metaverse in which um, transactions between users are possible using cryptocurrencies. Uh, they will be the, the main object of my speech today. Um, indeed, um, a, a point of convergence, convergence appears between the metaverse and blockchain technologies. The metaverse will uh, tomorrow be constantly associated that is my theory, with the use of virtual um, uh, currencies, cryptocurrencies of private or public origin, but also of um, computer programs to trace the acquis acquisition of virtual goods, known as uh, smart contracts, as well as dematerialized uh, certificates of authenticity, called NFTs. This first remark allows me to define the major concepts that gravitate in the orbit of the metaverse. In France, blockchain is called a shared electronic recording device. A blockchain is basically a registry, a large, a large database that has the, particular, the particularity of being uh, shared simultaneously with all its users, all of whom are also holders of this registry and all of whom are, uh, also have the ability to enter data into it according to specific rules set by your computer protocol secured through uh, cryptography. Um, its legal recognition in France dates from December 2016 when a law uh, allowed the registration of a debt securities um, in a blockchain and a year later this possibility was extended to all financial securities. On a blockchain it is possible to register and thus create in a virtual order, an asset called a crypto asset. And the future Mika regulation defines it as a digital representation of a value or rights that can be transferred and stored electronically using uh, distributed uh, ledger technology or similar technology. What about NFTs then? They're also a kind of um, crypto asset and um, represent an object, often digital, to which attached a digital identity linked to at least one owner. And under French law, however, NFTs are not property. Um, it cannot be one because um, it's a security. It is what we call an instrumentum that represents something, an underlying asset that can be very diverse. This underlying asset can be tangible or intangible, existing, existing in the real world or purely virtual because it's simply registered in the blockchain. What are the links between these crypto assets and the metaverse? Well, the circulation of uh, crypto assets results from a transaction registered in a blockchain in exchange for uh, the payment of another crypto asset or fiat uh, currency. In the event industry, for example, people attending uh, virtual events such as music festivals or concerts can receive fungible or non-fungible non digital assets on their di digital wallets during the events, such as the captures of players or singers' best moments. In the academic field, uh, the use of blockchain technologies in the metaverse is also well known um, by distributing tokens for each course uh, finished and certifying any degrees uh, achieved using smart contract verification mechanisms, NFTs may build permanent records for courses down by, uh, uh, done by a student. The concepts, these concepts that I just mentioned, are all intertwined in the metaverse. Blockchain technologies in their use in connection with the metaverse constitute a tool that allows the individual to be projected into a digital space. They also uh, allow them to circulate a certain, a certain amount of uh, uh, rights on assets. The role of uh, blockchain technologies in the metaverse can therefore be studied in its, in its relationships, relationship with the world of uh, persons 
and uh, that of rights. First, uh, first of all, I would uh, like to talk about the, the new approach that Metaverse uh, creates about the status of people, the status of persons. At first glance, users of uh, the Metaverse can move in this digital space under the cover of an, an avatar, a pseudonym, uh, which immediately raises uh, questions in terms of uh, identity verification and traceability of actions. How to trace, for example, the identity of people in the metaverse in case of a prohibited behavior. How to verify that a person is who he or she claims to be. How to avoid fraud and identify theft with the use of avatars in the uh, metaverse. These questions have uh, no answer for the moment in the absence of a real metaverse law, but we're here to talk about it today, right? Um, at the most, um, I can only say that a primary reflection must be carried out in the law of persons. For the law of persons is, above all, uh, a technique for imputing rights and duties to the person. This means that it makes, uh, it makes it possible to regulate social behavior. The granting of legal personality is accompanying, uh, accompanied by the attribution of a status to each person. In the metaverse, this uh, notion is strongly questioned by technology. The status of uh, persons is defined as the set of elements characterizing the legal situation of a person uh, at the individual level. Um, at the family level too, and uh, at the political level, level uh, in such a way that uh, as to allow the individualization of uh, this person in the society in which uh, uh, he or uh, she lives. Some projects um, are emerging to encode uh, the attributes of a person's status within an NFT, a unique token, as we know, the creation of this NFT a sort of identity card 3.0 is mobilizing reflection uh, at the European uh, level. Since uh, 2020, the European Commission has been working um, on a European digital identity project. Digital identity is um, basically a set of digital attributes and identification information for the digi uh, digital world, similar to uh, a person's identity for the real world. It already exists in France uh, in the form of an experiment. Um, the, this technology, this uh, digital identity te uh, technology works with a wallet. Um, a digital identity wallet is an application that allows uh, users to identify themselves to various service providers without uh, having to systematically create an account and enter the login and password. Um, the, requ the required fields are automatically filled from the data stored uh, in a wallet. Of course, uh, it all depends on whether or not the digital identity is genuine, whether or not it corresponds to reality. Because an avatar is a virtual identity, they may not, they may not correspond to reality. In the real world, the, the sincerity of uh, a person's identity and status is guaranteed by civil status uh, records. Drawn up by uh, agent of the public authority, civil status re records uh, are instrumental writings intended to receive, preserve, and publish the status of a person characterized by the major events of a, a human life. The civil register is therefore the keystone of the French legal system. A civil register designated by the law is responsible for receiving and keeping records and issuing copies or extracts um, to which he confers authenticity. It is the mayor in France who is in, princ uh, in principle uh, exercises this function in each town or city. A trusted third party, therefore, incompatible with the decentralization uh, inherent to a certain idea of blockchain. This being said, blockchain could be um, the support of a civil sta status registry 3.0 because uh, blockchain is a registry after all. 
beyond uh, sincerity, the, existent, uh, the existence of a digital identity and especially of uh, an avatar, for example, in the form of an NFT, raises the question of the, a possible contradiction with regards to two characteristics of the status of persons provided, by, um, um, provided for by the, the French law, the indivisibility and unveilability of the status of persons for the avatar is nothing other than I an identity in the metaverse. First, um, with regard to indivisibility, it must be specified that if um, status has several elements, whether they are of an individual, family, or political nature, it nevertheless, nevertheless forms a whole uh, that is the reflection of personality. Since one can only have one personality, one can only have one status. This is the indivisibility of the status of persons. This raise, raises the question of the extent to which a user of the metaverse can have the freedom to grant himself an avatar different from his civil status. It is true that it is possible to change one's name. It is possible to modify or create affiliation, but it's not uh, only, uh, but these, these uh, modifications are on, uh, only allowed under certain limited conditions. And this is in order to uh, undermine another, um, uh, another principle, that of an availability of the status of person, according to which the elements that make up the status of the person are placed outside of commerce, of transactions. In short, under French law, it is impossible to change or circulate one's identity. We can see that blockchain um, crypto assets and NFTs are considerably renewing the thinking about the status of uh, people, of persons. What about their rights? Economists have shown that property only makes sense when it's projected onto goods that can be exclusively owned and the flora will um, um, talk to us about that. And that um, scarcity gives uh, rise to this uh, need of, uh, for property. However, in the metaverse, by hypothesis, technology allows um, one to free oneself from the limits of uh, reality. And uh, if one wishes, the virtual universe is unlimited. In other words, in the metaverse, uh, well, uh, therefore, in, in, the in, in the infinite, uh, there is no scarcity, no property on goods. Now. Exclusivity is the condition of the exchange value of a good. This is where we see the, well, the mercantilist uh, function of NFTs in the metaverse and what we call tokenization. The tokenization of the economy can be described as the tendency to inscribe digital assets and the rights associated with them on a token in order to allow their exchange and management in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, manner by uh, distributed registry technologies. There are therefore several purposes to this uh, tokenization. Uh, for example, to split the ownership of an asset into several tokens, uh, to create a form of uh, digital scarcity, to program and automate operations on these tokens via smart contracts, etc. Behind this uh, technological innovation, however, lies a certain legal regression, which is visible both with respect uh, uh, to property rights and obligations also, and especially debts. Let's start with um, a few thoughts about property rights and uh, note the paradox of property in the metaverse. The metaverse could be seen as a large provision of digital space in which the users will all be tenants. The owner, uh, double commas, of a property in the metaverse, for example, a plot of land is not a classic full owner, if an act of use is not provided for by, um, uh, in, the, in the source code, I'm unable to perform that act. Whereas in the real world, the only laws contradicted uh, my freedom are those uh, of civil law, but also in a more residual way, those of physics. Property in the metaverse is therefore an illusion of property. In this context, what is um, the role of the NFT? An NFT is a representative title, it's a unique token aiming to certify to its holder the ownership of an asset uh, on the public register of the blockchain. A comparison can be made with property in the real world. In French civil law, uh, I do not need a title to claim 
ownership of a movable asset, in the case uh, of a mov movable property, possession is worth a title, as stated in Article 2076 of the Civil Code. Nevertheless, it is difficult to conceive a possession of a, uh, of a source of ownership of intangible property. If the animus, the intention to behave as owner is not very difficult to prove, the corpus, the power over the intangible property is more difficult to admit. It is mainly by means of formality of publicity that the possession of the intangible property is proved. A patent or trademark, uh, for example, must be, must be registered. Securities must be registered in an account. These formalities uh, manifest the de facto power that a person has over such uh, intangible property. In the metaverse, the possession of an asset can only be materialized by an inscription in the blockchain register of a right created or having circulated. This is where the, the usefulness of a NFT appears if we agree on the fact that an NFT is uh, nothing else than uh, a title represent, representing a, a right on an underlying asset. We have to consider that the circulation of uh, this right can only be uh, done at the end of the transfer of this NFT from a patrimony to another. Now in the immaterial world, the NFT is the only instrument allowing to prove the ownership of an asset. Let's say you purchase an NFT and your public address is used to send the unique tokens ownership, ownership to your wallet. The token proves that the copy of your digital file is the original. You are the owner of the digital according to, of the original according to your private key. The use of the blockchain and NFTs thus allows um, to fluidify and time, time stamp uh, the exchange of uh, digital goods or services. This leads me to make a comment, final <coughs> comment, about obligation and especially debts. In the field of contract law, uh, that would be a subject today, that, so my speech is only an introduction. Uh, in the field of contract law, the law that is uh, mainly concerned by the uh, economic uses of the above mentioned technologies, this is also a considerable regression in formality. Uh, the necessary use of blockchain technology to create and circulate obligations contradicts, contradicts French uh, civil law, which uh, since the French Revolution has been built on a logic based um, on the sim simple consensus of the parties to a contract. However, in the metaverse, every transaction is registered in the blockchain. It is therefore written down somewhere based on a technological formalism. This is um, indeed a regression from a, a historical point of view. In the metaverse, a transaction that is not registered in a blockchain has no existence whatsoever since it becomes impossible to prove. In conclusion, I would like to talk on other subject of the day <laughs> because that, that was the point, uh, the whole point of my speech. I would like to express uh, the vertigo that I feel when um, faced with the general accounting of, the, of people that the metaverse and the aforementioned technologies make possible. The metaverse uh, is the ultimate degree of digitization of the world. It allows uh, the projection, of course, of the individual in a digital world. This means that every second spent in the metaverse gives rise to the production of information and registration in a register. The reticence that uh, 5G and the Internet of Things uh, arouse with regard of, of the, to the production and the collection of data seems negligible compared to the considerable infringement of the right to privacy that uh, the generalization of the metaverse represents. So to speak, the right uh, to privacy is impossible in the metaverse. This is the main risk uh, that digital technology represents because it makes the individual transparent. This is a very sad fate, the antithesis of the digital sovereignty everyone uh, is calling for, but I'm, I'm sure that my concerns will be uh, destroyed after this uh, beautiful day. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tristan. I, I share your feeling of dizziness at the moment. Uh, we do realize that no, the metaverse is not 
just a Facebook Plus. Uh, it is really a parallel world. Uh, I knew we could have a different identity. I'm only thinking now about the different civil status that you can have in the metaverse, or several different statuses if there are several metaverses that would be intertwined. Um, yes, we all feel rather dizzy at the moment, I think. Um, so the metaverse, a parallel world, a parallel society. And if we think of a parallel society, we think Jean-Jacques Rousseau, we think Contrat Social, and we end up thinking about, well, could we conceive the metaverse as just a big network of contracts? Uh, and this is the issue that uh, Daniel Opage is, uh, is going to address us uh, at the moment uh, with her colleague, uh, her colleague, uh, who is online, uh, yes, he'll be connected in a minute, a second. Uh, speaking from Tilburg University in uh, the Netherlands, uh, Dr. Eric Chong Tin Tai. Suspense. Hi. Hello, thank you for joining us this morning. Hi. I, I leave the floor to, to, to you too. Thank you. Yes, Daniela will hold the main presentation, which is easier than me doing it from here. So I will maybe interject uh, if some extra words are necessary, but mainly participate in any discussion and questions later on, right? So is Daniela there? No, we, yeah, she's trying to get up the slides. There are many, yes, there are just many of them open. So I guess it's We were trying to figure a solution if we could split the screen to have you online and the presentation, but I think we're going to move on to actually having the presentation on yeah. the screen and then switch you back on uh, for, for the discussions, uh, if, that, if that is fine uh, uh, with everyone yes. in the room as well. But we know you here, and please feel free <laughs> to intervene. Is it loading? We, we do have the presentation on the screen. Thank you very much. My apologies for those technical issues. I, I leave the floor now, Doctor, to, to, to Daniel uh, up to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Good morning, great to be here today <clears throat> and to contribute to the Metaverse and Law Conference. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, professor of Private Law, uh, Eric Chung King Chai and I are working on research on network contracts, uh, which this presentation is about with the application of, uh, on the Metaverse. My name is, as you know, Daniela Ophai, and my position is Assistant Professor of Private Law. Professor Eric chung Chai Chai and I both uh, work at Tilburg Law School as a part of Tilburg University, as you see on the first slide. <coughs> now if we look at the metaverse from the viewpoint of contract law, it can be understood as a network of contracts. Metaverse, as a platform company, is a central party. 
the participants or members have contracts with the metaverse and possibly also among each other. Now we might be inclined to simply analyze the contractual relations individually using the tools of contract law and consumer law. However, we propose that we should look at the metaverse from the doctrine of network of contracts. To think this through, we need to go back to the basics of contract law. The main rule in all European systems is the funda fundamental principle of pri privity of contract. It means that rights and obligations arising from a contract only have effect towards the parties who entered into it. Thus, in principle, no rights or obligations can arise from the contracts towards third parties. <coughs> After all, third parties have not agreed to the terms as contained in the contract. The converse also holds. Third parties, in principle, cannot claim under a contract to which they are not a party. Privity of contract can be associated with the principle of freedom of contract. This important principle of contract law expresses, and among other things, the importance of the party's freedom to conclude contracts with whom they want. The principle of privity of contract is historically most firmly established in England. The Treadle versus Atkinson judgment is important. The case concerns Mr. John Treadle and Mr. Guy, who entered into a contract to give money to William Tweddle, the son of John, who married Guy's daughter. The bride's father dies before payment has been made. The question is whether the son, William Tweddle, as a third party, can still claim the money as agreed between the fathers. This was not allowed. The resistance to allowing such a claim was voiced in striking words by the opinion of Judge Crompton in the judgment. He said, it would be a monstrous proposition to say that a person was a party to the contract for the purpose of suing upon it for his own advantage and not a party to it for the purpose of being sued. In German law, property of contract is established in uh, 241 BGB. In France, the same principle can be found in the articles 1199 and 2000 of the Code Civil and in other legal systems too the principle is legally enshrined. It is worth noting, however, that every legal system recognizes the need to make exceptions to the uh, important principle of privity of contract. An important example in English law is the Rights of Third Parties Act 1999. That act was created because the complete exclusion of third parties was also felt to be unjust in English law. Another example is the negligence misstatements, negligence claims on third parties. Without being exhaustive, there are more exceptions to the principle of privity in different legal systems, such as a contract in favor of third parties in German law and stipulations for the benefit of third parties in French law. An, an important exception to privity of contract on which we focus in our research is groups of contracts. A classic example is in the sphere of credit arrangements. On the one hand, the consumer enters into a contract about a product or a service with a supplier, and on the other hand, in order to finance the product or service, the consumer enters into a loan agreement with the bank. These are two separate contracts but with a single deal in mind. The question is whether, for example, insolvency or breach of contracts by the seller leading to termination of that contract affects the other contract, annulment of the credit agreement. Do the agreement show sufficient coherence such that the consequences for the other contract are justified? After all, the consumer took out the loan for the purpose of paying for the product or service which in one contract affects annulment of the credit agreement. These contracts are discussed in the lit literature under names such as groups of contracts, linked contracts, and connected contracts. 
A discussion and justification of this approach can be found in various legal systems. For example, by Hermann in Germany, Tessy in France, Dangvu in Belgium, and Van Dongen in the Netherlands. The consequences of groups of contracts are that they are to some extent treated as connected. For instance, breach or annulment of one contract also leads to rescission or termination of the other contract, even in the absence of explicit conditions. Furthermore, there may be ground for third-party claims between three parties involved, even where they have no direct contract. In some, these separate contracts are treated to some extent as if they were a single, multilateral contract. We erase the boundaries between the contracts. The legal basis is found both in national law and nowadays in EU directives. See the examples on the slide here, namely the Consumer Rights Directive, the Timeshare Directive and the Consumer Credit Director, which all have established firm rules for specific kinds of groups of contracts. In national law, there are specific doctrines that have been developed to allow for exceptions to privity of contract. In French law, after a long development in case law, the concept of caducité, brokenness, of a contract was finally enshrined in the law, namely Article 1186, Code Civil. This refers to another contract that is strongly connected to the contract that is terminated or annulled. The other contract is then also broken, caduc. In Germany, there is the notion of Weg van der Geschäftsgrundlage, laid down in 313 BGB, which has the same effect. Once one contract is terminated or annulled, the economic foundation of the other contract falls away, disappears. Admittedly, we brush over some doctrinal details in order to highlight the similarities in approach. Now, what is now the justification for groups of contracts and their effects? The justification, according to the scholars who have studied and defended these doctrines, lies in a certain kind of causa, an economic exchange. While bilateral contracts are said to be based on a two-party party exchange, groups of contracts are justified since they actually are based on a multilateral exchange or as the German scholar, scholar Hermann calls it, a multilateral synalagma. The main case where this can be applied is a specific project consisting of two different contracts, such as, as said, a credit agreement that finances the sales or services contract. If financing were not required, the credit agreement would not have been concluded. The bank providing the loan knows of the arrangement and agrees to, to provide the loan for that purpose. Sim similarly, the other business knows that the loan will be provided, thereby facilitating deals with consumers. All the three parties profit from the entire deal. It therefore makes sense that the resulting two contracts also share the same fate if something goes wrong in the performance. EU law speaks of commercial unity. However, on its own, this criterion is too vague and stands in danger of encompassing too many cases where contracts are only tangently related. For instance, a loan agreement should not in every case be connected to the contract that the consumer subsequently concludes to spend the money, particularly when the bank has no idea about the purpose of the loan and has no control about the later transactions. Hence, the law and scholars have devised various additional criteria to give further shape to the doctrine of groups of contracts. Without going into detail, we can point to aspects like the presence of explicit cross-references in the contracts or the objective economic structure of the set of contracts. Are they dependent upon each other to enable the parties to complete an entire common project? These attempts to develop a theory of groups of contracts are particularly relevant when it comes to extending the theory to larger networks comprising more than two contracts. 
The question is whether an extension to network of contracts is necessary or possible. Such networks can be found in practice. A case in point are franchise operations, such as McDonald's, which mirror quite closely the structure of platform systems like the metaverse. Now a problem for theorizing about a network contract, like the Germans say, is that you need a clear criterion to distinguish such contracts from cases of factually connected contracts where you would not want any network effects. As is often argued, there are good reasons why parties usually do not want and do not believe it is fair to have the individual contract treated like a single multilateral contract with far-reaching obligations and claims upon parties that are far removed in the network. So we would like to restrict the application of this doctrine to allow for justified restrictions on third-party effects. <coughs> Again, glossing over a compli complicated debate, while it is clearly spelled out by every scholar that such networks are not partnerships, the actual operation does have striking similarities to partnerships in that there are long-term contracts where parties, parties cooperate together for profit. A major difference, however, is that there, that there are clear clauses that regulate the distribution and allocation of risks, investments, and profits. The law should, in principle, respect the choice of parties who would know better what is a fair distribution and are, in principle, free to accept the terms of the contract. Nonetheless, the comparison with partnerships is enlightening. The consequences of such networks are namely su suggested to involve not only the connections discussed earlier, but also more stringent loyalty duties among members and the, corp and the corporation, and the possibility of direct claims between members. These are, as a matter of course, present in partnerships. Teubner argues that one condition for network contracts would be the presence of a cooperative relationship. In other words, the network should be like a partnership in some way. To avoid far-reaching and unforeseeable consequences, most scholars do not want to operate with a single concept, concept of a network. Instead, leading scholars argue that we should simply allow for effects of the presence of a network without needing a unified concept of network contracts that would decisively determine all the consequences of such a network. The desired effects can be achieved by way of piecemeal acceptance effects of a network where that is fair and just by application of individual provision and doctrines in individual cases. Now, to return to our earlier point, we should be aware what kind of effects might be desired. Here we can identify two partly overlapping groups, general exceptions to privity of contract and partnership-like effects such as loyalty duties and sharing of profits. You can see them on the slide. A, the general obligations between network members. B, and salary obligations on network members. C, duty of care, duty of warn. D, uh, later modifications of the contract. E, fiduciary contracts. F, the general interpretation of the contracts. And G, grounds of termination. So what is the criterion for adopting network effects? At the outside, we should respect party autonomy and the freely chosen distribution of rights, obligations and risks. But under certain conditions, the explicit terms of the contract can be disregarded. We can follow the French approach in first looking at subjective and objective indivisibility based on several conditions, the presence of explicit connections, an objective economic structure. As a second step, we can examine whether there is indeed a cooperative relationship that would warrant partnership-like effects. That could be derived from actions and terms that would imply conduct typical of partnership, making investments, sharing risks, and sharing profits. 
a further contributing factor to assuming a group or com of network of contracts is the presence of a power imbalance, as that would explain why the contract terms themselves do not adequately represent how the relations between parties should be arranged. In this way, common networks and change can be distinguished for more tightly knit networks where there is reason to accept some more network effects. How would we apply this to the metaverse? First, the network proposed build the metaverse. There is a network propose or goal. The metaverse is a collab collaborative project and its success is derived from the combined contributions of all the members. Then, contractual connections, obligations to not interfere with others. Then, the economic structure. Uh, the investments, time, effort, besides money uh, to build. The members make investments by building and populating parts of the world. Then risks. A contract may contain rules on intranetwork obligations, either that the law itself exposes members to third-party claims, besides or instead of the metaverse organization. Then profit. Uh, the profits arising from participating in metaverse are still unclear. The provision by metaverse of a framework for free or below cost to get a project started is a hidden form of investment and profit sharing. And power imbalance. A key concern is that metaverse, like other platforms, has a stronger position than its members. Two factors contribute to this namely the network effect and the strengthening of it by the presence of software, protocols, and IP rights. Um, then the last slide. Um, hence, from the framework we established, we can argue that the metaverse would indeed be subject to some further consequences like in a group or network of contracts. Obligations between network members could be present on the basis of the contract conditions. Or, in case of absence, there could be some kind of loyalty obligations and claims between members. <coughs> this arises from the shared cooperation in the metaverse. As an example, we mentioned building a new construction or building a construction, construction together in the metaverse, where participants have to take each other into account. They need each other. That way, for example, a game grows in value for everyone so that everyone can benefit from it and get their investment out of it in the long run. The question is whether the relationship between members should take on a more fiduciary character. In any case, we argue that the presence of a network warrants more obligations for members than usual. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel, for, for, for this uh, first uh, intervention with uh, legal technicalities. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll have a, a little time now for questions and answers. I'm, so you have a, yeah, I'm sure you have plenty of questions for, uh, for uh, our orators. Um, I, yes, uh, I was wondering uh, if we could switch... Um, the screen back. Oh, you're here. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> oh. oh, thank you. Sure.
This, this one works. So, uh, Michelle set me up on that. He gave me a dead microphone. Uh, uh, so the question was simply the relationship between theories in physics uh, uh, involving the penetration or travel from one universe to another universe, parallel universes, and uh, Stephen Hawking's last paper being just that, a theory of how to do that. Uh, is there any analogy to the, sort of the metaphysics of the metaverse, the ability to, or is it just purely a technical matter? No, no, actually, I, um, of, obviously, I didn't have time to mention everything. Uh, I, we, we planned, but um, maybe at some point you saw, I'm trying to, yes, to have the... <clears throat> Oh, you, they won't see anyway. Okay, so uh, no, it's um, indeed in the paper uh, um, I, I mentioned the, the analogy when you when, when thinking about the possibility of traveling from one meta universe to uh, or metaverse to another. Uh, I th um, the things we develop, um, most of them would work for any kind of universe, physical universes or imaginary universes. So there is indeed an analogy. There are also differences. And um, um, actually, I mean, um, Mathieu, who is also a phys physicist, might have things to say, but unfortunately, he had to give a course. And um, I also, Having worked uh, for my PhD and having worked for like more than 20 years now on uh, philosophy and science fiction, actually, I have uh, devoted uh, many pages of thinking when preparing my PhD uh, on um, the question of the the comparison, the the, the analogy and differences between uh, parallel physical universe. Um, the parallel between imaginary universes and, and the relationship. So I think there are much to say, and probably the most important thing would be to point out the differences. So as you were mentioning Stephen Hawking, I guess, because I haven't read his paper, but I guess he was talking about the possibility of traveling from one physical universe to another. Yes, so what I, for example, um, so of course, the idea with metaverses, as they are fabricated, is that we hope to have the possibility, even partially, to travel from one to another. Um, there are um, uh, theories, in particular the Everett interpretation of quantum physics, which allow to imagine that we could go, and it's an important theme in science fiction, to go from one uh, physical universe to another. But the, um, and would, it would be the last sentence. What I try to advocate in my unpublished papers <laughs> of my PhD is that um, uh, we, when we, you talk about, when you compare to parallel universe between in fiction, um, for me, fiction is an instantiation of the idea of possible universes, which is a logical difference. And in this sense, for me, by definition, you cannot never travel from one another. The only possibilities you have to get access is to imagine how these uh, possible worlds are. Well, you cannot travel, but you can imagine them. Uh, yes, just, uh, just a um, complementary information. I think that uh, Niantic Corporation is uh, experiencing uh, a way of interoperability between uh, multiple metaverse platforms. So.
Thank you. Yes, there are actually three projects working on interoperability. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, thank you very much for the three inter interventions which, which were really rich. Uh, my question would go for maybe the last one for Danielle. Um, I, I thought very interesting this idea of a network of contract, although I didn't really understand um, what was the, the parties to your network, what's the point? Are we talking here about characterization of the metaverse itself? Are we trying to analyze what it is from a legal perspective? Or uh, you mentioned the idea that it was a platform. You mentioned the, the word platform. Uh, when I tried to analyze what metaverse is and uh, the relationship between the users and uh, the participants of the metaverse uh, altogether, uh, what's the, the difference between, it, it seems contract-based. It seems to have a contract-based architecture. But then, um, would you say that the purpose of analyzing the metaverse itself, which is a technology, we could say the same with the web. What's the web? Is it a network? And do we have loyalty obligation uh, from one user to another? Uh, I mean, if we take the definition of metaverse as uh, the web that it will become once it sh will be interoperable, that's the first thing. But then, is your idea uh, to um, make this analogy with the network of contract, uh, is the point to have this European common use and then have a common legal point of view from a European perspective? Or I'm, well, this is my question. <laughs> what are the parties to, the, to this network and what's, what is the point of uh, using this analogy with a network of contracts? Thank you very much. Right, uh, Daniel, I can't see all the details of the room, so I'm not sure how to divide or together answer questions like this. We, we, we can both hear you and see you. All right, <laughs> yes, because I can't, uh, who normally asks Daniel, uh, well, Shall she take on the question or shall I begin with answering? But I can't really <laughs> see the details of where she's signaling something. So I don't want to step in uh, if she starts uh, answering. So that's why I asked. I'm just asking to answer. <laughs> All right, shall I begin in that case? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's maybe easier. Um, well, the part is we analyzed uh, the metaverse as the title says from contract law perspective, because of course there are contracts involved and we realize that that is very similar in principle to what already happens in no, well platforms as we know them already. So there's similarity there. But uh, what we also wanted to highlight at the start and at the end of the presentation is that the metaverse actually is going one step further in that the parties involved are even stronger connected. Because on the platforms, just on the internet, you do stuff with normal payments and so on. But the metaverse, as we understood, is an even more integrated environment whereby uh, the whole dealings of what parties do also takes place and is enforced uh, on the metaverse itself. And so what we try to do is look at developments we already know uh, like in credit arrangements, and you can extend that to franchise and you can extend to platforms. But if you continue that line from contract law, there is good reason to plead for also a more tighter integration in contract law terms, which means in effect uh, abandoning or removing some of the restrictions of privity of contract. And that is something which is still contested if you look at the literature and particularly in even legal systems. So what you try to do is bring together developments uh, in disparate jurisdictions and areas of the law and show, hopefully, in some manner convincing that there is indeed a good argument to be made that you should, uh, that the law should be, um, have a uh, stronger supervision of terms and dealings in what happens on the metaverse. While the tendency normally on the internet is to say, well, once it's contract, it's entirely uh, party autonomy because you can take the deal or leave it. 
we feel actually there's a very good case to be made that it's not as simple as this and that you should uh, enforce a more stringent uh, mandatory law regime uh, on the parties involved. And the parties, as we very quickly described, we have pre assumed that it might be uh, explained already in other presentations, are principally um, the Metaverse platform itself, the Metaverse organization, and the people who are participating on the Metaverse. And we don't directly mean just consumers and visitors, but actually the parties who are building part of the Metaverse environment. So that may be large companies or smaller companies. We didn't distinguish very much, admittedly, because, well, we already had a lot of abstract uh, theory to uh, to deal with. That, that there might be reason to distinguish uh, in more detailed manner between the different parties. Well, can I have a, yeah, ask a question to uh, Eric and uh, Daniel? Uh, you, you mentioned at a certain point in the presentation uh, the um, uh, possible claims, contractual claims or extract contractual claims within, within you. Your theory. So, what what kind of uh, it was written pure economic losses and so on. But did, did, do you have did you have in mind specific uh, losses uh, which could be claimed within these network uh, contracts or example yeah. example of damages? Yes. Well, examples are. Well, an example is, for example, in the metaverse, uh, you could take an analogy which would have normal daily life. If in a metaverse you would have uh, established a business somewhere and with a virtual building and the competitor could, of course, or maybe not a direct competitor, could have a building adjacent to it and not directly uh, try to uh, undercut your business. Uh, but for example, have a business which you don't really want to associate yourself with. For example, you are a child business and it's, um, well, about an erotic business next to it. You don't want that normally. And you would expect, of course, the metaverse organization to take uh, these kind of things in account. If there are no contractual relations, you normally would not have a clear basis to make someone else behave differently uh, outside of the restrictions they would have in the contract with the metaverse organization. So you would plead that actually in this kind of environment, you really should take into account each other's interest, even if there is no direct contractual relationship. And even if it's not... Um, explicitly violate the terms of the contract of adhesion to the metaverse itself. And this may seem quite obvious to some of you, but as far as we could understand, this is not obvious to the entire world, especially if you approach it from the more common law perspective, where these kind of loyalty duties are much more rare. Thank you very much for, for your answers. I think we're already... So let's go back to, to work and to, to begin this uh, second session, we have the pleasure to, uh, of listening to Professor Robka yes. 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 <laughs> on the uh, Professor uh, uh, of Global ICT uh, at Tilburg University. Uh, no, sorry, oh. Professor of Business Law yes. uh, at the University of Applied Science uh, for Management and Communication in Vienna, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and the legal personality of uh, avatars and the, the, the question should be, are they us? Or should we give them a, a legal and autonomous uh, personality? And you seem to, to propose a, a pragmatic an answer to ensure an effective regulation of uh, their, in quotation marks, uh, actions. So the floor is yours. Okay, um, still good morning everybody, um, and again, as everybody, many thanks to Michelle, Larry and the whole team for having me here. Um, the topic today is, um, well, the legal personality of avatars, and it's basically a follow-up uh, paper to something that I presented at a different occasion in Galway six months ago, which was the legal personality of autonomous systems, of fully autonomous systems, high-risk systems. And together with a colleague, Mark Fennick, from Kyushu University in Japan, he cannot be here today, it's a little bit far, um, 
I present, well, I present a paper that I co-authored together with him. And um, I will try to stay within 20 minutes, uh, just to make up for some um, loss in time. Well, um, I decided to put most of the presentation on the slides directly for one reason. I had a tooth extraction this, this week, and um, in case you can't understand me properly, uh, so for, uh, for this purpose, it's easier than if you just read it, what I present today. Anyways, good, let's dive into the topic. The question, the big question that uh, we dealt with is, do avatars need to be granted legal personhood? Well, it's a timely question because um, out there, there are especially IT scholars who would, who would argue, well, yes, we do, um, because avatar actions are not governed by law. Even if they have some impact in real life, they believe um, avatar actions are not uh, governed by law and avatar actions cannot be addressed by legal action unless they are granted, avatars are granted legal, legal personhood or legal personality. Well, um, our answer might be a little bit not that sexy and a little bit unfashionable, but we argue against um, this, uh, well, this argument. Um, what will I do today? I will start with a very brief explanation of what an avatar is. Well, we all know, I guess, what avatars are, but um, just very briefly, again, what are avatars? It's important to understand what they are for the purpose of understanding uh, the later arguments that we bring. The second um, part will be on consumption, uh, on, on, on avatars in the law. So we um, put avatars, avatars, avatar actions, and please bear in mind, avatar actions if they have some impact on real life. Yeah? So if, if, the, if they cause any harm or if there's anything happening in real life, um, what is uh, the answer um, offered by existing law? Um, and actually we are taking a look at EU, EU law and um, law at the member state level. And we picked three areas that we will hear more about later today. Um, one is consumption of the law, one is hate speech and cyber mobbing, and the last one will be civil liability for what we call third entity actions, um, not third party actions. I will explain why in a moment. And then addressing uh, the question itself, legal personality and avatars, uh, we will start, or I will start, with uh, something that we say, we call um, personhood as fiction. You, you will see why also in a moment. And then I will conclude by uh, drawing parallels to um, our Galway presentation on um, personhood and autonomous systems. So I will talk about electronic personhood, assets and access to justice. Good, you all might know what avatars are, but just to give you a very brief um, background, the term avatar comes from a Sanskrit word, avatara, and that means descent. And within Hinduism, it refers to a kind of a manifestation of a deity in bodily form, such as, for example, a divine teacher. More generally speaking, we can say that avatars refer to some kind of manifestations, um, uh, some kind of incarnation, embodiment, or manifestation of a person. So in a digital world, in a digital context, and in a metaverse context, we have to say that avatars are digital representations of um, human beings, of human beings. So we can say they are representations or images in a virtual environment. So in most use cases, we believe that avatar identities can be traced back to um, natural or legal persons. That's very important to understand for the next couple of slides. So when we talk about existing law, we picked three areas. The first area is consumption of law. Again, avatars, as I just explained, are the equivalent of human beings, um, some sort of equivalent of human beings. And as we see also in the metaverse, um, things, goods, er services are offered and exchanged. Now, what is happening if this, hap if, if this actually happens with real, including re real assets, real financial assets? So if there's like money, there's a money shift from one party to another, is there any law that governs that? Well, those legal questions would arise, um, of course, in the field of consumption, contract law, um, consumer law, this includes withdrawal rights, information duties, unfair business uh, practices. Well, right now, existing EU laws do not explicitly deal with avatar-related issues. But we feel that 
a sort of a teleological um, interpretation of key definitions found within those laws actually could be relevant in the metaverse and could be of help also in the metaverse. Why? I will show you in a moment, or right now actually. We took a look at um, various examples, legislative examples, and I picked, today I picked three. You can read more in our paper. Let us have a look at the Digital Rights Directive, Article 2, Paragraph 7. Um, I will just read it out. It refers to any contract concluded between the trader and the consumer under an organized distance sales or service provision scheme without the simultaneous physical presence of the trade and the consumer with the exclusive use of one or more means of distance communication. Well, the Digital Content Directive deals more broadly uh, with contractual conformity issues and uh, digital content services and has some kind of remedies for cases of breach of um, provisions. The third example that we have is the e-commerce directive. Um, as you might know, this aims um, to, to facilitate the free movement of, of, of information society services between member states. And here we have also, again, a lot of me mechanisms that we might hear about later today. Well, looking at all these laws that do not directly address avatars, but bearing in mind that avatars are representations of human beings in a digital world, we think that by the way of teleological interpretation, we can say that the challenge for us is not that we introduce like avatar specific um, laws, but that we should rather reinterpret existing ones to accommodate those new technologies. This is the first, um, uh, well, the first step that we took towards legal personality. The second one, now it's, it's getting more interesting. The second one relates to hate speech, hate speech and cyber mobbing. I don't think we have anything, or maybe we might have something on that today, but not specifically on hate speech, I would say. Well, what we could see, and I can tell you from my daughter who is now in high school and from homeschooling during the um, lockdown, during the pandemic, when we look only at the internet and, and, and Zoom and all these kind of things, there's a lot of hate speech going on. And we find this also in the metaverse. We can find um, hate speech in the metaverse too, and um, broadly speaking, we can say it's online hate speech. And we, if we take a look at avatars themselves, we can say it's avatar hate speech. And then if we throw in cyber mobbing, avatar mobbing, and so on, there are certain forms of what we can say online abuse or abuse by avatars. So we can find instances where, for example, one avatar insults another one or discriminates against another one or even against a real person based on various things like gender, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, and so on and so on. Now, when we took a look uh, at these um, at, 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 at these scenarios, we found out that there is a, already there are already some some laws in place that could be relevant, and we uh, distinguish between two paths of legislation. Let me show you what to, uh, what I mean with that. Now, the first path focuses on law that actually provides for a safe online environment, and that would address or that would um, basically aim at what we say back-end deployers of the metaverse. What are the back-end deployers of the metaverse? Well, these are the pl platform designers, the uh, platform providers, the, the, the platform maintainers. And here we find uh, several laws, for example, the general data protection regulation with what we will see in a moment, I guess, in a different presentation with certain mechanisms like the right to be forgotten, compensation rights, and so on, transpa transparency obligation, just to name a few. The other one uh, would be a regulation, uh, which is the regulation on addressing the dissemination of terrorist content online. Well, that's a quite interesting one, because here we find member state authorities, competent authorities, and they would have to issue removal orders. And these removal orders would be sent to hosting service providers. And then the hosting service providers, upon um, notification, they have one hour for deleting, for um, deleting uh, the offending content from the platform. This was the first path, and the second path is focusing or focuses on anti, uh, well, includes anti-online legislation directly focusing on wrongdoers themselves. And here we find several, like criminal um, law sanctions, injunctive relief, various civil law 
um, mechanisms. For example, uh, the framework decision on combating certain forms of uh, and expressions of racism and xenophobia by means of criminal law. Here we already had some um, laws in place. For example, in Austria we had uh, a law, or we have a law which is called the Verbotsgesetz. Um, again, this is against like Nazi-like behavior, and we already had this kind in place, and this also applies in an online world, um, according to our Supreme Court. And uh, we find other forms of laws in, in or comparable form, uh, comparable uh, legislation in other member states. The second one, the second group is more civil law related and includes injunctions, cease and desist orders, compensation for victims, and so on. And this is found at the national level. But now we will dive a little bit deeper into what I find or we believe is more interesting legal, legal personality, legal personhood. And I want to do that by looking at the third example, um, civil liability for what we say third entity actions. That's quite an interesting thing. Again, please bear in mind, we believe avatars have to be seen as the digital representation of human beings in the metaverse. Now, you all might be familiar with, with vicarious liability. Well, principles uh, represented natural or legal persons and their agents or representatives. Well, this is not the only form um, of liability for harm caused by third parties. It can found anywhere where legal systems would um, think that holding people accountable for actions not directly carried out by them is justifiable. In particular, in cases where um, those individuals are in the best position to control the behavior. Examples would in include parental liability for um, non-liable children's action, and what we found quite interesting, think about liability for living creatures, um, such as the liability of a dog owner for physical harm caused by a dog bite. Now, we could group this, well, now that we have the dogs and the animals and the pets there, together under the umbrella of third, well, liability for third entity actions. And now, what is interesting about that? We believe the key concept is imputation, is uh, finding a link, a link between, between third entity actions and the liability of a natural or legal person for those actions. And this can be grounded on different considerations, like, again, being in the best con uh, position to control the action, um, an obligation to, to shepherd uh, pets, and so on and so on. Now, what, does, what, what is the implication for, of this for us now? It's quite relevant for, for avatars as well, because we believe um, avatars need, they require, a, we can say parent or owner, it could be a natural person, it could be a legal person, to exist and to act. Without them, they would not exist, they would not act. And actions are limited by the boundaries defined by the creators. Well, even if avatars, even if there is some kind of autonomy um, accorded to them, such autonomy we believe is defined by the natural or legal person behind that. So, we think it's justified to argue that the natural or legal person behind the avatar is legal, legally responsible for, the, for this action. So, we don't really think it's necessary to grant legal personality, but now, let's switch to a different question. Is it even beneficial? Is it even feasible to grant legal personality, legal personhood to avatars? And this is the this last part of the uh, presentation. You see ABBA on the right-hand side, and these are not real. Hello? Hello. <laughs> I just love digital technology. Can anybody help me? I'm a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not an IT guy. Look. This was the avatar. It's coming back. Huh? Now the best part starts, the, or the, the good part, I would say. Yes, ABBA is there. No, yes. Just stay like this, that's perfect. No, it's not. 
Sorry. What's the time? I will give you more time. Just seven minutes or six minutes, please. Good? Not good? Well, we still have tomorrow afternoon, actually, so... Um, good! They are here. No, they are, they're gone, they're here. Here they are. Good. Hello, Abba. So, um, now the question, is it feasible, is it doable, um, is it beneficial actually to grant um, legal personality to avatars? Let's look at the term or at the concept of personhood. Personhood is not a one-layered concept. Um, it's important actually to distinguish between legal personhood, legal personality and other forms. Most important for us, technological or moral philosophical personhood. Why? Okay. Technological personhood, I would say, or we would say, the question here that arises is, will machines ever exceed this, this, this level, this, this exceed determinism, and will, it, will, will avatars ever reach a certain form of autonom autonomous decision-making? This is a technological question, it's not a legal question. The moral philosophical question, it concerns more the capabilities or capacities of avatars in order to, to say, okay, well, we can grant it moral personhood. But now, this doesn't answer the question, shall it be granted legal personhood? Technological or moral philosophical personhood is not legal personhood. Why? Because the legal question is a question that has to be answered by a legal system, particular legal system. And we suggest, well, basically, yes, it's not necessarily contingent on any technological characteristics or cognitive uh, capacities because the standard argument would be, well, look, we have, we have legal persons. We have legal persons and they, for example, corporations, they don't feel anything, they don't, they don't, they don't think anything, they cannot do anything, but still they have personhood. Corporations have personhood. So what's the difference then? Why isn't it possible, why isn't it feasible to grant personhood to um, avatars. And the, the answer lies here. Um, the problem with, with corporations, well, it's the same as with avatars. They can't act themselves, right? They need somebody. But now there's a difference. The difference is the primary justification why legal personhood was granted to legal corporations is not that they don't feel anything or whatsoever. No, it was because they possess a kind of financial assets. They have financial assets and they need to attract or incentivize third party investors. So it's just more feasible to grant corporations themselves legal personhood. And that's different with avatars. Avatars, they don't possess real financial assets and they don't need to find anybody, they don't need to incentivize anybody, a third party investor. Now this leads me to the last part and I will be done in, in two minutes. So in Galway six months ago, Mark and I, we argued uh, in the context of autonomous systems, autonomous systems, think about self-driving cars, think about drones, robots, high risk systems, so they crash and like a harm that causes like a millions of euros harm, right? And we argued in the end, there would be from an access to justice perspective, if you want to read more about it, look for the contribution in, in Michel and, 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 and Larry's earlier book. Um, there is the need actually to introduce something that we call electronic personhood. Electronic personhood, which is a kind of legal personhood um, of an autonomous system. And why? Because in that case, first of all, the liability situation is very, very uncertain. It's very, very uncertain due to a very complex modularization. There we have like a couple of hardware producers, a couple of software producers, designers, like there are hundreds of people sometimes in one product. And who would then be the liable party? It's very, very complex. And the good thing for us, which came in quite handy, is for all of them we have mandatory insurance. So we have assets, cars, 
drones, robots, certain robots, high-risk robots, you have to get insurance, mandatory insurance. So there is kind of an um, asset behind that. So from a legal point of view, from an enhancing access to justice point of view, we thought it would be quite nice to have a kind of a shortcut for victims to basically sue directly the system and then the system and the insurer behind the system should sort it out with all the others, leave it to them. But what about here, the avatars? The problem is, can electronic person not serve as a model for avatars? We think no, cannot. Why? Well, first of all, I told you, we told you, or we wrote, where are the assets? What, what, what is behind the avatar? There is, there, there is no real money behind the avatar itself, plus from all the examples I gave you, there's always a legal person or natural person behind it, and it's not that complex, not as complex. It's complex, but not as complex as with autonomous systems, we believe. However, and this could be the only, we believe, the only situation where we could think of granting legal personhood. We are not a fan of granting legal personhood, but if there are, if it turns out there is a difficulty in identifying somebody behind the avatar, yeah, if, if, if for technolo technological reasons it's just not possible to identify that one person, then, well, but only then, we could think of granting legal personhood to avatars if it has some impact in real life, but then the problem, of course, is where's the money? So then we have to think about mandatory insurance for avatars, but this is just like too far away, we believe. For the time being, um, based on all what we, what we discussed here, we think it's just not, it's neither necessary, not beneficial, nor feasible to introduce legal personhood for avatars, even if, if that's an unfashionable view, but that's our, and our only maybe opinion. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, uh, I say that at the beginning uh, you have a pragmatic position, but I think it's a reasonable position because uh, often we have the, the, the reflex of thinking that uh, if there is a new world, it should be uh, a, new, a new law. And here it's probably not the case. Um, we'll see the, the question, but I, I already think uh, about a, a specific uh, hypothesis. What about an avatar who could be the representation of a company? Yes, but here again, there's a company behind the avatar, and the company would be held liable. So um, there is always somebody who is held liable, and plus the company has the, the assets, the financial assets. Um, there is, for us, there's just no need. There's just no need because there's, think of a pet, a pet, a, a dog. Why don't you sue the dog? I mean, you could have the same discussion. A dog is not a human being, but it hurts somebody, it damages somebody, it harms somebody, so why don't we sue the dog? Well, it doesn't, just doesn't make sense from our point of view. There's always somebody behind the avatar. Thank you. So, so now uh, we will go through the presentation of our colleague uh, Letizia Coppo. Um, her intervention uh, will approach the, the question of the personality of the avatar from a, a different but complementary uh, perspective, uh, that of the, the respect of personality rights uh, of the metaverse players and their avatars in the metaverse. Letizia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marjolaine, and I want to thank Professor Michel Canarsa and Professor Larry Di Matteo for this kind invitation. Uh, it is a real pleasure and a honor to be here and have the chance to share some food for thoughts with you. Uh, so the relationship between fundamental rights and the digital technologies is certainly a complex and multi-phase topic. Uh, I dare say still rather unexplored by case law, at least in uh, civil law countries, which, though, um, should not be overestimated, in, in my opinion. Um, in fact, uh, most of the time, the digital element uh, is a simple means for violating a certain fundamental rights belonging to a real person 
or if you want a simple immaterial dimension where such violation takes place. Fundamental rights are the same, regardless if they have been infringed offline or online. And so is the protection awarded by the system to that infringement, given that at least private law rules do not require for their application the materiality of the wrongful conduct. By the way, also the other rights, not fund non-fundamental rights, are the same. Take the example of telemedicine services, for instance. Telemedicine is just an alternative means for performing healthcare services. Well, in case of an accident, it might be more difficult, of course, to identify the person who is liable, I mean, the doctor, the technicians, the manufacturer of the machinery, and so on. But the patient's rights and remedies remain the same. And similarly, if you want to take the example of a fundamental right, the right to be forgotten is rather the same whether it is infringed through the indexation of an online en uh, search engine or through a newspaper article. Well, of course, the digital dimension multiplies the consequences of the infringement uh, as the news is spread in a second, worldwide, and for a potentially endless period of time. But those are factual elements. I mean, the right is the same, and so is the remedy. And the same is true for other fundamental rights, like slander through the internet. Well, the more interesting question, at least in, in my view, is whether the system can acknowledge fundamental rights that are digital related, and therefore do not even exist outside the digital world. Well, this will be the focus of my contribution. Uh, well, if we want to answer the question, the metaverse scenario is the appropriate field of research. Why so? Uh, because the metaverse, is pop as, as it has been said, is populated by virtual persons, namely the avatar, that are like masks of real persons. And the real persons behind the mask uh, most of the time can be hardly identifiable, so the virtual person ends up being perceived as a real person. This means that the virtual person, as my colleague said, can be the object of the very same wrongs as a real person. Theft, slander, assault, and, and so on. The point is, should the law care about the wrongs that are directed against the avatar? Well, again, the answer is easy when it comes to wrongs that entail a damage to the real person behind. If an avatar steals Linden dollars to another avatar, and Linden dollars, just to use the example of Second Life, are recognized as a currency which can be converted into real money, then at least from the viewpoint of private law, the money was stolen from the real person. I mean, the loss is still suffered by the real person. Therefore, it is uncontroversial that the law should care, and it does. But what if the avatar is assaulted or he is slandered without any even indirect reference to the real person behind? Is he entitled to compensation? Is the real person behind it entitled to compensation? Is there a damage worthy of compensation? Well, um, as we have said, um, liability requires the infringement of a right, but rights belong to persons, either natural or legal then the first question we should ask ourselves is if the avatar as such is a person. Well, uh, science tells us that in order to be qualified as a person, you need to possess con consciousness. And it appears that the two requirements for consciousness are the feeling of arousal and awareness. Well, if it is so, the avatar cannot be qualified as a natural person. 
We could have some doubts maybe with artificial intelligences because they're capable of learning by experience of expressing to a certain extent their own will, but, but not with avatars, at least in my opinion, that have nothing autonomous, at least at, 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 at this stage. Um, and this casts a shadow also on those theories which conceive the avatar-user relationship in terms of an agent-principal relationship, in my opinion. Um, and by the way, this latter theory would be useless with reference to fundamental rights. Um, what about legal persons then? Can we say that an avatar is a legal person um, can it be subject to the incorporation doctrine? Uh, well, this is something which apparently is in vogue in common law countries, while at least, as far as I know, is rather unexplored by civil law ones. Uh, but actually, either say that the avatar is not the expression of an organization expressing its own will through organs or the majority of its members, so uh, it's just a virtual representation of a real person, at least in my opinion. So I believe there is no way to grant the avatar legal capacity, no way to qualify it as a person, so no way to acknowledge any avatar's rights. Um, if it is so, at this stage, the law should not care. Um, so if an avatar behaves in such a way that it's unethical, it would be a problem of compliance with the metaverse general terms and conditions. So uh, practice positivism will rule uh, with his own sanctions, like the termination of the account and, and, and so on. I mean, the law is too busy with real life and the courts are overloaded with real problems. But assuming this, so assuming that the system does not acknowledge any avatar's right, the next step is to ascertain if the system can acknowledge any rights on avatars or rights to avatars and what kind of rights. Well, the first option would be probably to qualify the avatar as a good, namely as a property of the metaverse user. So the user created the avatar and he has a right of using it or not using it, disposing of it in a sort of full and exclusive way. So in this perspective, any physical damage suffered by the avatar is a damage to a good. Uh, then what are the rules for the compensation of damages to goods? Well, first of all, um, most civil law systems tend to insist upon the principle that the victim of a wrong is not entitled to compensation if the violation of an interest is not followed by any concrete damage. Um, so, for instance, uh, Italian case law has always been firm in claiming that the allegation of the infringement of an interest and of the consequential damage is not enough for compensation. But compensation can be awarded only if the victim succeeds in proving both the infringement and the consequential damages. Uh, then in practice, the rule is often mitigated by case law. Um, we could think of thanatological damage under Italian law or pre prejudice d'angoisse under French law. I mean, it's mitigated either through the multiplication of the types of damages which are worthy of compensation or from a different angle through the multiplication of the rights or interests acknowledged and therefore protected by the system or through the claim that consequential damages can be proved even, proven even by presumptions. Uh, but anyway, those are particular examples. So if we go back to property, the real person must prove that a trespass to the avatar as his property has caused a patrimonial loss to him. As to the claim for moral damages due to the infringement of properties, at least in some civil law systems like Italian law, that is not admissible. In fact, moral damages, at least under Italian law, can be awarded only when wrongful conduct also integrates a crime, which has been interpreted by our constitutional court um, in, the direction, in the sense that 
uh, moral damages can be compensated only when the wrongful conduct has infringed a fundamental right. Where, again, at least under Italian law, property is a constitutional right, but not a fundamental right. So moral damage for property loss is not acknowledged uh, only by one isolated decision of the tribunal of the city from where I come from, but it's a really an isolated decision. So the property model proves quite unsatisfactory. The second option would be to draw an analogy between the avatar and the pseudonym. Uh, in other words, to argue that the real persons have an exclusive right to use their avatar, as well as they have an exclusive right to use their pseudonym. But, again, in order to apply this model and the related protection, the avatar must have become really characteristic for the identification of that person as it is required for pseudonym, uh, which requires a systematic use and the social perception that that particular avatar is the alter ego of that particular person. So even this perspective reveals to be of limited application. The third and last solution, which is the, the most convincing one uh, uh, in my belief, is the personality right model. So the avatar could be conceived as a projection of the metaverse user's personality. It is not something static as property, but something dynamic as personal identity, something that is continuously deconstructed and reconstructed adapted to circumstances, and most of all, to the evolution of the person in its social dimension. Uh, the right to personal identity has become, under the, uh, under the law of many civil law countries, a legal position which is autonomous from the right to name, to image, and the, the right to reputation, and other personality rights. Uh, it has actually become the right I dare say the right to preserve the perception that each person has of its own self, its own individuality. So identity is not conceived anymore as a result, but as a process. It is not conceived anymore as a unitary concept, but as a plural one. Persons may nowadays have multiple identities, their real identity, the identities they themselves create on the internet, the identities that are created by other internet players spreading some data and piece of information, refer to the person, and so on. And even the concept of privacy has evolved towards this direction to the extent that we can qualify it as a form of control over the way in which individual identity can be built. If it is so, and, and I'm going to conclude, we can argue that one facet of personal identity is digital identity. So the avatar is like, uh, I have to say, is like one of Harry Potter's or crooks, that is to say, a piece of a person's soul. Then if there is a right to avatar conceived as a component of the right to personal and namely digital identity, and personal identity is a fundamental right, the real person is entitled to claim for moral damages whenever a fundamental right of his own other self is infringed. So here is a digital related fundamental right that does not exist outside the digital world. This is the reflection I wanted to share with you and I'm very much looking forward to hear your opinion. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Letizia, for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, you're talking about uh, avatar as a as facet of a uh, real identity. Uh, I think we need here the, the point of view of psychology. <laughs> so now uh, I turn to uh, Professor Morel. 
professor of global ICT uh, law at uh, Tilburg University. Uh, we will analyze the specific difficulties uh, of uh, application of data protection law in the metaverse. Is everything okay? Yes. Hi all. Thank you for being here. Okay, data protection. Well, it's clear, if you want to have a digital life, we first have to digitalize yourself to be able to live in the, uh, in the metaverse. So more parts of our body, we will have gloves, we will have, you know, it, but also more parts of our behavior and also our emotions have to be digitalized to be able to have expressions. That will cover more parts of our lives and that data will need to be shared with more parties. So I'm giving you one example, which is the eye movement tracking. And that is combined with pupil dilation. And why is that so important? They track how long you look at something and what you look at. And the pupil dilation records your emotions your level of interest, but also your, whether your interest is sexual, whether you're excited, embarrassed, frustrated, bored. And that has given to a new way to a new term, biometric psychography, a difficult word for me, and it's called a new type of information. It's your identity combined with stimuli, indicating what you uniquely think, like, want. And why am I explaining this? Because I tell you, this is the big commercial prize. Advertisers want to know how you react to their stuff, whether you're open, interested, excited. This is how they're going to make money. And I'm not making this up. A research by or a search of uh, by uh, the Financial Times of all the patents of Facebook, hundreds of them, show how they think they're going to commercialize the metaverse. And that will be sponsored, hyper-targeted advertising. It's sponsored content. It is, you know, the, the displays you see, the buildings with the naming on it, whatever. And um, this is fully acknowledged. Nick Clegg is their uh, global policy person. He says, look, clearly ads play a big part in all this. And I looked up one of the pa uh, patents. And this is about eye tracking and then adapting it to the media content presented to the user. This is how they're going to make the money. And all authors who have written about the metaverse now say, look, with all this and the issues we see now already with the current digital platforms, it will be, the privacy issues will be exacerbated. It will be amplified to an unprecedented level. And everybody needs more protection. That is the conclusion. And that's also because it will be interoperable Maybe with corridors, but people who bought, you know, their avatar skin or whatever want to carry it on to other metaverses as well. So there will be a level of operability, interoperability also if you work with the corridor principle. Once you need to move around the metaverse, you will have to hand over some form of identifier because otherwise you can't carry the skin. Yeah? Um, and basically, I haven't heard it today, but anonymity, anonymity is no longer possible. If you have basic motion data, which is two points, one on your head and two on your hands, five seconds of moving your sword in the metaverse will uniquely identify you. And if you don't believe me, look at the research. It's amazing. It will be as uniquely identifying on par with biometrics like fingerprint recognition and facial recognition. Based on this, all authors agree that 
obtaining meaningful consent in any form of granular level, so you can have a form of contextual privacy depending on the environment you are in, is a practical impossibility. And now the fascinating point comes that they all agree that because that is so difficult, we need to improve the existing system of notice and consent. And then they start thinking how that could be done in the metaverse, like with artificial intelligence, uh, profiling you in such a way based on your privacy preferences that you, your, your privacy preferences are automatically adapted according to where you are in the metaverse. Let that sink in. I mean, I have such a déjà vu here. Way before GDPR was uh, in, uh, adopted, we had the situation where under the old directive, everybody said that individuals didn't have enough control over their data. And instead of rethinking the concept of notice and consent, they all said we need to strengthen it. I tell you, it's not going to work. We need to find a different way of protecting data protection. And Mark Zuckerberg is, 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 um, 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 is basically agreeing there. He says, look, we need to implement the privacy in the design. And that is one of the basic principles of the, pri uh, the GDPR is huh? privacy by design. We need to implement interoperability, safety, privacy in the design itself. And um, I think he's right. But the real question is, are we going to leave it to the big tech companies to do that? Yeah, don't forget that um, 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 it seems I'm missing one slide. It doesn't matter. Um, technology exerts power. It show, you know, it, it tunes how we see the world in the virtual world. It puts things to the forward, it puts things in the back. It just exerts power. And based on my experiences, I'm a practitioner as well. My observation is that the current commercial interests, which are based on collecting as much data as they can to you know, operate the advertising model, which is an indirect model where you get free services in return of advertising, is basically obscuring their moral compass. As long as we have a system based on collecting as much data, I think all design choices are leading to collecting as much data as possible and subsequently monetizing them. So I think we have no time to lose. I don't know whether you looked at it, but you know, there's hundreds of mil billions of dollars being invested at the moment. It is the prediction that in three to five years, the first commercial headsets and everything are, will be on the market. The prediction of Gartner is that by 26, that is in, you know, three years, about 25% of the people will spend at least one hour daily in the metaverse. I hope you see that the commercial imperative is to get to market as quickly as possible, which will not lead to a responsible design. So for me, the $1 million question is, is GDPR able to turn the tide? Is this a law that facilitates a responsible metaverse? Well, I think not. And I have three reasons, and I will quickly go through them. I have written since my first uh, public acceptance speech as a professor that I think the notice and consent doesn't work. We recognize all this. <laughs> and we recognize all this. Our laws are based on the assumption that if you tell me what data you collect, what purposes you collect it for, and what you're going to do with the data, I can actually give an informed consent. By now, 
It's completely beyond any of us to understand what is going on. We need to move from a system that is legal, like, you know, notice and consent, mechanical procedural laws to what is legitimate to do with the data in the first place. And I'm not by now, it took a long time, but by now I'm not the only one anymore. In Europe, many of, 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 of scholars agree. But also the FTC chair in her acceptance speech, she said, look, I think the market reality is that notice and consent is outdated. There are no real alternatives. What are you going to do? Take another metaverse? I mean, not use Facebook, do you see? So she says, look, we need to go to substantive limits, rules what is and isn't allowed, rather than procedural protection. Yeah? And the next question is, in what type of society do we want to live? That's the real question the law should be about. And I give you one example. I get so frustrated. Our highest European court having to decide whether a pre-ticked box is valid consent or not, rather than look at what the actual processing is about, whether that is legitimate or not. That would be a question for our highest courts. Second one. The GDPR is becoming the law of everything. Do not forget that First of all, we will be completely digitalized, so any data is related ultimately to an avatar, likely, meaning the laws are always triggered. But the privacy laws function as a gateway. It always starts with the personal data. If AI ultimately discriminates and bias, biased output, the processing wasn't fair. So the privacy question, is this fair, is there a legitimate interest, encompasses whether it ultimately leads in discrimination. Discrimination is a separate field of law. Other fundamental rights are separate fields of law. But the question on privacy is the first one, rolling up all the other elements. Privacy by design means that you mitigate the privacy impact already in the design. And that implies also the impact on other fundamental rights. Plus, whether it's good for society as a whole. Do you see? It's, it's, it's rolled up in the privacy by design question. So it's well acknowledged that privacy is a gateway to protecting all the other rights. Um, yeah, like AI um, is, is, is discriminating or not, is rolled up in the fairness principle of privacy. Okay, and all those individual rights are in total relevant for the collective functioning of our democratic society. That's why they call GDPR the law of everything by now. And it's stretched even further. Yeah, we, we had a groping problem, and it's, it, the, all, all examples show that, that you know, sexual harassment on the digital platforms is there, but it has a new dimension in um, in, in, in the virtual in the uh, virtual reality environment. And the point is, uh, we just heard you say that. Uh, well, is that then? But all research shows that if you're virtually groped that your brains, because you are in the reality, is actually people experience it as something real. And it is very traumatic. So, um, um, in that sense, you know, we are getting in a safety question, do you see, more than, and the question is, is every data or information induced harm, is that then also governed should a privacy impact assessment include the safety requirements? If I have a headset and it's not programmed well or it's hacked, I could fall. Is that something that the GDPR should protect against in the privacy by design? I mean, we're, we're stretching it. Eh? For people groping, does it feel as a privacy violation? It's not intuitive anymore, do you see? So, so that is, uh, anyway, I think having the privacy regime for that type of impact 
is sometimes over-regulating and otherwise under-regulating, and I'm just saying it's not the appropriate regime. Read the paper uh, for further details. Thirdly, I think the accountability principle is not sufficient. GDPR is risk-based. The AI regulation, the CSRD, the DSA, all risk-based. They incorporate the accountability principle. If you don't know how society will look like, law, uh, the regulators impose meta-regulation. It's nothing to do with the metaverse. Meta-regulation. It says, regulate yourself. It means do a data protection impact assessment. Check what you do, check all the impacts, try to mitigate them, do a risk assessment at the end. Is it low, you can go on, medium, um, further and high, you need to go to the regulator. Regulate yourself. The AI regulation requires a conformity assessment. CSRD requires a human rights impact assessment. Meta-regulation. And the point with privacy by design is, again, it's not between choosing options A and B, it's about developing, innovating option C to limit the impact on society. Can you imagine how many design decisions are there? Do not forget that GDPR applies to a specific controller developing maybe a specific new technology for processing purposes. The metaverse is a complex of technologies. From blockchain to, well, I'm, 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 I'm not going there, but it is a, and then with a field of players, can you imagine that individual design decisions that are maybe completely logical at the micro level can work out completely wrong at the macro level. We call that the problem of the many hands and ultimately nobody is responsible for the end result. We talked about the governance by the internet, the contractual network. The internet is completely, and all the platforms are completely in a contractual, why? Because you know they need to have rights and obligations and the law didn't apply in a proper way. But we also need a governance of the internet. That's the supra level and it's lacking. There is no law of how to govern the metaverse. And what happens then is that you get all parts of informal multi-stakeholder fora sitting together, decide, deciding on design, on interoperability, and the World Economic Forum started one, there's another one, I wrote it in the paper, but they are completely captured by industry, lacking our regulators, lacking our, the NGOs. And if I see that the papers coming out of those and the things they work on most is how to make it profitable. I tell you, as I started, it will not lead to a responsible metaverse. And that, this, you know, you can blame the companies, but it, I, I just want to give one, it is impossible to predict how the metaverse will work out. You must have heard about the Collingridge dilemma, read it if you didn't, but this is, is impossible to predict, basically. Only when it actually is implemented, you see what the impact is. And that is because the technology impact is never straightforward. Once it's there, it influences us as well. And the most simple example is uh, electric irons. Before that time, mostly women at home need to have a real iron. They heated it, and then the electric iron came, and people thought, oh, this will free up time of the women at home. They will have time for self-employment. What happened? Social expectations, societal expectations changed. In, because it was such heavy work, only the men colors and, and the cuffs needed to be done. Then the whole shirt, because it was so easy, and the children's clothes, and some 
Women now even do the sheets. Not me, obviously. Anyway, my point is with the internet, often the straightforward impact seems positive. With internet, everybody predicted connectedness will be better. And the micro effect was that that is true. I can now follow you all, even if you move within companies, I can still find you on LinkedIn. But the macro effect is that all research shows that the more you're online, the more attracted you are face to face. <clears throat> There's addictions. I see young people f being afraid to call the doctor because they can't moderate their text. They put out the best version of themselves online and are afraid to meet up in real time. Offline, I mean. So I have a tremendous deja vu with uh, the metaverse as well. And actually, I get very irritated. The prediction is that we are so much, our communication online will become so much better because we move from written to face to face with expressions. And um, all research shows that that increases social trust and gives you a sense of community because it's also non-verbal, yeah? I am sure that at the micro level that will be the case in the metaverse. But what will happen on the macro effect? Are we going to have a creation of your best reality or is it now the best version of fantasy? Do we still have avatars of all sizes, colors, heights, uh, whatever, disabilities. We already have a new illness by the World Health Organization, an online gaming disorder that attracts pe young people from family, their work, their education, uh, etc. I doubt it. Another thing is that I see the business lacks the required skills to do any of these assessments. And I'm quite, if you ever have seen a good TED talk, look at this one. It's uh, our loss of wisdom. Barry says moral skill, so the, the, the capability to make contextual assessments has been chipped away by relying on rules that were so strict, prescriptive legislation that avoids you having to think to start with. We come from a long time of a static society where the rules were clear. And companies, the business knew the rules. They developed, you know, if they innovated, they knew what to do. There was a compliance department doing a check and all was fine. Now the business needs to think on its feet because there are no rules. You need to implement the ethics. And I see that that, you know, that, that muscle to do that is, is lost. And the reflex in the business at the moment is, especially in overregulated like the financial institution, that if there is no rule prohibiting something, it is therefore allowed. It wouldn't require any further moral con considerations. I think that is not the case. Companies are really good at doing risk assessments from their perspective, never from the perspective of society and individuals. It's a skill they need to learn. So I think we need to overcome the weakness of the current accountability regulation. It requires what we call triple loop learning. If you don't, as a regulator, do not know the results, you need to give broad guidelines. Companies need to experiment, show their results, feed it back to the regulator, they think about it, move to best practices and disseminate again. So, um, the AI regulation is the first to propose a regulatory sandbox, more or less for those purposes, really good, but it's not mandatory. It's meant as a service to small companies. I tell you, it should be possible for the regulators, and not only one, but various, to invite the tech companies with a very compelling uh, invitation to join them in the sandbox. 
Because if you don't do that, uh, you, you, we will miss the whole problem of the many hands. Um, um, and um, um, if you only have one regulator char in charge of it, like in the AI regulation, you miss the market dimension, you miss the consumer dimension, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I see where there is a will, there is a way. Google had a uh, privacy sandbox, really well organized, and I thought it was brilliant. The UK ICO and the Markets Authority just invited themselves to the sandbox. They said, oh, you have results, let me inspect them. And then they came to a whole negotiation process how to improve the design of, in this case, the ad tech system. So here are my recommendations. I think we should ban the whole ad-profiled advertising uh, possibility for the metaverse to undermine, to cut the business model. With this business model, we will never have a fair metaverse. Any innovations of privacy by design should be made available to all. We need to regulate the group of contracts to make it fair, because that is not the case at the moment. It's dictated by the big tech. And we need to be public about our data protection impact assessments. The algorithm should be available to research. And we need to open up a global regulatory ba uh, sandbox to, to, to regulate, to come to a fair uh, design of the base principles. That's it for me. Thank you for this uh, stimulating presentation. I think time is running very quickly, so uh, we can go to the question directly. Lots of questions already. Thank you. So I have two questions. The first one is for two the first two presenters and the third one for the last one. So for the two presenters, um, I'm not getting into the issue of legal personhood or of avatars or avatars as like a reflection of legal person, of, of the personality of the people behind. But my question is, um, I think we have more pragmatic problems such as, you know, I harass my avatar, I, through my avatar, harass somebody on the metaverse and then the poor victim has to identify me that meaning that it has to go to the platform asking for disclosure of my identity to the platform, actually. And we don't have a duty to do that. So I, I think, you know, we might deny personal or uh, kind of bypass the problem if we think about imposing a duty to platforms to disclose under request, uh, which is the missing link right now. So what do you think about that, first thing? And to you, I totally agree with you that with advertisement, we are not, we targeted advertisement. We are not gonna have a fair metaverse, but I think that if you propose that, you know, to tech companies, they will tell you that without advertisement, there's not gonna be any metaverse. So uh, I, I don't see the economic, you know, sustainability from their point of view. Not that I fully agree with you. With well, I'm, I'm, you know, look, this is what I work on daily. Um, you can advertise, have advertisement, without being hyper-personalized on me. It could be on the context. And we see that contextualized advertising is actually giving more money than the personalized advertising if you do it in the right way and, and focus on that. So there are it doesn't mean that you have an advertisement-less metaverse or no advertisement, but it will be a different way of contextualizing it rather than personalizing it on, 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 on the avatar. So, so, so that is one. I, you know, the Netflix has a subscription model. What is wrong with people paying, uh, you know, a, a certain amount for services like we always have? My point is, is it necessary to go to this type of profiling of emotions? I'm, you know, if you want, I'm not saying you're not recording the looking, etc., but is that then used for the communication required or is it also used for other purposes? And that is, I think, where we should draw some red lines rather than uh, let it go. Does that help? Yeah, well, yeah. We yeah, we can discuss it further. 
Um, thank you for the very interesting or very, very good um, justified question. Um, I, or we, we do believe that um, the question of whether to grant legal personhood or not is not the most urgent question here. Um, it's all about protecting possible victims or preventing harm from happening. Um, our, well, our chapter is purely dealing with whether it makes sense to grant legal personhood, and, and we, we believe it does not. It is not. Um, I totally agree with what you said. Um, we need some kind of disclosure obligation or something. We have the same issues right now with um, in the online world where people hide behind nicknames, right? Um, and sometimes it's, it's impossible to, to, to find out who they are. I mean, technologically it's speaking, it's possible to identify people, but the question is whether there's any obligation to disclose the information, right? Um, but when we talk about legal personhood, we just don't see the point that this would help. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you, yes. Uh, more questions? Okay. Oh, the, you asked three questions? <laughs> That's not allowed. You're a bad person. Yeah. <laughs> no, just very rapidly, yeah, I, I haven't dealt with the question because it's a, it's a data protection, more rather a data protection matter. But I agree with you, there, uh, normally there are mechanisms of, of disclosure in, in the platforms, uh, metaverse platforms, terms and conditions. Uh, but yes, the point is to establish whether there is a right to keep the anonymity or an obligation of the platform to disclose the identity. But I think when, when it comes to the infringement of fundamental rights, it will be absolutely logical and reasonable to to sort of establish such an obligation. Thank you for the question. Okay, it's 25 minutes into our lunch time, and we'll take a few more questions, but I ask you to ask short questions, one question, and to give short answers, because we don't have the ability to push into the dinner hour because we'd like to get a little bit of a break there too, so. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a quick question to the three of us, uh, of you, sorry. Yes, one, one. <laughs> um, I have learned that a few weeks ago, a Colombian judge organized a, a court hearing uh, in uh, Horizon Worlds uh, on uh, Meta, on, on the metaverse. Um, would you see there more of opportun legal opportunities or more of legal risks if I think that it will encourage other courts to organize court hearings or trials in the metaverse? Thank you. Look, we, we, I'm sure some of the, this is now in a real court, having a court hearing there. I, I mean, that is pretty straightforward. Then it is a communication technology, you know, but with real, it, 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 it's, it's just a communication technology. What, what I can imagine is that there are certain worlds that get their own dispute resolution with our own courts, their own communities, and then the question is, okay, interesting, um, is that then allowed? Are we, as a government, this is a true government task, eh, to, to have, um, are we going to let that go? What, 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 are we going to regulate it? I mean, that is more interesting uh, for me. Yeah, it is, you're right, um, the moment you have a, a, a technology, the technology always also influences how you act. I mean, there's, I don't know, there's all types of research, it's, it's called the Proteus, no, the, pro, the effect, yeah? where we're uh, terrible, but over-sexualized avatars, um, have also an impact on, 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 the, on the real life person behind it. So you're right, it, it, it's never neutral, eh, technology. But to a certain extent, um, it, 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 that is, I find, easier than the other way around. I think that, that that's a good response, a really fantastic, comprehensive response. So we'll move on to the next question, if you don't mind. Anybody else? No one else? No one else? Okay, fantastic.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, interesting uh, exercise to keep you uh, awake after lunch, so we will uh, aim to do that. Um, this is an absolute pleasure to uh, welcome you back for this uh, interesting topic this afternoon. This afternoon we will be looking at metaverse business and the law and uh, we have very interesting topics covering competition law and intellectual property with a focus on copyrights and patents as well. Um, we will have three presentations uh, and uh, it's uh, three different presentations on uh, interesting issues and I very much look forward to those. First, we will hear Andrea uh, Pileta Massaro and uh, Andrea will be talking to us about competition law and the metaverse. Uh, Andrea is a research fellow at the University of Turin. He obtained a PhD uh, from the University of Trent in uh, competition law. Uh, and uh, um, he also received uh, his degree summa cum laude with academic distinction. Very impressive indeed. Also from the University of Turin. And um, what is also very interesting is that uh, Andrea trained as a, as a lawyer in a very famous uh, firm that we both know. And he also worked as a clerk at the uh, Turin Court of Appeal. And um, I just give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and uh, especially thanks to Michelle and Larry for the invitation and to the whole UCLI. It's a pleasure to be here always. Uh, Leon and UCLI are always uh, a pleasure. So uh, I will try to keep you awake after lunch, as, <laughs> as we said. Uh, with competition law can be uh, tricky or, uh, or easy because it's a subject that is you, you love or you hate. So why competition law and the metaverse? Uh, um, uh, because uh, we are starting from uh, um, a little presentation about what the metaverse can be or cannot be. It's ex expected by a report from McKinsey that uh, the metaverse should generate something around five trillion dollars in, in the economy uh, um, within 2030. This was a prediction that then changed a little because uh, our news that we read uh, in the beginning of this year are that uh, companies such as Disney, such as uh, Microsoft, uh, but uh, the also Meta itself, uh, uh, cut a lot their investments in the metaverse. <coughs> and fired a lot of people also. This, why? Uh, because uh, uh, probably the metaverse is seen still as an unmatured technology that maybe is not accessible to everyone. Uh, and so we will see what it will be the, the, the development of this subject and of course this will affect also the understanding of, that we will have in law um, about this, uh, this subject. But competition law, uh, why? Because if we take the five trillion dollars that I said before, we can understand how bigness is involved in this subject. And with bigness, uh, if I try to say, to translate this term into a more technical expression, we can say market power. And uh, so, uh, why uh, this, uh, the metaverse could be, uh, we can say, evolution of the problem of competition law in the digital world, in digitalization, which is the topic that in a certain sense has occupied the scholar debate about competition law in the last almost 10 years, we can say. Um, and why <coughs> this subject was so debate, debated? 
uh, that's because uh, competition law in a certain sense was not equipped to keep the pace of digitalization and it was under the uh, eyes of everyone because big corporations, big companies uh, had the opportunity to in a certain sense uh, rule, uh, become the center of large empires as the commissioner for competition uh, Vestager uh, told uh, in uh, uh, during a speech and uh, this means uh, that they can rule the digital world and that uh, they become so so big uh, that uh, antitrust law and, and that's, that means that antitrust law was not able to prevent these companies to become so big why this happened? This happened especially, I think, uh, for uh, an ideological uh, defect of competition law, because uh, if uh, the Sherman Act was enacted in 1990 as with a sort of structural aim, uh, and also competition rules in the EU had this kind of soul in, the, in their incipiency, especially rooted into the ordo liberal tradition. Uh, after the advent of the uh, Chicago School of, of Economics, uh, efficiency was seen more as the law, the star of competition law, instead of focusing more on the structure on the, of the market and on market power. And uh, so competition law became uh, more, uh, accepted more the constitution of big uh, positions in the market of companies there that became larger and larger. And this problem was particularly seen in the digital world. But, so why this introduction? Uh, because uh, um, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, highly likely that the metaverse will just constitute the continuation of what happened with digital companies. And uh, this because uh, uh, probably metaverses could be launched, governed, and uh, mm, made attractive also, and so to reach uh, um, leading positions in the market if they are run by uh, big corporations, the big tech. We talked also in previous session about this, that probably big tech will dominate also the metaverse world. This happens uh, uh, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, first, uh, these companies can translate uh, their market power that they are enjoying now in the digital world also into the metaverse world. Second, because these companies, uh, the, the metaverse needs uh, a huge computational power, storage power, because uh, if in the digital world data are central, in the metaverse will be much more, because um, the VR headset, the gloves, uh, have sensors that, uh, as we said also in the previous se session, um, gather a lot of data, a lot more data about uh, uh, the user. But of course, in order to process this data, you need a certain computational power that only certain companies can have. And uh, as I said, especially the problem also of the translation of market power from one market to the other, and Meta is doing this, of course. Meta is trying to translate its market power, its position, its dominant position, also to dominate the metaverse power. And so that's why competition law matters also in, uh, in, uh, in the metaverse world. And probably it could be one of the disciplines that could matter the most. Because if competition law returns to be uh, that field of law which was uh, intended to prevent big companies to become too big to translate their economic power into political power, into capturing powers also uh, um, in regard to institutions. That was particularly, this debate was particularly felt when the Sherman Act was enacted. 
um, if competition law succeed in this uh, task, of course, uh, uh, the market, but also our democracy, will be more healthy. And why I say I make a reference also to democracy? Because uh, the metaverse uh, is defined uh, as a 3D world where people, uh, this is a definition by the European Parliamentary Research Service, virtual 3D world where people interact through an avatar to enjoy entertainment, make purchases, and carry out transactions with crypto assets or work without leaving their seat. Well, but we saw that if the metaverse is such a parallel world, we also saw with digitalization that people also get their news, are influenced by digital companies, uh, there are the so-called echo chambers or the channel chale channeling of news feeds uh, like was clear in fa the Facebook uh, files scandal, for instance. And so just these problems will be increased in a parallel world, especially because uh, in this parallel world uh, there was an article I read that uh, um, that uh, made a, the metaphor of the metaverse as a, a sort of uh, increased level of the Bentamian panopticon because the company have the, has the possibility to see everything that the person is doing, everything, and uh, in the same time to influence these people as the company wants. Also because the metaverse uh, will be run uh, by a company, for instance. The Facebook metaverse will be run by Facebook. And so who sets the rules of this metaverse? Side quoting uh, Giovenale, quis custodiet ipsos custodes, if you understand Latin. And so competition law can prevent the creation of these empires and can stimulate competition also in the metaverse and if there is competition if there are not two big positions of power of private power of economic power also uh, the respect for the persons that are acting in for the rights of the persons that are acting in this environment and in general for the democratic process of our, our societies probably is more likely to be respected so now coming more into the rules that can be applied, of course, when I wrote the paper, the presentation, uh, and of course also now it's difficult to say which competition rules have to be applied in the metaverse and which kind of effects they can have. It's almost impossible because we have no cases and we have uh, no, uh, and we have no, uh, um, empirical evidence about uh, application of competition rules in the metaverse. But we can try to imagine what can happen. And uh, for the sake of this exercise, I divided violations of competition law into two, we can say, groups. The first one is uh, uh, where the metaverse, uh, where competition rules can be broken, can be violated, um, in the case the metaverse uh, is simply a service uh, provided by a digital company acting, operating in the real world. And on this we have also one case I can say, uh, that is the case uh, uh, not already concluded but uh, settled in for the a half, that's an interesting case by the German Bundeskartellamt which is probably the most active uh, competition authority in Europe and probably in the world uh, in the field of digitalization. And this case is about uh, the use uh, or the usage of the Oculus via uh, headset uh, by Facebook. The case was started in the end of 2020, uh, but uh, afterwards the new German reform about competition law entered into force and so was uh, the legal basis for this case was, uh, in, was augmented to this uh, new reform 
And in November 2022, the Bundeskartellamt and Meta reached an agreement. The basis of the case was that uh, Meta obliged uh, users of the Oculus headset to have a Facebook or Instagram account. So related to the social network. So if you want to use the Oculus, you need to have a Facebook account or an Instagram account, and so to have the social network. And consequently, of course, Facebook could gather data from your account that maybe you would not have done, and also can merge this data, the data from the headset and the data from the social network. The solution, given the new reform in Germany that now we will explain a little, was that of uh, imposing uh, Meta to create what is called the Meta account. This is a solution similar to the one adopted by the European Commission in the Microsoft account years ago. Uh, they obliged uh, Facebook that if users want to use the Oculus, they have to use and to, and to set the, the headset by means of a Meta account, which is a general account not linked to any other service from Meta. Then if they want to link, they can have then a choice screen where they can link their Meta account to Instagram or Facebook account. And this case was settled for this part, but there is also another part of this case related to data that are gathered, uh, that are gathered uh, via, um, via the headset. And this case is still under uh, investigation, but it's very similar to the famous Facebook case solved in 2019 and now pending for a preliminary ruling in front of the Court of Justice. So what are the rules that can be applied now in the field also of the metaverse? Um, Let's start with the policy positions uh, taken by uh, commissioners uh, for competition and, uh, and the European Commission in general. Uh, Commissioner Vestager said that uh, uh, the European Commission has to start investigating if some new rules is needed in the metaverse. But Commissioner Breton said also that the DMA will apply, plainly said that the DMA will apply also in the metaverse and uh, that by now no new rules are needed. And how this DMA apply? It's similar to the German reform used uh, by the Bundeskartellamt. There are two phases. The f is, is a structural reform, we can say. A company, if m match some indicators, is considered a gatekeeper. And if it's designated by the commission as a gatekeeper, some behavioral uh, rules apply and these behavioral rules means not to merge their data, the data gathered through various services, uh, not to offer bundled services uh, that are not related, that are not necessary, to, that the bundle is not necessary because it, this is market development, so to translate power into another market and that can be very interesting in the metaverse of course and also a lot of other provisions. What is also interesting uh, in this field is uh, the fact uh, that uh, the DMA does not envisage only pecuniary, pecuniary fines, because for these companies pecuniary fines are just cost of running business, we can say, because you can pay until 10% of your uh, turnover, but uh, of course you can have a higher profit by violating competition rules, but uh, also uh, structural, um, uh, structural rules are uh, envisaged. Structural means uh, breakup of the company. By now, of course, the, we didn't see this, but uh, in future it can be, and it can be also in the metaverse. Also traditional competition rules will apply, of course, but uh, maybe some change will be needed. And it is interesting that, for instance, uh, they are still not being issued by the European Commission is uh, uh, reviewing 
its guidelines on the market definition. Market definition is a very interesting process that is very useful that is run when a competition law case is, is, case is, uh, is investigated and it is useful to define which exact market is affected by this uh, excess of market power or by this cartel. And in these new guidelines, the Commission takes into account digitalization, network effects, uh, and also the problems that are related to market developments. Also, some rules are, I say quickly because we can talk hours about this, I'm just trying to give uh, um, an overview. Also, rules uh, have been introduced both in the European Union, but also national level. In Italy, some very interesting rules about it, these have been introduced, uh, about mergers, because one of the, also in, also in case of the metaverse, one of the most strategic moves by tech companies are the so-called uh, killer acquisitions. So if there is a little uh, we can little company, a startup developing some new product that can be a, a threat to the dominant position of a company, the easiest way is to buy this company, to prevent this company to become competitive. And this can happen in the metaverse. Think at an alternative metaverse that is created by maybe a little company, can be a threat, let's buy this metaverse and integrate into ours. Uh, usually in mergers uh, there was a threshold that was monetary but of course the Commission has understood uh, and uh, the legislator has understood that uh, in this kind of transactions uh, it's not the value of the, the monetary value that matters but the mo value the amount of data because this is the consideration and that's why the new rules also envisage a notification to the Commission in case just a tech company is uh, involved. So, uh, to conclude, I try to give an overview of the competition rules, of why competition law matters and what is the role the competition law also from a policy and ideal standpoint has to, uh, has to play in the metaverse. Of course, in the paper you will find much more detailed explanation about the rules because there was not enough time, of course, to explain everything. And uh, um, I thank you for your attention and I'm open to, uh, to go maybe more into detail on some aspects during the Q&A session. Thank you very much for this insightful presentation. Um, we, uh, I think we can keep the, the questions for, for later on. Um, I will uh, welcome now Peter Metzay, uh, who is a professor of law from the University of uh, Zeged. Um, he's uh, an adjunct professor at the Faculty uh, of Law uh, of the University of Turku in Finland, uh, is also a visiting professor at uh, Lyon 3 University. Um, he's uh, uh, the person that coordinates the joint uh, IP LLM program of the Technical University in Dresden and the University of Zagreb, and uh, is the uh, Zagreb person uh, in charge of this program. He, of course, teaches uh, comparative law, uh, comparative digital, international, and European copyright law. And uh, um, finally, he's the member of the European Copyright Society and the Hungarian Copyright Expert Board. Um, Peter will uh, talk to us about uh, uh, a, a very interesting uh, aspect of intellectual property and particularly copyright and the metaverse. Thank you very Thanks. much. I hope this long introduction doesn't count into the 20 minutes because then I want to, uh, thank you very much. It was absolutely uh, too much. Ah, well, already I finished. Okay. Do you want to offer me another job? I mean, I will respond to you in a coffee break. I, I think 20 I, minutes. Yeah, 
but I will show you my Ferrari outside as well, okay? So you can probably understand how rich I am. No. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for having me here. It's actually a pleasure to return to Lyon, uh, which I regularly do every year except COVID. So, uh, but by the way, this is the first time I'm here in Lyon, not teaching at Lyon Trois first and then coming here to give a conference for, for uh, people and students uh, at uh, UCL. E, uh, how do you pronounce it anyway? Um, <laughs> let me start immediately because time is very, very short. I am going to present to you uh, um, the part of uh, uh, the book which, uh, at a part of the book which is on uh, intellectual property aspects of, of the metaverse. This is a very, very big question, I would say, but you will certainly see uh, my and our reflection on the question. I also have to mention it's a co-authored piece uh, with another wonderful colleague from uh, India. She's in India, so it would be very hard for her to join uh, us uh, as well, but this is a co-authored piece. And the immediate reaction of copyright people on technological development is this. Uh, we are probably not the best picture because we copyright people are probably the dinosaurs and we should be frightened by uh, shouting kids rather than dinosaurs shouting at the uh, young lady. But this is what we feel in the last uh, uh, years or have felt in the last uh, few years with uh, so many technological developments out there which uh, might pose challenges to the uh, existing paradigm of uh, copyright law. Not probably not only for copyright law uh, within the field of intellectual property, but for copyright, certainly. Today, I'm only going to talk about metaverse, although I must admit I came to the metaverse uh, discourse from an NFT perspective uh, into which I entered from a, a digital exhaustion perspective. So it's a very nice organic development for me to ultimately end up at the metaverse. Anyway, I'm sometimes shouting at or crying at that, li at that little girl when it's about metaverse because you will see I'm a little bit of skeptical about metaverse's role for copyright law. In order to start this presentation, I have a few stage setting slides. I will jump there and back. The first one is that it's of course a reality. Uh, many other speakers have already mentioned the economic scale, the, uh, the um, the relevance is from the perspective of data or competition or even uh, the uh, theoretical, philosophical uh, backing and, and, and literary, literature, uh, literary uh, backing of, of the metaverse. Uh, but I tried to put a sentence on the screen which uh, tries to indicate why it's relevant for copyright law as well. And if you just take a look at there, again, this is a digital reality, so it's a virtual thing, it's an online thing, it's, we, we already heard about that. but. Uh, but there are words like online gaming, augmented and virtual realities that facilitate the training of goods and services in exchange of not always but uh, uh, quite often non-fungible tokens and cryptocurrencies. These words are not necessarily copyright things, but they play an uh, extremely uh, great role for the modern uh, uh, trends in copyright law. So in other words, copyright and the metaverse are serial seriously intertwined. When we jump to the next slide, we also try to conceptualize, not define. We already talked about the question whether it, it's possible at all to define what is, meta, what is metaverse. But we tried to conceptualize and we came to the conclusion with my colleague that the metaverse is a horizontal, virtual, collaborative space. Uh, under horizontal, we mean that it's uh, typically a mixture of var various options of uh, the various participants of the whole uh, ecosystem platforms and users, and they do not only necessarily game only online, but they can also exchange avatars, they can, uh, avatars of persons, avatars of tools, avatars of uh, whatever game components. Uh, you can also enjoy a concert in between two fights in uh, online games, etc., etc. This is horizontal because this, this is not only we already heard this expression as well. We do not only view what happens inside. We have the ability to do what's happening inside as well. This is something that for copyright lawyers resembles the expression of Lawrence Lessig's read-write culture. We can write in the meta uh, metaverse as well. Do not only read. This is why we call it horizontal. I don't think I have to explain virtual, collaborative, or space. These are quite self-evident, but I also try to highlight a few more words believe that uh, the mere fact we have now this metaverse is partially uh, due to the constant and very serious development in the fields of 
various hardware and software technologies, platformization very much, platforms bring in the scale. You know, I don't want to interrupt my own presentation with a story that came to my mind just two hours before, but I'm not sure how many of you have read those uh, very nice little books. I was a child at that time when we had, when you had to read the book and jump to 100, uh, the, the, the story 100 or text 100, then from 100 to 245. I don't know what's the English term for these books when you have to flip uh, the sides from A to B anyway. And you know, my biggest dream ever was to be the strongest hero of this world. So when I read one book and I, of course, hypothetically survived the story, I brought all my weapons to the next book, which was against the law. I mean, law of the book, because you had to start from scratch to become a big hero. And of course, I killed all the, anim all the I don't know, monsters in the second book and the third. And then it just came to my mind, this is also a metaverse of books, actually. Uh, again, this is just a bad analogy or metaphor here. But uh, platforms brought us the present metaverse. Whatever actually we heard about Neil Stephenson, uh, this is really much the most recent uh, uh, technological developments that made it possible to have it. We already heard a lot about data. Datafication is of course a phenomenon that contributes very much to this uh, field. And of course, uh, this has very close uh, relevances or deep relevances for intellectual property, including copyright as well. And social changes. Um, I always say I'm not the youngest person, probably not the oldest person of the world, but I don't understand what do people like in this stuff, but many people like the metaverse. You cannot deny that it's socially an issue out there that many people enjoy and want to enjoy. So this is really a social phenomenon that probably law has to apply to. And so our last state setting uh, slide is this one. This is a domain, a domain for law, a domain for intellectual property as well, which has to stand, uh, which must be subject to legal scrutiny. Nevertheless, our main conclusion, which I say at the very beginning now, is that we don't believe this is uh, going to change the uh, paradigm of copyright law. We have to, we also heard it from Stefan, this expression regarding e-commerce earlier, we have to re or just simply interpret the existing uh, legal norms in order to reflect what's happening on the metaverse. For this purpose, in this paper and in the presentation as well, we followed with my uh, colleague a quite basic didactic method. We are going to go through uh, copyright in the quite classic approach, existence and exercise of copyrights. I'm going to show this to you on the coming uh, slides, what we found out. Regarding existence, um, of course, existence is about the protection, whether there is any copyright protection for expressions of art, uh, science, or literature. We believe that there are various certainties out there, um, like the so-called originality threshold of copyright law is a very low threshold. Almost any kind of expression can surpass this uh, requirement, and therefore even a virtual uh, glove might be eligible to surpass uh, the minimum requirement of protection. It's not a question where this glove is hypothetically created, offline, online. As long as it's a work of the mind, an expression of the mind, it's under copyright law, subject to protection. And this is very much the same in the US, in Europe, in uh, many other jurisdictions of the world. Originality is quite similar everywhere around the world. Also. Uh, it's quite self-evident that the software, the uh, design, the GU, uh, sorry, uh, graphic user interface uh, related to the metaphors environment in general is protected by copyright because these are classic subject matters for copyright. What might be very interesting is, of course, whether uh, the, the images of avatars or something which I try to show, although it's very hard to see from the picture per se, uh, maybe even performances and other kind of uh, activities which are carried out in the metaverse are eligible for protection, be it copyright or related rights. It's another question of jurisdiction. That picture practically indicates to you a very interesting uh, South Korean uh, TV show where people in small boxes vary, are wearing all these uh, equipments, uh, gloves and, uh, and uh, Oculus or whatever, actually, I don't know what kind of glasses, uh, gloves and glasses and everything, and so they have virtual avatars dancing in the whatever metaverse and competing for the best avatar 
X factor, whatever. Okay, this is something South, South Korean stuff. Question, is this kind of performance subject to protection? Well, hypothetically, it can be because these, these kind of performances can easily surpass the requirement of protection. I'm not an expert of South Korean copyright, but I can imagine this is the case. On the other hand, we have certain uncertainties. And I immediately try to ref uh, mention NFTs and uh, some jurisdictional questions. A very serious question for copyright lawyers in the United States is the so-called formalities question. You have to um, fix your work in order to be protected. You have to register your work in order to apply federal copyright protection as well as initiate case in front of a, a US federal uh, court. If you don't do that, you might be able to defend yourself only outside of US copyright law. But that's not the case in Europe. We don't need fixation, we don't need registration, and therefore jurisdiction can matter. So it matters a lot which law applies to various metaverses, actually. Next thing, NFTs. For that, I have two more slides. I had the uh, hope that I will be able to click on the, uh, on the uh, computer right in front of me, so I just don't waste time with clicking separately. Uh, I mentioned that I am coming from the NFT ecosystem to the metaverse ecosystem, so I can say that in the last three years I was following NFTs very closely, and my impression about NFTs uh, are almost like the same as with respect to the metaverse. It's not necessarily a, a, a paradigm shifting situation. The first thing I want to mention with respect to copyright and the metaverse is that quite a lot of NFTs are of course present in the, in the, in the metaverse. Many of these uh, NFTs are, for example, connected uh, to profile pictures, which is probably the biggest hit in the NFTs, but there's one big problem. Many of these, or maybe most probably all of these uh, profile pictures are generated by artificial intelligence. And now we bring in the third technology out there. Uh, the current status quo of copyright law says that as long as there's no human cause in the creation of the content, so there's no uh, exact human hand on the creation of the avatars or whatever, uh, then there's no copyright protection. As such, the very famous CryptoPunks or, or Bored Apes, uh, etc. actually the other picture that you can see is the, uh, the heading of the complaint against the uh, uh, person called Ryder Rips who was uh, re-minting each and every uh, board Ape uh, uh, profile picture. And if you just look at the complaint, you will notice there are a lot of complaints other than copyright. Uh, Yoga Labs never registered the board Ape uh, avatars at the US Copyright Office, so they are unable to uh, initiate a federal copyright case against uh, Ryder Rips. Why, you might ask it, why didn't they try to register it? The answer is probably because all the board apes are generated by artificial intelligence. And therefore, therefore, most probably the US Copyright Office, which just published a little bit more than a month ago in the 15th of March, uh, a statement, a clear document that they are not willing to register those AI outputs which have no direct connection to a human. So that's a problem. That can be a real problem for the metaverse as well, because many, many contents behind the NFTs are not human-made content. The other thing which I might flag, and this is very much uh, close to the ec economic aspects of NFTs, is that the sales are decreasing. Uh, this uh, image that you can probably only see uh, regarding the scale of the decrease of sales, is uh, uh, created in November last year, so it's not the most recent one, but I simply didn't find the time to look for the most recent date. Anyway, you can see NFT sales and the volume and the money involved in the NFT sales is uh, shrinking. Uh, this is one of the reasons why many people argue that NFTs won't have a real role in the metaverse uh, ecosystem, because there are not that many people who bring in NFTs anymore into various uh, metaverses. This is why. Many people try to argue that NFTs are dead and Metaverse is also shrinking. And of course, that's uh, just only one side of the story uh, because we see generative AI coming into play uh, in the last few months, last, let's say one and, uh, half a year with ChatGP and uh, other things. It's of course a relative thing. That seems to be the most fancy thing right now. We also heard very nicely that Disney uh, also Meta decreases the investments into the metaverse. Meta expressly said, of course, we are jumping into AI. 
because they need the money for AI not to lose the competition against Microsoft and other uh, corporations in the United States. Anyway, I would say NFTs, which was at some point very heavily intertwined with Metaverse, is probably not going to play a great role in this uh, ecosystem at all. Next thing. Uh, for copyright lawyers, this is uh, the holy grail. What economic rights is affected if something happens? Do we use a work? I would say uh, I'm not wasting the time of uh, the audience here because it's very much theoretical to analyze which economic right means what. But I would say something. Under current copyright law, not necessarily in every situation, but with respect to economic rights, we have so-called technological neutrality in almost every country. It means that these economic rights like reproduction or uh, communication to the public are quite independent from the technology. It's independent whether it's offline, online, whether it's radio or uh, uh, web radio, online radio. It depends upon how we use the content in terms of, uh, of audience and location. I'm not wasting the time again here. I just simply say that for copyright lawyers, at least that's my opinion, metaverse activities can quite easily fit into economic rights like reproduction or depending upon the exact jurisdiction, US or EU, words like performance, display, distribution, or communication to the public. These economic rights can cover what end users and platforms do. In other words, we don't need brand new rights. We don't need new definitions for these activities. A very, very uh, important question, liability, platform liability and end user liability as well. Who is liable if someone is uploading a content to the metaverse to which it had no right, like minting an NFT in a copy fraud way or um, a pure infringement uh, or plagiaristic uh, activity out there. Well, we are going to have a presentation on platforms uh, on this conference yet, so I'm very eager to listen to that presentation as well. But I only flag that for copyright lawyers, the question is not a deep problem at all, at least in the last few years. We have seen how the European Union has amended its platform uh, regulations. Now we have a generalistic uh, system under the e-commerce directive, which is going to be replaced by the DSA very soon. And we have a Lex Specialis for those online content sharing service uh, providers, which are designed to allow end users to upload contents. Those who are not so-called OCSSPs, however, are subject to the e-commerce DSA setting. What might be, however, the common in both of these systems, there will be and there is some kind of content moderation obligations, be it the uh, so-called liability uh, concept of Article 17 of the CDSM Directive or e-commerce and DSA's uh, notice and takedown regime, hosting slash notice and takedown regime, Platforms uh, most probably have to take steps to filter out illegal contents from their website, otherwise their website or system, uh, otherwise they will be liable for end user activities. And only just to mention an example, there was already a decision regarding the upload of unauthorized uh, uh, copies of uh, designs or pa sorry, paintings in the form of uh, designs of clothes on uh, uh, I think uh, Decentraland and uh, the Metaverse as well, and the uh, Barcelona court has issued an injunction to take down this stuff, and it had to be taken down. Uh, I'm getting very close to the end, uh, end user flexibility. So if there are rights, there must be limitations and exceptions or, uh, or uh, balancing mechanisms out there. I must say that there is very limited amount of evidences out there to show how these platforms guarantee end user flexibilities. But I would say I did a little bit of research for this paper based on the research I carried out with my colleague in Seged within the frames of a big horizon uh, project. Uh, where we analyze end user license agreements, where we actually found that the end user license agreements are either completely silent on end user flexibilities or they are completely asymmetric in favor of right holders and the platforms themselves rather than the users. I checked Roblox and I'm going to check other uh, metaverse uh, uh, companies, services, end user license agreements as well. I can confirm based on one end user license agreement yet that they are completely silent. So it's very interesting to see how flexibilities are going to work in the online ecosystem. I fear no way.
Finally, one thing is that, uh, that uh, of course, a question arises, what if someone is creating something in the metaverse? Is that kind of, is that content also protected offline? And I would uh, easily conclude that it depends. It depends upon the end user license agreement. Again, you have to read the end user license agreements carefully. I checked it again with Roblox. Roblox makes it clear if you do a UGC, rights are yours. But if you dare to use their system, their services, then you have to give an, uh, a complete, full, worldwide, unlimited, etc., license for Roblox. In other words, uh, other than merchandising stuff, so you can put your stuff on your T-shirt if you want, other than that, you have nothing to do in the offline world if Roblox is not giving you a permission for that. Anyway, these are fancy questions. My conclusion is nevertheless... Mm. Oh, come on. Oh. Something which is not working out there. It's working okay one of my favorite movies i'm not sure whether there's anything serious to see out there in the metaverse from a copyright perspective but please don't disperse yet because we have a wonderful presentation about patents as well thank you peter uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation and uh, the Introducing the next topic. Yeah. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to welcome Yoni, my colleague, uh, Rondrian Irina, who is a tenure associate professor uh, at uh, Grenoble Alp University, but also a visitor, visiting professor here at UCLI. She earned a PhD uh, uh, from the University of Poitiers, and uh, she authored a number of books on commercial law and recently co-authored a book on, in uh, business law and artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, a main research area is business law, intellectual property, and has recently focused on artificial intelligence, NFT, and metaverse. She will be talking to us about patent law, as I said. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you, Larry and Michel, for inviting me to, uh, uh, to take part in this very uh, successful conference on such a challenging topic, which is uh, patent law and metaverse. So it's a good thing that uh, I'm talking right after Peter, uh, because whereas copyright applies to uh, artistic creations, patents apply to industrial creations. So basically, patents cover physical inventions, tangible products, and the goal is to find the link between uh, patents and virtual creations. So I wish I could say that patent law does not apply in the metaverse, and my presentation would be done in three minutes. But in fact, the answer is not that easy, and uh, we'll see. There are three categories, if I can... Uh, I don't know if it, if it works, it's not working. Uh, sorry. I don't know why. I try to. Where is okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, there are three categories of uh, metaverse. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, online game platforms, social media platforms, and corporate platforms. So, for example, Minecraft uh, online game platform. Uh, these are also called massively multiplayer online role-playing games, or MORC, like Minecraft or Fortnite. It is another uh, survival game where a lot of players fight against each other through their avatars. You also have Roblox. And uh, uh, in social media platform, we have VRChat, the most used one. We have also Horizon Workrooms, a social media platform created by Meta. Uh, the Sandbox, uh, no, uh, Second Life, sorry. Second Life, known to be the first metaverse platform. This, uh, the Sandbox, uh, in which some companies have bought virtual lands. You have Decentraland. 
And uh, uh, the third category is uh, the corporate ones, the, the corporate metaverses. So some companies create their own metaverse platforms. For example, here you have employees overseeing assembly lines, inventory, supply levels from their office without having to be physically in the field. So the metaverse is an ideal advertising space for corporations, thus it creates new opportunities and new challenges for intellectual property. So Peter have talked about uh, one good part of IP, which is copyright, so I won't talk about copyright. The legal issue uh, would be, are inventions related to the metaverse patentable? So my students know the answer. I will ask them questions. Uh, it would be count as your uh, final uh, grade. <laughs> so uh, so uh, technologies used in the metaverse are generally extended reality. So you have VR, virtual reality technology, AR, augmented reality technology, and MR, uh, mixed reality. So you have here the definitions of the three extended reality technologies. So because I only have 20 minutes, and even if I am from the, uh, for, from the <laughs> for, okay, local, so um, I won't uh, profit from extra minutes, I think. Okay, so I'm just giving some examples. Example of virtual reality. So Peter talked about live show on the metaverse. So here you have an example of a, a live show uh, staged by uh, the band Marshmallow on for, in Fortnite. I don't know if you say on or in, in Fortnite. Um, an example of augmented reality, IKEA. Uh, use, yes, uses augmented reality to allow consumers to place virtual copies of their furniture in a room to test how they look and if they fit with the existing furniture. And an example of mixed reality, I know that uh, some of you, maybe the younger one, ones, have, uh, have seen the movie uh, Ready Player One by Steven Spielberg uh, in uh, 2018. So uh, the mixed reality mixed the augmented and the virtual reality. So you put on haptic suits and then you, uh, um, you act as if you really were in, uh, in the game. So it's a very nice movie. Watch it, please. <laughs> so um, an example of uh, mixed reality, uh, medical trainings or uh, historical trainings, I don't know. Uh, medical or um, historical classes, maybe, uh, with 3D hologram interactive models of organs. So um, there are two types of patents. Uh, you have utility patents covering novel and useful invention and design patents covering ornamental designs. For example, the Brompton bicycle is protected with a utility patent covering the folding mechanism of the bicycle and uh, with a design patent covering the shape of the bicycle. So creations developed in the metaverse could be granted both utility and design patents. For example, a smartphone is patentable twice, the hardware-based invention making the smartphone work and the shape of the smartphone. So, uh, the sources of international patent law, you have Paris Convention, students know that, Patent Cooperation Treaty, also known as PCT, and the European Patent Convention. So, none of these treaties provide the conditions for patentability. They just let national laws determine the criteria, the requirements. Um, so let's take a look at the patentability requirements provided by domestic laws. Uh, you have European Patent Convention, for example, uh, which says that patents shall be granted for any inventions in all fields of technology, provided that they are new, first condition, they involve an inventive step, second condition, and are susceptible of industrial application. The EU requirements are the same as those provided by French IP code, 
Patents may protect any invention in all fields of technology, provided that it is new, involves an inventive step, and is capable of industrial application. If we want to compare European law with US law, we can see that there is a very slight and yet important difference uh, between the two. I US legislation says usefulness instead of industrial application. So we'll see that uh, I'm give, I will give you some case studies and you, <laughs> you will have to learn your lesson okay, by the end of this, uh, this talk. So, um, if we read the UK Patents Act, we can find that the same conditions as in EU and French laws. There is additional criterion. The grant of patent must not be excluded by the law. French IP law also includes this lawfulness condition, so the invention must be licit. To sum up, there are five cumulative conditions for patentability. So I won't have time to define novelty nor industrial application, but I will explain very shortly what an invention is and will say a few words about the lawfulness of the invention. So according to uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, an invention is a product or a process that provides in general a new way of doing something or offers a new techni technical solution to a technical problem. So this definition is taken from uh, a French author's definition, which is Professor Michel Vivant from Sciences Po, who's for, for the French people in the, in the room. So Professor Vivant say, wrote that there is invention each time an intellectual process, whatever it is, allows to end in innovation being supported on knowledge stemming from hard sciences. So, in short, he says, uh, an invention would be a technical solution to a technical problem. So, that is for the first condition. The fifth condition uh, is the lawfulness of the, of the invention. So, the invention must not be contrary to morality in order to get patented. So, for various reasons, such as the respect of public order, or morality, the law, however, prohibits the, the protection of certain inventions, even if they comply with the other requirements. So some legislations expressly, expressly prohibit the granting of patents over certain types of inventions. And uh, uh, for example, following European Patent Convention, Patents shall not be granted in respects of invention, the commercial exploitation of which would be contrary to morality. Thus, most patent offices would refuse to grant utility patents over inventions which are contrary to human dignity, contrary to morality, uh, such as methods of cloning human beings, for example, or methods of modifying the genetic identity of the human being. But in the US, useful inventions, even if they are immoral, are fully patentable. Controversial inventions are very much patent eligible today under US law. In fact, the US PTO, United States Patents and Trademark Office, once rejected immoral inventions, but the doctrine of moral utility was overturned by a decision issued by the Federal Circuit in 1999. So that was for the big introduction. There are two types of inventions related to the metaverse. So my first part would be uh, about inventions developed for the metaverse, and in the second part, I will talk about inventions developed in the metaverse. So uh, first of all, uh, we won't talk long about VR headsets and other devices that are developed to enable users to interact in the metaverse with 3D digital objects. These inventions meet all the criteria for patentability, so they are patented and patentable. Haptic suits have a motion capture and biometric sensors the systems use electrical muscle stimulation and electrical nerve stimulation. 
to simulate feelings and sensations so that when the avatar is hit in the metaverse, the user physically feels the pain in real life. That is perfect. Of course, such inventions meet all the patentability requirements. So these inventions are patentable. Okay, so what about softwares? My students will answer. Patentable or not? No, that's not the answer I told you. <laughs> no, that is not a legal answer. <laughs> <laughs> As to software-related patents, computer programs per se are not patentable, but, but if the software-based invention can be proven to have a what? A technical effect, a technical improvement, uh, or a technical implementation, then patents can be granted. For example, systems for generating haptic feedback corresponding to users' interaction, this is patentable. What about uh, a software allowing users to create avatars? Softwares that you can use to create your own avatar. Patentable or not? I won't be happy. <laughs> it is patentable because it gives some technical effect. Okay, you create something. So it is patentable, and actually, Apple detains some patents over these kinds of softwares, okay? Um, of course, uh, inventions that allow, okay, inventions allowing uh, people exclude some avatars from a game. For example, uh, we talked this morning, uh, you talked about uh, an avatar which can violate the rules inside a metaverse, can you exclude it? There, there are some softwares that you can use to exclude an avatar. Patentable? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So, um, this is the doctrine of the Board of Appeals of the European Patent Office. Uh, Software-based inventions are patentable provided that they have technical character if they cause a technical effect when run on a computer. Okay? What about blockchain technologies? Are they patentable? Now you're afraid to answer. So if you use it just to create a metaverse, just to, um, uh, just to buy some, some cryptocurrencies, then it's not. It would be acting as a software, but if you use the blockchain to create something like NFTs, then it would be patentable, okay? So the answer always depends on if it, it causes technical effect or not, okay? So uh, Nike obtained a patent over um, a blockchain technology to create NFTs, to create crypto kicks, okay? So uh, they have a patent. So now, what about inventions contrary to public order? So uh, maybe you don't know this man. Uh, this young man is, uh, is named Palmer Lucky, the Oculus founder. So he claims he designed a new VR headset, he named Nerve Gear, that actually kills you if you die in the game. Yes, I know. <laughs> I like the, the reaction. Yes, so he, he is American. Uh, he recently developed a VR headset rigged with bombs. You can see the three little bombs, okay, on the, on the headset. So if there is an alert saying that you lose in the game, then the three bombs explode before you can even uh, retrieve your, yes, exactly. So it's just a prototype. Don't be afraid, it's just a prototype. But Maybe some manufacturers would be interested to buy the patent if, if it is patentable, okay? So, uh, what about uh, this uh, headset? Patentable or not? Good! Yuri, that's it? Yes, good Yuri. You have 20 out of 20. <laughs> I remember your name. Uh, yes, in the US, 
it would be patentable because uh, the inventions contrary to morality are patentable in the US. Okay? But in Europe, we are protected by the law. In, the, in Europe, then it would not be patentable because it would be contrary to public order. Yes, I'm finishing. Uh, second part, inventions developed in the metaverse. What if an avatar, like in Ready Player One movie, what if an avatar creates an invention in the game? For example, uh, for example, an avatar may create a shoe that gives you extra powers in the game, okay? And you can import it in Fortnite. So you have uh, more power than the other players, than the other avatars. Would that be patentable? Before you answer, I'm giving you a real example. This is the last slide, Natalie. Don't worry. So uh, Kerbal Space Program is a metaverse, and uh, it, it allows people create real, no, not real, but um, engines like rockets, aircrafts, space planes, rovers, in, like in the real atmospheric conditions. So would that be patentable regarding the fact that Manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers, may be interested in the idea. So they will copy, they, uh, they could be interested in copying the idea and then patent them because they have money to actually manufacture the engine. I don't know, I don't have the answer, but I would be interested in uh, allowing the patentability of the virtual creations. Okay, so um, patent offices do not, uh, do not regard, uh, it's, it's not a condition for patentability. The, the fact that it is, uh, I, I don't know, it is efficient or not, that is not a patentability requirement. So let's face it, I'm a law of physics, mm. and mathematics mm. is not patentable. A law of physics cannot be patentable. Mm. It seems very inventive, but I, I, I would encourage the patentability because uh, um, I think that it would be unfair that the creator in the game doesn't have the patent and the manufacturer, because it's a company, because it's an industrial manufacturer, then he has the right to get the patent. I would say that it would be unfair. So that was my last slide, so thank you for your attention. So to, feel free to discuss. Thank you very much, Uni, for this uh, very uh, case oriented and practice oriented uh, speech. Well done. Um, we, this is uh, question times now, so do we have questions from the floor? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, the three of you. I, I, I don't know if it's a remark or a question, but uh, I happen to give courses on ethics of AI for the Faculty of Law here. And um, I had a small argument with, with the students about the VR helmet you talked about that's supposed to kill. Uh, and uh, because the students presented it as real, and I, I had not heard of it, of it, and they, I, I, it cannot exist, I told them. And then they insisted, they sent me the reference, and then I checked it. And um, I think for us, um, and uh, Mathieu, uh, who gives the course with me, uh, it's very important to help the students understand the difference. I think it's the main part. I, I am a specialist of science fiction. And I think 
one of the main parts of uh, our job is to help the students to make the difference between what is real and what is fiction or still fiction. And uh, it's very difficult, in fact, because uh, inventors are on the edge. And as they need money, they spend a lot of time making people believe that uh, they, have, they have invented the, the, the thing. And lo when looking in more precisely into these VR helmets, it was not as advanced as some papers suggest. And in fact, indeed, it's just a bomb which has been rigged on a helmet and it doesn't really work and I don't know if it will ever really work and it felt like it was more like uh, publicity, uh, self-marketing. So I would like to know about your feeling about that. But uh, yeah, because it, it feels it conveys a false understanding of what is really going on in, in, in the business. Yes. I, um, I forgot to mention that uh, it was an art project, yes, it's, it's just an art project, but um, uh, yet it is possible someone else could be uh, interested in uh, actually making the, the helmet. Just what I, I told the students, if it really existed, I would have heard of it. And it, uh, at this point, it's not, it doesn't exist. And I mean, it could physically exist, but even, I don't know, even in the US, I'm not sure it, it, would, it would go on, f at, at, at least right now, even in the political situation, as far as being a, a commercial product, because I don't really see who would be interested in buying such a helmet. And it also will be a comment, but thanks a lot for your three presentations that were really amazing and stimulating. But also connecting this with what we heard about the loss of interest a bit into the metaverse and things like this. You see, this helmet makes a lot of noise and it's crazy. Like, But come on, you can do that uh, playing with dice. And you say I have uh, an automatic stuff uh, that trigger when I just get the double one. Or playing with the, just the normal uh, controllers to a video game, and if you crash with your car, you, you have something happening to you, electricity or something like this. So here, it, there, it's, uh, it's shocking, it's marketable, it's, uh, it's probably <laughs> good to, to, to do noise and to discuss uh, consequences, but uh, yes, and it, it, somehow it, it's interesting for the philosophy because it can exist, it, ex it exists, but it does not exist really in the sense of what the students were trying to say. They were meaning that uh, some people have that and use that and or are ready to, something like this. Okay, we have, uh, have to move on, we're behind schedule, but I have a question, okay, to Andre. Uh, and uh, that is simply that the inability of whether the EU competition Directorate or the U.S. Justice Department not to move in breaking up big tech. And you, you said the reason was, uh, in a sense, no one could replace them, that the, the, that the costs involved in developing the data and all of that is just something that cannot be broken up, I guess. But at some point, the amount of power that it, and power over our lives that they have is so concentrated. So at some point, don't you think competition law has to step in? I mean, my only analogy, and it's not a good one, is we had one telephone company in the United States. And the same idea of uh, costs, sunk costs and investments, it, you know, it was, would be prohibitive you know, for someone to compete against them. Or, or if we took whatever the rights away to duplicate that system without lots of money. 
but yet, yet they were able to break them up into seven baby bells. And there was never, I, I can't remember any uh, diminishment of service or anything like that. So do you see any hope that eventually the EU or the United States will finally come and take out Facebook? Because they are also one of the companies you talked about that were predatory and gobbling up Instagram and all those other ones. So to mean, you mean to, uh, I quote, uh, uh, Senator Warren to take out the antitrust stick, <laughs> like she said. Uh, I don't know because the, um, the DMA envisage this possibility but is so floated, you know, it's just uh, maybe put there as a de deterrent effect but we have to, I don't remember, eight times not to comply with behavioral or monetary fines uh, be before the commission could trigger this possibility and so it's quite unlikely but it was of course a policy, political uh, agreement about this just to put this possibility, but not to, to render it difficult to, 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 to use, because of course it's a, a difficult land, because uh, there is policy, competition policy on one side, and the freedom of economic initiative on the other side. And the dominant position is not in itself uh, prohibited by, by competition rule is the abuse of dominant position that is prohibited by competition rules. But, of course, probably the mistake was made before in the sense that uh, a, a soft application of competition rules allowed these companies to arrive at this point that the normal competition rules cannot be effective. What we can hope, of course, is that uh, the new exempt structural uh, uh, provisions could uh, day by day try to solve, to fix the things, uh, of course, in a less traumatic way and more gradual way, and then to, we can say, help the invisible end, uh, these rules, uh, to re remake the, the market in equilibrium. But of course, the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, using the antitrust stick was <clears throat> suggested also by, for instance, there is an article by Tommaso Valletti, who was chief of the economical service of the European Commission, and he suggested that it's a viable idea that of, uh, um, of using breakup in uh, um, in particularly difficult cases. If it will be done, I don't know. Probably it depends on the effectiveness of, of the new rules. If they will be effective, probably the necessity of using breakup will be reduced. But if they will not be effective, probably as last resort, everything can be done. I don't know if you're satisfied. Okay. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, I think we have to um, close this session. Very interesting though, but uh, I think we can talk about that a little bit later around coffee, uh, later point. Thank you. Yeah, there is some coffee in the room in front, okay? Let's say 10 minutes break.
as much work. You know, if you graduate it, you already. Christina is excused. From Cibo. She's going to be there. Okay. Are you not sure? All right, please, after this well-deserved break, because our brains are fusing, I now have the pleasure to chair the third uh, session of this uh, symposium dealing with um, metaverse and business law, uh, looking at metaverse as a new market of goods and services. Uh, in the first place, Professor Barbara Pozzo from the Italian University of Imbria, in Subria, uh, who runs here a particular postgraduate program on fashion law, will precisely introduce us to fashion law and metaverse and how metaverse is reshaping fashion law legal issues. Uh, we have seen indeed that many major fashion brands made their entrance in the metaverse. In, uh, next, we will have the pleasure uh, to listen to Dr. Pinar Kaglayan Aksoy. <laughs> uh, who is an assistant professor at Bilkent University in Turkey. Uh, she will address the question of legal services in the metaverse. Um, practitioners will be particularly interested. Uh, is it a new opportunity of legal, uh, for legal practitioners, uh, for legal advertising? And she will ad also address the associated risk with such a practice for lawyers in the metaverse. Uh, finally, last but not least, we uh, will have the pleasure to uh, hear Professor Christina Poncibo remotely, hopefully if she's connected then, uh, who has already edited a few books uh, with the co-organizer of uh, today's um, symposium. Uh, and she will uh, speak with PhD candidate Luigi Contizani from Volvic University. Uh, on the challenging relationship between the metaverse and the European platform uh, law. They will investigate the applicability to metaverse of uh, uh, the recent EU regulation, in particular uh, the platform to business regulation, the DMA, the DSA. Uh, uh, we are really uh, impatient to hear that. Um, and without further ado, I will give you the floor, uh, Professor Pozzo. And also the and also the microphone. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Thank you for having uh, me here. I'm always very happy to be back in, uh, in Lyon. Um, let me say a few words about my personal interest in the uh, fashion law. Uh, I am directing this course, uh, in, in postgraduate course in fashion law in Italy, but uh, uh, my the interest that I'm going to focus on today is the one on sustainable fashion. Why? Because the university where I teach in Subria University is located in Como. Como is the town of silk in Italy, as Lyon is the town of silk in France. And uh, since two years, Como has become a creative city among the UNESCO uh, uh, network on, with a project on sustainable fashion. So this is why also the university has focused uh, very much on this particular topic. And uh, uh, I think 
that uh, um, sustainable fashion is actually the future of fashion. So let me, let me present uh, on metaverse and how metaverse can be or not, who knows, uh, a, a solution to the problems of sustainable fashion in this particular um, context. So let me, I will give you a very short introduction, then I will say a few words on sustainable fashion, uh, particularly focusing on the EU strategy on sustainable and circular textiles, and then I will come to the issue of today, that is to say metaverse and sustainable fashion. I think that there are um, enormous expectations, big hopes. Um, I think uh, they might be also important and interesting. What I would like uh, is uh, uh, to, um, to think that metaverse is the panacea of all evils in, uh, in this field. And so I am a little bit more skeptical and I'm very uh, much looking forward that uh, some uh, uh, scientific research, interdisciplinary research develops on uh, that. And I will then uh, try to, 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 to look at various scenarios and then uh, draw some conclusions. So, let me begin with uh, a, a short introduction. So uh, the aim, if you look to literature in this field, the aim of uh, digitalizing the fashion industry was at the very beginning uh, to streamline the design, production, and business of physical products for the real world, and on the other side, to achieve sustainability with the help of digital tools. However, uh, with the recent emergence of the metaverse, the parallel world in virtual reality and a new horizon of digital fashion has uh, opened. Let me give you some data because there are some uh, issues that, uh, uh, being old, <laughs> I, I was not aware of. So I'm not somebody who is uh, playing in the metaverse, is not, I'm not somebody who is very digitalized, so uh, some data were a little bit uh, surprising me. So um, let me give you this, uh, 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 this data. So uh, first of all, ever since the pandemic started, the fashion field has arisen as one of the most inclined to adopt digitalization and virtual reality to transform its business model, even completely, in the sense that during the pandemic, many different, uh, or just after the pandemic, many brands, many important brands has discovered the potential of uh, metaverse and, uh, uh, and uh, fashion. And so, although, at, at least for me, uh, the idea underlying digital fashion can be difficult to grasp since buying and trying out clothes that only exist in a virtual world can seem quite strange at first, at least uh, my generation would think like that. Many experts are beginning to view the idea of the metaverse reshaping the future of fashion more seriously. So, for example, uh, two years ago, the first fashion runway on the metaverse has taken place. Louis Vuitton launched in 2021 Louis the Game. Uh, in always in 2021, Nike launched Nikeland, its own digital space on Roblox. And and Gucci uh, stimulated uh, skateboard parks in a Gucci, no, uh, so, sorry, Gucci uh, introduced the Gucci Garden to mark the company's uh, um, uh, anniversary in order to uh, enhance relationships with their the customers in a very different way. So, um, uh, this way of reshaping uh, uh, the uh, uh, relations with customers seems very encouraging. Well, I don't have to buy real clothes, then I will ha don't have to deal with them, I don't have to, I, I want, I want, uh, I want to throw them away, so less waste, less uh, cost of production, and so on. But uh, uh, this has to be seen in a specific context, that is uh, uh, emerging, especially in the last 20 years, the fashion industry currently accounts for 5% of CO2 emissions globally, but I have found statistics that say it is 10%. So, uh, 
Uh, textile and clothing is an, in, industry is generally considered a high impact sector. First of all, because it has a very long and complicated supply chain that is very difficult to control. Then, generally speaking, fashion industries can be considered major polluters. They are major users of water. And from the sustainable point of view, sustainability point of view, of course, there are also other variables that might take in, be taken into consideration, like labor abuses and unsafe work conditions. Um, this uh, trend uh, is uh, uh, to put uh, in a context where, at the same time, fast fashion is growing and growing. So uh, the increasing consumption due to fast fashion is crystal clear. And also the uh, uh, prices uh, reduction is also to, put, to be put in this context. In the first 10 years of the, uh, this century, prices of clothes fell by 26.2 in Europe and by 17.1 in the US. In the same period, only in the UK, the purchase of garments increased by one third. The fast fashion like H&M, Zara, OBS and so on, with its low price products has changed the fashion consumption patterns up to 12 annual collections. And the continuous changes in fashion often make that a piece of clothing, when used in one season, is simply thrown away. And I must confess, I also have a closet with a lot of inactive <laughs> clothes. But, uh, you know, uh, this is something that we have to be aware of, at least. So, uh, uh, of course, this has brought to an increased attention, an increased uh, awareness about uh, what can be the results of this fast fashion uh, production. And uh, uh, sustainability issues uh, have been taken into consideration the more and more by uh, different stakeholders. Well, first of all, the same um, uh, brands have uh, committed to reduce their uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, Am I already over? No, I don't hope so. <laughs> okay, I was a little bit aiuto. Um, and so, uh, but also NGOs are very, very prompt in uh, um, pushing uh, um, uh, brands uh, toward a, a, a better awareness in this field. I simply remember Green, uh, um, Greenpeace campaign called the Tox uh, that practically obliged Valentino to reduce the chemicals used in the process of dyeing uh, uh, material. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a. It's, it's, a, it's a context where many stakeholders are very, very active, NGOs, uh, civil society, but also the brands themselves. Uh, so we have on the one side voluntary commitments uh, from the side of the fashion industry, but uh, it would be interesting to have maybe also more binding rules. That will come, will come, they will come, because uh, uh, last year the EU Commission launched uh, a strategy for sustainable and circular textiles. I cannot go into the details into details because otherwise I would spend all my presentation on that. But uh, one of the main um, key action will be stopping the destruction of unsold or returned textiles while having some specific policies in order to avoid greenwashing. Because on my opinion, the um, one thing that we always have to bear in mind is how consumers are aware or not aware of what they are doing, how much they are polluting, buying uh, some uh, clothes and uh, uh, them, uh, uh, throwing, them, uh, throwing them away. So, let me come to metaverse and sustainable uh, fashion. So metaverse seems to meet the demands for sustainability that increasingly characterize the fashion world for a number of reasons. Uh, according to recent studies, clothing existing solely in the digital world was found to be way more environmental friendly than its physical counterpart. So this is a very good, very good, uh, uh, this is a very good thing. 
uh, with the former emitting 97% less CO2 and consuming approximately 3,300 liters of water less per item. And furthermore, by replacing physical samples with digital ones during a company's design and development phases, it is possible to reduce a brand's carbon footprint by a whopping of 13%. So it seems uh, fantastic. It seems fantastic. Um, uh, uh, further, the use of digital clothing can be highly useful during the various steps preceding the actual physical production of a garment. In particular, these virtual items can be used for modeling, sampling, and marketing before their physical iterations are sent into production, thus greatly minimizing the overall environmental impact of the entire life, for life cycle of a fashion item. And third, when it comes to the sales side of things, digital models of clothes can help alleviate problems associated with overproduction and textile waste. So, in a way, already realizing one of the key action of the strategy that the European Commission has launched last year. But there is a but. There is a but because uh, uh, digital fashion itself, especially non-fungible tokens, carries its own carbon footprint via excessive technology use. So NFT and blockchain can be highly energy intensive and can have an enormous impact on climate change. To understand whether the metaverse is sustainable or not, we have to inquire a little bit better. So I, I, I was a little bit uh, uh, worried while um, looking to this study, uh, a study uh, published by Boston Consulting Group and Vogue, uh, where, uh, um, it's, uh, uh, where uh, the, the study uh, says that until recently the Ethereum blockchain consumed around 84 terabat hours of electricity each year, comparable to the consumption of a medium-sized country such as Finland. So uh, it's not that going to metaverse is uh, simply um, uh, solving all, uh, all problems. So the questions that uh, uh, maybe we should inquire on are the following. First of all, what is the technology used to create and trade fashion in the metaverse and what is its carbon footprint? Second, can digital fashion replace any physical production or is it simply complementary? And third, can digital technologies help in concrete terms fashion companies to reduce their CO2 emissions? So uh, there are various scenarios that are also envisaged by this uh, study. Uh, I think uh, uh, the study was uh, published uh, this year, but it refers to the data of last year, so it, it uh, I, 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 I found it very interesting to see also because it was uh, um, making a lot of examples that are very, very, very recent examples of, of the last two years. So uh, the uh, various scenarios that can be sketched out right now are different. <laughs> uh, a first scenario uh, is uh, uh, the one with a high carbon metaverse, the second one is the one with light carbon metaverse, and the third one, uh, it's a, a, a scenario that is uh, a very promising and then we will, we will call the metaverse as a force for good. Uh, so first scenario, a high carbon metaverse, that is to say the worst case uh, scenario. Uh, if fashion in the metaverse is fully incremental to physical fashion and the current blockchain NFT mix applies with 80% of N NFTs minted on a blockchain using proof of work consensus mechanism, estimates say that by 2030 the metaverse could increase fashion industry emissions between 0 0.6 and 1.2. That is to say, we will go exactly in the contrary direction. So, um, uh, luckily enough, uh, uh, Ethereum has uh, recently also given a very interesting uh, example. Uh, last year, uh, there was a, 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 an important change uh, um, to a proof of stake consensus mechanism. I must confess that uh, in order to understand 
proof of stake consensus and proof of work consensus, it took me a while. So this is a terminology that comes from uh, uh, the technical world that also for lawyers is not immediately uh, understandable, but uh, I, I would not be able to apply it. I would not be able to, exp to explain it very carefully, but I have understood that passing from uh, one technology to the other, we have been able to save a lot of energy. So it depends very much on which kind of uh, uh, choice we are going to do in order to, uh, um, to, to consider uh, NFT and uh, digital fashion uh, sustainable or not. Second scenario is the one exactly when we have chosen uh, this kind of uh, 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 new uh, um, possibility of realizing uh, uh, M NFTs and, uh, uh, meta and, and, and realize this meta uh, metaverse world of fashion. And this, uh, uh, if, uh, if, we, if we do, if we do, if we do this kind of choice, so if we assume that blockchain sustainability is addressed and going forward, the, the metaverse is built using sustainable and energy efficient technologies, then in such a scenario, fashion in the metaverse would generate only up to 0.1% uh, of additional CO2 emissions by 2030. But we also have a third scenario, but this is not, I mean, it's not said that we are going to choose this scenario, and consumers do not know which is the difference among these scenarios. So it's really a question of being aware of the different possibilities of the different scenarios and choose the right one in order to enhance the possibility of rendering metaverse fashion, uh, digitalized fashion, uh, uh, sustainable. So um, I think that uh, when I hear I, 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 I live in a district where many people speak about metaverse uh, thinking that metaverse will solve everything. I don't think it's that easy. I don't think that it is so uh, uh, simple. I think that we have to be aware, uh, much more aware of what are the different techniques and I, I, I'm, I don't think that all small businesses in a, in a region like Lombardy are aware of all these possible uh, choices. So, uh, third scenario, the good scenario, the metaverse as a force for good. So, in this uh, particular scenario, it is true, metaverse could bring forth additional sustainability opportunities. Let us imagine that, for example, metaverse uh, could partially, so that uh, uh, digital fashion can partially uh, reduce physical clothing purchases. But is it, is it really so? So are we, are we going to be able to substitute uh, uh, digital purchases, uh, or better, physical purchases with digital purchases, so saving a lot of money Another, uh, uh, and a lot of uh, emissions? Well, uh, a date, uh, uh, some data that uh, struck me are the following, but they struck me because, again, I'm old and I'm not able to understand very much the, the, uh, the, the needs of a younger generation, although I have a daughter of 22 years, but she's very green, so it's not really a problem in this sense. So, uh, data of 2021, 20% of digitally aware people aged 18 to 25 purchased physical clothing for the sole purpose of taking a picture or video and posting it on their social media. However, oftentimes these physical clothes are bought for the one-time use and later returned or discarded, thus generating further pollution and waste. So if there is really this amount of people that buy a, a single piece of clothes just to have a picture and then throw it away, I can hardly imagine that it is like that. But if statistics say that it is like that, maybe we can really substitute uh, uh, real clothes with virtual clothes if this is really what uh, the generation between 18 and 25 is doing. It's a little bit incredible for me, but it appears that it is like that. So uh, this is the first thing that I would like to say. Second thing, so digital innovation also presents excellent opportunities for fashion players 
to reduce overproduction and subsequently carbon footprint. Overproduction in the world of fast fashion is uh, really a, vari a constant variable, so it's always there. And the overproduction means wastes. And if we are able to cope with that, for sure, this will be a big, 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 big advantage. I, I go, yes, 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 I go to my conclusion. So, uh, um, now, if it is true that we uh, can uh, um, realize uh, with metaverse uh, a more sustainable fashion, I think uh, uh, we should be anyway aware of uh, different variables, and this has to do with the fact that uh, uh, lawyers, first of all, should uh, uh, be uh, much more confident, which should be much more, um, uh, how can I explain, familiar with uh, uh, technologies that we do not uh, generally uh, are taught at uh, law schools. Okay, thank you so much. So, so um, one thing that I would like to focus here is the idea that we should go for a more interdisciplinary approach to these, uh, uh, to these uh, uh, problems. What we, at least in Italy, are not doing yet. So I don't know in France, I was very, I was very, uh, how do you say, happily surprised that you have this center on uh, humanities and uh, sciences, but this is not, I mean, uh, the rule, generally speaking, in, uh, uh, in law schools. So first thing, this is something that we should become uh, more aware. And uh, uh, the other thing is that, of course, uh, uh, um, fashion companies themselves should not only make uh, conscious technology choices for their own metaverse endeavors, but also help set sustainable standards for the metaverse. And uh, this also needs an education and uh, new skills uh, in the business uh, that, uh, as, at least in Italy, is uh, made by small businesses. So I don't know where they will find the uh, forces, the, the, the funds in order to create these new skills in order to make the right choice when they will have to, uh, to decide. And, uh, the, and finally, consumers also often do not realize the environmental impact of digital uh, purchases. At the same time, the metaverse opens a window of opportunity, a chance to disrupt the industry and use of digital technology to benefit the environment. And here, I think there is a great, a big role that, that, that can be uh, played by important brands uh, to really, um, um, in a way, give the good example. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pozzo. It had the uh, advantage of making us look at the systemic risk of the metaverse itself. This morning we saw uh, the question of, of uh, data collection and, and now the question of sustain sustainability sorry, of the metaverse itself. Um, so we now turn uh, to you, uh, Pinier, and I will give you the microphone, or maybe you're gonna raise, you're gonna stand up? And you're gonna, Tell us about legal services in the metaverse. Working. But the Sorry, Emily. I really did my best. Emily's working her magic. Obviously, it's really magical. 
Okay, um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I, I'm really happy to be here despite being luggageless still for the last 24 hours. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you very much, Larry, for letting me a part of this wonderful group. Um, I'm not a business lawyer, but today I'll talk about metaverse and legal services. So I invite you all to join me and shoot me some questions in the end so I can brainstorm together with you. So, um, as I told you, my subject is metaverse and legal services, and when I got this question like six months ago, I immediately started research researching about what metaverse and legal services are, and obviously there is not a single article um, just concentrated on metaverse and legal services, but obviously Larry told me that I could do it, so I said, why not, I'll just try my best. So um, the thing that I tried to concentrate on before preparing this chapter and preparing this presentation was I just wanted to first define what legal services really are because that's a term that we use in our everyday lives like legal practice, legal services. But I looked up and there is a Legal Services Act in the UK but it doesn't really define what legal services are. So I wasn't really quite sure what to focus on and I decided to go on with the following. So it includes, it starts with the consultation for legal information and advice when you meet your lawyer first. And then you can ask them to consult uh, with regard to review of your documents such as your will, your contracts, your M&A deals, your forms, etc. This is a part of a legal service. Then you can ask them not to review but to prepare your documents, some important um, formal documents. Um, you can ask them to represent you in negotiations and if the negotiations do not go as planned, then um, you can ask your lawyer to aid you through the process of mediation, arbitration, or through other dispute resolution processes. And in the end, your lawyer can be representing you in a court trial or in an arbitral proceeding as a legal service. So these are the legal services that I have found and I am now going to talk about how they will transform in the metaverse. Thank you so much, Barbara. <laughs> okay, so um, again, now bearing in mind the fact that these are the legal services that we're going to deal with through the course of metaverse, I want to talk about three main things, how actually affected the provision of legal services before we heard about metaverse at the end of 2021. So there is the rise of social media, which was kind of a challenge or maybe uh, an, an advantageous point for lawyering in the digital age. So we had some nice social media tools that could aid the lawyers uh, during the provision of legal services. I'm not gonna go very deep in that. Um, but COVID-19 was really important uh, in the terms of provision of legal services because our world just stopped as lawyers and you know the, there were still disputes arising and there were million dollar cases that the judges had to deal with and some of the countries in the world had to change to remote trials. So COVID-19 is really important in terms of the changing, starting the transformation of legal uh, proceedings. And then we have legal tech, obviously, in the past 10 years especially, who ha that has changed the provision of legal services. Thank you. Um, so let me go first with the COVID example. And after COVID, remote trials and online trials have become a very important thing. Um, but it was not really seamless, you know? There were some problems. Although it was the only thing that we could come up with during the pandemic, it still had some issues. For example, many people suffered from connectivity issues and they did not have enough access to technology as tech-savvy people did. Or some of them had the technological resources, but they did not have the necessary, um, they didn't feel secure enough doing it, or they did not have the confidence uh, to participate in an online trial. So they didn't really understand what was going on. You know, there was a remote judge, but they did not understand the whole process. Uh, when we go to, when we look at it from the courts and the judges' perspective, we can see that they could not really um, easily identify the identities of the court participants, you know, if that person was really the person who was the claimant, who was the respondent. So we had a problem with digital identity again. Um, then for witnesses, um, you know, in courthouses, uh, many people say that 
when they see a judge in front of them, they are really intimidate, intimidated. And when they're under oath, they really feel that they, they're pressured to tell the truth. But it's, it wasn't really the case with remote trials and witnesses could lie more easily uh, in front of a remote judge. Then um, on the same agenda, we see that there was a difficulty of replicating an, an ideal courtroom. It was not like uh, a, a, a usual hearing, so the courtroom did not feel like a courtroom when it was done in an online setting. And obviously, uh, we have talked about this in the morning too, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the, the data protection issues. There, there was the risk of data breaches and um, the concept of public hearing was kind of lost because when we talk about public hearings, we need to have many people you know, able to participate if they want to. But this was lost in, the, in terms of online trials during the pandemic, but this is before Metaverse. Um, so now, legal tech. As I told you, legal tech has also transformed the provision of legal services. Um, this has happened mostly because we now use AI tools a lot. And ChatGPT is now our favorite tool. And uh, it's now giving out really good legal advice, but just you should not rely on it completely. And um, it's not going to take away the, the role of the judges, uh, judges as a whole. But then again, it's made our jobs as lawyers much easier. Not only ChatGPT, but all the legal tools that we have been acquainted with during the past years such as um, legal tech applications have helped us uh, to overcome the process for project management. They helped us conduct the very unlikely process of due diligence. Um, they have been helping us review documents, conduct legal research, draft a contract, manage the contract, finding case law, and uh, after the blockchain and the uh, launch of Ethereum platform and smart contracts, we have been acquainted with some online dispute resolution mechanisms. These are all the legal text tools that helped us uh, provide legal services in a much more effective way. But the question is, was actually, just before Metaverse emerged, can legal tech products substitute traditional legal services? And you know, the talk was much about, are the legal tech services going to take away lawyers' job, and then so on and so forth, and then uh, came Metaverse, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us. So the question is, uh, the, the link with legal tech is that, will legal tech be able to support metaverse working, the tools that we had before metaverse? So legal tech trends and technologies arise to keep up with the difficulties lawyers face, true. However, the very concept of the metaverse challenges the typical working style of a lawyer. So this is a thing that we should keep in mind. How is it going to change a lawyer's life and the provision of legal services? So, um, so the legal services that we had in Web 2.0 with the social media and e-commerce websites, they're all going to be replaced in Web 3.0. When you make a real quick search in Google, you're going to see that all the apps we have today are going to be decentralized apps. So it's all going to change. So what happened when the metaverse term emerged and when, you know, companies started to invest in metaverse, like Barbara has also mentioned, like Gucci, Nike, and uh, Walt Disney, they all started taking their place in the metaverse. And what happened was, as uh, lawyers, as we all know, where clients go, law firms also followed. And after these big firms like uh, fashion brands and other big companies started the, to take their place in metaverse, obviously law firms followed them to take advantage of this. Um, so uh, some legal firms, legal professionals started to explore the possibilities in Metaverse, what could happen to their legal practice. Um, I, I have to first mention that Metaverse is not the first time that lawyers had their presence in the virtual universe. In 2003, when um, the uh, Second Life, the virtual world emerged, Field Fisher, a law firm in the UK, which was called, uh, given a different name then, uh, they opened up a virtual office on Second Life in 2007, but it didn't, you know, really happen as we thought it would be. But then, uh, after Metaverse emerged, some U U.S. law firms, by the way, they are all conf all claiming that they were the first. I visited their websites, and each law firm in the U.S. says, you know, we're the first to do it. 
Um, so I, I will give some names, but I will talk about it later. In Canada, Greenhouse, one law firm, also focuses on Metaverse. They opened up a law firm in Metaverse. We have uh, an example from Germany, and we even have a legal marketing company who set up in Metaverse. So um, after this point in my presentation, I would like to focus on how they're going to render services after they have opened up their law firms in Metaverse. So obviously, there were some shortcomings of the Zoom meetings, right? Because in a Zoom meeting, yes, it's really good, really, you know, decreases the time that you commute to, you know, visit the courtrooms and visit the uh, law firms, etc. But you cannot sometimes see everybody in, this, in the same frame uh, in your computer. It's especially if it's a crowded Zoom, then you cannot really see everyone. So it didn't feel really real. So when, uh, pe when law firms started to open up in the metaverse, people were like, can we have a more real experience with our lawyers in that sense? And can law firms interact with each other in a more real way? I would like to highlight one thing. When law firms open up in Metaverse, it doesn't mean that they will only deal with disputes that arise in Metaverse. Surely they will, there will be some um, disputes only occurring in Metaverse. We have talked about them like IP infringements or, you know, um, just like in the last session we talked about what if an avatar creates a, a new invention and it needs to be patented. There are going to be metaverse specific issues too, but the law firms that set up in metaverse are also going to be dealing with real world disputes too. So we should keep that in mind while we're thinking about the change of legal services in the time of metaverse. So, um, Can we? Yes. so I will focus on some aspects of lawyering and metaverse from this point on. So the first opportunity for the provision of legal services is remote lawyering for uh, remote working opportunities for lawyers. So lawyers can now, without going to office, uh, just make their presence in metaverse. I think this is going to be appealing for the younger generation because as far as I know, many companies now invite their um, lawyers to the offices only for one or two days and they can be, make their presence uh, for the rest of the day through their, you know, online remote working styles. So this can be applied um, to metaverse. But there are going to be um, some pros. For example, dis disabled uh, employees can be much more active and actively participating in metaverse. But there are also going to be some problems with regard to lawyering in metaverse because for instance, health and safety requirements. If you spend so much time in metaverse, you're gonna be dizzy. You're gonna be losing the sense of real life versus virtual life. So there needs to be something done with regard to restricting maybe the time spent in metaverse. So the second thing that we need to talk about in the morning session again, it relies on data. So it collects a wide range of data, like it was mentioned, like facial expressions, gestures, re um, real reactions. So what about lawyers' data protection? How are you going to protect the data of lawyers that are making their presence in metaverse and their right to privacy, obviously? And as an employer, if you have a big law firm, you have an obligation to promote good working practices. And how are you going to draw the line between the time spent in metaverse and the time spent in uh, real life? There is no uh, case or no guideline we have so far. So uh, we have a session on alternative dispute resolution later, so I will not be focusing on this too much, but obviously dispute resolution is again another legal service that, are grant, that is granted by lawyers. I have two examples uh, from Dubai International Arbitration Center. They announced the launch of their metaverse for dispute resolution, providing a virtual reality space uh, where parties can participate in dispute resolution proceedings from anywhere in the world, which eliminates the need for physical transportation, sustainability, and eco-friendliness principles of metaverse are fulfilled, if, if that can be realized. 
And now uh, another important thing that I could find was the Paris Arbitration Week in 2002. It was the first ever arbitration conference in the metaverse. They tried to understand the issues uh, that could arise from the activities in metaverse. And you know, they, they tried to do it on metaverse to identify what the real problems could be. Um, and now we have an example from Brazil. Uh, the federal court in Paraiba recently held a first conciliatory hearing session in the metaverse. The dispute was going on since 2018 and the dispute was resolved in just 10 minutes in the metaverse and they're really happy about it. They're telling that, you know, this can, in the coming months, people can be able to do uh, a fully digital session in the metaverse. So Brazil is going really, really, uh, it seems to be eager on entering the metaverse. And we have an example from uh, Singapore. Singapore is, again, a very important place for dispute resolution too, as you might know. And they are really eager to find out the opportunities in metaverse. And um, their uh, second minister for justice, they stated, he stated that legal services such as marriage proceedings, court case disputes, and government services may one day be uh, given in the metaverse. And they really believe that an integrated platform can make the whole dispute resolution process really much more faster and efficient. We'll see. And uh, I think you probably heard it because this happened two months ago and I was really happy that this happened because I had something to talk about <laughs> during my presentation, okay? So uh, in February 15, 2023, there was a court in Colombia. This was not a very important case, a trivial one, but still it happened in Metaverse. So you can see the judge on the left-hand side and the participants, the claimants, the defendants, they were all present in a physical space, but, uh, sorry, they are together in the virtual space, but physically they were just in very different places. Oh my God, it's gone, oh, it's come back. So um, the judge who conducted the trial was really happy with the outcome. Um, she said that, you know, um, it constitutes a technological tool that can facilitate access to the administration of justice and uh, the development of ju judicial proceedings has the essential purpose of facilitating and expediting these processes. And she said that uh, in online trials or in Zoom, you cannot have the sense of being together in the same room, but Metaverse gives you the idea that you are all together with the claimants, the respondents, and everybody who can participate in the trial. Yeah, and get, you get the feeling of being together. And uh, when we're talking about Metaverse and the judicial process, we should not think of it only as like the trials or the alternative dispute resolutions happening in the Metaverse. But Metaverse can also be a tool to, um, to aid the judicial process, okay? It doesn't have to happen fully in Metaverse, but for instance, during some time in the proceeding, uh, metaverse technologies can help us better understand the case, better understand the evidence. For instance, um, you can listen to virtual reality evidence, you can visit a virtual accident scene, you can watch it via, like if for example there's a malpractice case, you can just watch it via a virtual surgical process through the VR headsets and understand what really went wrong. And sometimes it can be really immersive, um, so it might be very overwhelming for the jurors to decide. But we're going to see how the technology evolves on that point. Um, now back to the offices opening up in Metaverse. As you can see, this is Grango Colarulo in, in the USA. They claim that they were the first ones to open up shop in Metaverse. And they were really happy with the client interactions and how it was proceeding. Now So um, the reason why they wanted to uh, they wanted to uh, set up in the metaverse was that they wanted to remain accessible to their clients. They just didn't want to miss the bus, um, and they wanted to demonstrate that they were committed to these developing technologies. So that's why they said they wanted to open up in metaverse. And uh, the leader, the founding partner of this law firm, uh, when he was asked why did he go up and opened up a law firm in Metaverse, he stated that there's going to be an opportunity to connect, collaborate, transact, 
perform, argue, advertise, and create like never before in history. There are lots of opportunities within this office and within the metaverse to refine how we practice law, how we communicate with our clients, how we provide information to non-clients. There is a lot of difficult conversations I have with victims where I think they might, may want to be behind an avatar to have that conversation. So that's why they, they thought that for client interaction, Metaverse could be a good opportunity. When we look at Canada, a law firm who set up, uh, the founding partner stated that our law firm is capable of hosting private meetings using a secret link. Um, you can use it as a public space for friends and colleagues to hang out, an NFT art gallery, etc. So again, to attract more clients, to be more marketable, the Metaverse opportunities were used. Now, um, to go to uh, Germany, um, the founding partners of Glasslutz thought that the metaverse fits seamlessly into their site strategy. Two minutes, okay, I will wrap up. Uh, they believe that metaverse has a big f future and they want, to be, they want to show the world that they are committed to this new technology. So apparently it was again a marketing te uh, technology. So I think another interaction with Metaverse and legal services is the, obviously the bar associations. But from uh, what I could find up until now, uh, bar associations have not done much work with regard to lawyering in the Metaverse. They're probably researching and trying to find out what's going on. But we have an opinion from New York Bar, and they stated that an attorney may operate via a purely virtual office, provided the attorney complies with all applicable laws and rules. For example, this rule does not exist in my country. So in my country, in Turkey, you cannot open up a law firm in Metaverse. So I think law firms, uh, sorry, bar associations need to come up with some guidelines with regard to how legal services will be provided in Metaverse. So what else can Metaverse offer for legal services? In the last two minutes, I'll talk about this. They can use it for legal marketing. As you can see, m many of the law firms have been using Metaverse for legal marketing. And especially some, some people who have conducted research are stating that before Metaverse gives us some guidelines about data protection, about security breaches, about what's going on in the legal services area, it's best to keep Metaverse just an opportunity for legal marketing and just to leverage their uh, visibility and provide some maybe quick advice to their younger clients. It might be a good tool, but it should stand with that they are claiming. And um, they, it can be used as a legal networking tool to, uh, to allow for, for example, hosting webinars or other virtual educational opportunities, charity events, etc. So you can um, attend conferences or seminars like this one, but I assure you it will not give the same idea, you know, I will go from Larry again. You, you have to meet Larry, you know, to have attend a conference. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> and um, legal uh, education is another area, I think, that concerns legal services. And as you can see, there's the Brooklyn Law School in Metaverse. And it can offer really many opportunities because law education is really expensive. You know, you need to, uh, for example, for some um, legal clinics or for training of the attorneys, legal education can be a really good ground for metaverse. And according to many research carried out around the world, education is one of the primary areas that metaverse can serve, you know, for the betterment of the field. And uh, I have an example here. The European University Institute Department of Law, they held the first... Uh, class of the Metaverse Reg Lab, uh, they, just, they just thought that the best way to do a course about technology law would be in it itself. So they heard the most, most uh, first uh, Metaverse class here. And I have another example with regard to internship. A, a firm in uh, Helsinki got a lot of uh, requests, but they have a really tiny office and they cannot really accept many interns. And they stated that we have a lot of requests from organizers that they would like to visit our offices, but it's really tiny. Inviting students to the Metaverse office is a fun way to present our way of working and our cases to students. So this can be an enhancing experience. I can skip the slides. And 
And finally, uh, the risks uh, of metaverse, what can it be? Yeah, I think we should focus on the cybersecurity risks and the data breach risks. Unless they are uh, totally overcome, then we will not really have uh, the immersive or the best experience of metaverse. So bar associations should be working, regulators should be working on the field in order to uh, make the the process better. So thank you. Uh, if you're interested, you can read the final version of the paper. Thank you for bearing with me. And now the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been told to be rough with the time. I know, I know. So I, yeah. <laughs> I just had so much to say. It was enlightening, thank you very much. Uh, I will immediately give the floor to uh, Mr. Kanzani, but maybe we have Christina Pontibo online. I have no idea if she could connect. Oh, no, no, she could not make it. Apparently not. Apparently not. So if she couldn't, I suggest we give you, uh, Mr. Kanzani, immediately the floor. Okay, thank you very to much. Uh, maybe we need Emily. Okay, Babana. Okay, let's see if I can access the slides. Maybe, yeah, Emily's gonna help us. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, Michelle and Larry, for your kind invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to present this chapter, which is about regulating metaverse platforms uh, according to EAU legislation. Um, this chapter is co-written by Christina Ponchibo, who unfortunately isn't here today, and by me. She is from the University of Turin, I'm from the University of Warwick, so consider this a joint half-fort. Um, uh, this is a first uh, preview to our chapter and the content that you will find inside. I want to immediately get to uh, the um, core of this analysis and anticipate that we, in a chapter, we will provide a quick recap about the evolution and the rise of the so-called metaverse platforms. Um, let me say something. Just a month ago, I met a guy who incidentally became our case study, and he said something really interesting to me. There's no such a thing as the metaverse, but there are many metaverse platforms. We will get to the point, I mean, we will reach to what Neil Stephenson like predicted in his famous novel, when these uh, platforms will be able to allow the key, what you already said today, the keyword is interoperability. So this seems to be one of the major friction to a proper development of the notion of metaverse. But nonetheless, we have had many examples uh, uh, until today. Uh, the first famous one, maybe it's not totally a metaverse platform, but we consider it a sort of proto-metaverse platform, Second Life, which firstly introduced the idea of 3D environment rendered in real time. You know, there is a difference between pre-rendered and real-time rendered graphics. Pre-rendered is what you see in movies, in CGI movies. Graphics rendered in real time mean that mm, provide for the creation of space where users can interact with 
um, through avatars. And this, and this was, uh, let's say, the milestone uh, that we uh, acknowledge. Um, these platforms have evolved, new technologies have come to light. Many of you have already introduced these technologies, but I just want to quickly recap the name. So, extended reality in all of its forms, blockchain technology with smart contracts and crypto assets, and also the possibility, thanks to the way the platform is designed, to allow for opportunity for business users to promote goods and services to consumer users. Uh, so why mm, did I recap this? Well, because the case study we are focusing on seems to be a sort of point of convergence between all these features. I would not say that this project is very innovative, but it's like they're trying to, you know, tick all uh, the check boxes that we have examined today, and the more features you include in a platform, the more uh, legal challenges you have to overcome. So what we are focusing on today is Vault Hill, this metaverse platform created by Vault Hill Limited, which is a company incorporated in England and Wales, which is important because will give us the opportunity to stress the provisions contained in the European Union regulation concerning the scope of application. So, but we will get this uh, to this in a, in a short while. So, what is, vo um, uh, yeah, and the perspective, okay, our analysis uh, will adopt a perspective basically of platform law, meaning regulation specifically meant for online platforms. And at this stage, we are focusing on um, the platform, uh, the, sorry, the platform to business regulation dated to, back to uh, 2019, which applies to the inter online intermediary server uh, services meant to enable business user to um, offer goods and services to consumer users and to the Digital Services Act. This is our, um, our second major point of analysis, which is still focused on uh, in online intermediary services, but I would say is more on high level okay, position. But we will get to the relationship between two, these two regulations in a short while. So I had the opportunity to use this platform and to meet one of uh, the key person working on this project. And this is me in Vault Hill. <laughs> so I created my account. I tried to interact with the platform and explore what the platform is capable of. He's really good looking. Isn't it? Even the same suit. Oh, nah, he's good looking. Oh, OK, not me. <laughs> I agree with you. It's actually better. Um, and maybe this, all, this will be interesting for uh, people engaging with data protection. This avatar was created through the submission of my own picture. So I provided the picture, and this tool automatically generated an avatar of me. So maybe this company now has my biometric data, but you know, for the good of research, it's something I can come to terms with. Um, that being said, at the moment the platform is still under development, is split into several district themed areas, and each area seems to have, let's say, a label, okay, like this is meant for these services, this is meant for this, this is meant for that, so we can see that the platform is meant to be a sort of place where companies, organizations, even influencers, YouTubers, can showcase their activities or their goods and their services. And I haven't bought any land here, by the way, but who knows, maybe in the future. So within this virtual space named Vault Hill City, this is the name of the fictional world, users can purchase the land. So basically virtual lands attached to NFT. And here you can see the similarities with other platforms that have been mentioned today, such as the Central Land, the Sandbox. Users can host events, exhibitions, 
And this is pretty similar to what has already been done through um, Fortnite and other uh, platforms as well, such as Roblox and so on. And they can also offer different types of NFTs, meaning that, meaning that um, this platform is not conceived only for exchanging NFTs representing virtual lands. Mm, no. Users have the opportunity of minting, this is the term used in the jargon, different type of NFTs representing other type of assets, which could either be buildings, digital hearts, physical hearts, um, wearables, and other kind of stuff. Mm, and the official website provides access to a marketplace for crypto assets and transaction can be also made through a native token of this platform, okay? So the core of the analysis is what are the obligations posed to the platform operators that qualify as intermediary service providers within the meaning of the P2B regulation and the Digital Services Act. In this case, we can easily identify an intermediary service provider, which is the company Vault Hill Limited itself. They are not promoting the, themselves as a decentralized organization, that kind of stuff. So it's easier to identify uh, the proper intermediary. And um, yes, this will be the two main angles, focusing on the P2B regulation. The first thing that we uh, want to explore is, of course, the, the scope of application. Um, well, now, first of all, let me clarify that even if the Digital Service Act is jumping into the place, the P2B regulation will still apply. And this is expressly said in some provisions. But also, in order to understand the relationship between these two regulations, I want to point out that in um, the original draft, the proposal for the Digital Services Act, so not the text currently approved, the proposal, in the uh, introductory memorandum, the legislator stated that the Digital Service Act will apply, but the P2B regulation will serve as lex specialis in relation to the Digital Service Act. Now, this statement is not contained anymore in any of the recitals of the final draft. It's not even included in the provision. But I think that the spirit is of that sentence is still there. Because if you think of it, if you look at the services regulated by um, the um, Digital Services Act, it's like um, hosting services, caching services, uh, are kind of implied if you are a marketplace subject to the P2B regulation. What I'm trying to say is that if you are a marketplace, so the type of platform meant to be regulated by the, by the P2B regulation, for sure you are doing, you're providing hosting services. So both regulation will apply. Maybe if you are providing just hosting services, it's not um, guaranteed that the P2B regulation will apply. It depends if your business model goes farther than that and actually provides for what the P2B regulation is meant to regulate. So the P2B regulation, as I said, is about enabling opportunity for business user to um, offer goods and services to consumer, mm, regardless, irrespective of where those transactions are ultimately concluded, which means that having um, business users and consumers entering into the contract for contract law uh, people, you know, uh, is not a mandatory requirement. And even the payment doesn't have to necessarily happen via platform. That's a key point. It means that the P2B regulation can still apply. Um, now, looking at Volt Hill, as you can see, a marketplace, at least for the sale of crypto assets, is already in place. If you look carefully, you will see that users are basically pseudonymized. They are identified by means of their electronic wallets. Okay, so this raises a question to me. Can we really distinguish business users from consumers if 
everything is pseudonymized. First tricky point for the purpose of applying the regulation. Moving further, as I said, companies will have the opportunity to proper get in touch with consumers through uh, the actual world. So first, in the previous screenshot, we have seen the marketplace for crypto assets, and that's one thing. This other screenshot is this showing you something different. It's actually the map where you can see the companies having a presence in the fictional uh, word, also description of the company, and maybe reach out to this user. So it's like the word itself, it could be a marketplace in a way. And this kind of connects to what we were discussing just before about offering legal services. And in fact, there is a law firm within this marketplace, by the way, within this world, in, within this world by the way. So. Um, now, this is the tricky point. The P2B regulation says that um, uh, the, uh, the regulation should not apply where the services would end up consisting of online advertising tool, advertising blockchain software, online payment services. This is contained in Resital 11. Okay, so my question is, given that metaverse platforms are different beasts, this kind of words are different from, you know, just a mere presence on a website for marketing purposes. What is the, the thin line between just promoting and doing something that goes farther, something that falls within the scope of application of the regulation? This is another tricky point to me. And Mm, I mean, based on this, a lot of obligations come, based on the qualification of the platform, a lot of obligations are posed on the platform operator. I don't want to spend time listing all these obligations because you already know them, you can read it in the chapter. I just want to focus on the principle because that's the most exciting part to me. Um, here I see many obstacles, as I said. Um, first is, as I said, distinguishing the, tip, the type of users. The other point is mapping category of users because if we are all, if we all can potentially play different roles because with my avatar I can be a consumer, I can be someone who promotes, I could be someone who creates an NFT. You know, we all embody different characters depending on the daytime. Now I'm a lawyer, later I'm a guy, in the weekend I'm a singer. And so this applies to the fictional world itself. You know, you do different stuff. So categorizing, categorizing a type of user becomes problematic. But mapping users is important if you want to have proper terms and condition in place, able to govern these relationships. There are a lot of, there are other points here to be mentioned, and another one is ensuring transparency and equal access to opportunity of promoting marketing, uh, sorry, services and products on, within these fictional worlds. Uh, again, it's complicated restraining users. If what, with me, my avatar, I can do basically whatever uh, the software allows me to do, and these actions are not even recorded. Because remember what I said in the beginning: we are moving in our, we are basically moving in this fictional world with our own avatars. Actions take place in real time. It's not like writing something on Facebook, you know? It's not like creating advertisement on other social media platform. What I do in that very moment is happening. It's not even recorded, maybe. It's just happening. So being in control of what happens is really problematic, I think. Mm, moving to, sorry, I just messed up with uh, laptop. Moving to the Ser Digital Services Act, we can see, we can jump to similar conclusions. First of all, scope of application. But the regulation not only apply to companies uh, incorporated in the European Union. So the point about, oh no, I don't want to incorporate my corporation in the European Union because legislations are too restrictive, doesn't make any sense. Because at the end of the day, if you are providing your services to people located in the EU, 
you will be subject to the application of this regulation. You know, it's a principle that we also have in the GDPR. There is this common um, principle of, a, how can we call it, extraterritorial scope of application, in a way. Mm, so, if we consider Vault Illimited, it's irrelevant that they are based and they are incorporated in England when they offer their services to people to users located in the um, European Union in relation to that very offer and provision of services, these regulations will apply. Um, as I said, there are three types of services regulated by the Digital Services Act, which are mere conduct, caching, and hosted, and hosting. Mm, there is no doubt in my view that Vault L could fall within uh, the definition of hosting service and caching because these activities are basically necessary to enable the functioning of the fictional world and marketplaces. Again, I don't want to list all the obligations that the Digital Service Act poses on uh, the platform operator to which this regulation applies. You can read them in detail in the paper. Um, I want to just jump to possible obstacles to comply with this regulation. And one is, okay, companies are supposed to ensure the condition for a good online environment, an environment that is transparent, non-toxic for users, they have obligation about moderation, stuff like that, removing content. But the point is, how can they remove certain content if some actions, for a, it's just an assumption, okay, are registered in blockchain, okay? I know that we don't record anything to blockchain, we just record transaction, but imagine an illegal transaction recorded on blockchain. You can remove that. Maybe you can remove some of the side effects of this transaction, but what it's written remains. Imagine if users are given smart customizable smart contracts, which once deployed, you know, they cannot be changed. And so actions, maybe even unlawful actions take place and they cannot be reverted because once the smart contract is deployed, it's deployed. You cannot change the history of that smart contract. So, uh, once again, it's really tough ensuring moderation in a 3D environment that cannot be constantly monitored because let's assume that the avatar, and these stories are already happening, by the way, let's assume that the avatar of one guy um, as harsh behaviors toward uh, another guy, okay, like discrimination or hate speech, stuff like that. That action is taking place in real time by just talking maybe, okay? It's not even recorded in a text box. Can you really moderate? Can you be there to ensure this? So my conclusion is, one of our preliminary conclusions is that first, there, is, there should be no need to be so stressed about regulations that apply to metaverse, because if you look at the characteristics of these platforms, they share many similarities with other platforms that already exist. So, in other words, it's not about reinventing the wheel, it's about taking regulations that are already in place and apply them to the maximum possible extent. So, uh, nowadays, these meta platforms are basically evolving as social commerce. This is the term that we use. So maybe the P2B regulation applies when this platform actually serves as marketplace, and the DSA will apply uh, in any case those services listed uh, before are uh, present. So it's not about reinventing the wheel, but maybe guidelines or intervention by administrative bodies could be helpful. You know, um, regarding blockchain, we have had intervention by the European Union Observatory and Forum. It's an external body, but what they say is quite um, useful to uh, imagine how current regulation could face 
challenges arising from, from blockchain technology. When it comes to the GDPR, we have the European Data Protection Board, whose guidelines are really helpful for understanding the scope of application of certain provision. In, in other words, our conclusion is that ad hoc regulation for metaverses are not needed. It's more about providing clarity on how these existing, existing tools can be applied. At the end of the day, it's about resolving the legal uncertainties that we have discussed so far. Why? Because, as you know, most of the interesting experiments in the metaverse sector are coming up from startups, not from major companies. Look at the experiments made by Meta and look uh, uh, at the failures that they are doing. You know, lots of money lost, many people fired. Startups try to bring innovation. Um, so yeah, uh, in a sense, um, sorry, uh, okay, yeah, 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 so um, I lost the point, no, I was just trying to say that startups are in a position to promote innovation, but the more legal incertainties you create, the more cost for legal compliance there will be in order to understand and make the business model compliant, so this is our point, like legal certainties should be Resolve, but not uh, through over regulating. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, the conclusion being that the actual European regulation as all the tools will, I believe, bring discussion because it's now time for question and answers. So uh, is there already a question uh, in the audience regarding our three contribution now about fashion and law legal tired. service? Oh, yeah, I understand you're tired. Um, I'd start maybe with just a remark regarding the, the last intervention regarding platform, uh, European platform law. I'd say, uh, in my opinion, uh, our law, our regulations are not enough. Maybe they can address some of the problems. We could say metaverse is exactly the same as uh, um, internet and there is no new problem and there was already the second life and so what's new? really. But when you look at the granularity of the data that is collected first, to an extent that has never been reached before, so that's the first problem with GDPR. So, and, and as long as you, and, and regarding platform, there are two types of contracts. The contract that the user will, will take with the platform, and this is obviously when you're sharing your data, when you're giving your data in exchange, this is a, a B2C contract for sure. And then there is contracts that are taken, that are passed in within the platform between users. And here you write like the, the identification of a business or a consumer is, is hard to make. And we, give, we actually impose obligation on ident identification when you are within a, a, a website. Any uh, website operator mu must identify them themselves as a business or as a consumer. How will we uh, ensure that if we think of um, metaverses as platforms, then we must impose obligations on platforms as intermediaries, which doesn't exist yet. But well, that was just a thought on okay, platforms. thank you. Uh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Real quick. Hey, would you like this? Yeah, sure. If you take European law perspective, for sure. No, if it's a business, it's going to be part of the business. If it depends, obviously, the, the, the definition, the European definition of a consumer contract is depending on the, on the, the objective of the contract, depending on the, the professional trade. But I mean, most of the, the, the non-professional contract will obviously, sorry, sorry, you're very right. No, no, of course, of course. You're talking about the demand side of services, consumers accessing the platform. Yes. I it was interesting to make the difference between contract with the platform and then contract within the platform. We all love a good academic fight. 
<laughs> Not at all. Uh, so, so we uh, need to move on. I just wanted to say to the presenters that you all did an excellent job. That's Florida talk. You all did an excellent job. And the fact that you didn't get a question, let me, <laughs> let me just tell you, not, nothing to feel bad about. I've been do, doing conference talks for 30 years, and I think I've gotten two questions in my entire lifetime, <laughs> which is either because of the low quality of my presentation, or two, it was later in the day and everybody's tired. I so, that was, that was you do have a question? Yeah, yeah. So are we taking a break? No, we, no break. We just switch panels. We switch, just switch panels and get this Thank done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, can I ask you to take your seat, please? We'll start again. It's working. All right, if you can please take your seat now so that we can start with the last part of this afternoon, session four, also known as the graveyard shift. Uh,
good afternoon, and uh, I would like to thank Michelle and Larry for having me here, even though I'm not entirely sure why I'm here. I suppose the reason might be that, uh, you know, people are buying plots of land in the metaverse for sums which are all but derisory. The record last time I checked was 100 million dollars for a plot of land in a metaverse that hadn't even been launched at the time. Um, so, you know, I think it's a bad idea. As a property lawyer, I think it's a bad idea, but it's happening. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, the metaverse being a parallel universe, it can expand when we need it to. We, can, we could explore the galaxy, we could be space pirates, we could be wizards, and I think having ownership in the metaverse is just a total failure at imagining new things. It's, it's the most stupid thing we can do. Uh, we are given a chance to start afresh, build something entirely new, and we're just doing the same old world once again. We could create a world without poverty, without inequality, without scarcity, a world in which ownership does not belong, and a world in which I don't have to do that talk, basically. Um, and, and, you know, ownership should not be part of the equation if the metaverse is to be worth anything. But, you know, um, lawyers are here to make the impossible possible, even when it's unfortunate and unwise. So I'm going to try and give it a chance. I'm going to try and say, okay, how do we build property into the metaverse? A, a digital universe does not inherently have a notion of scarcity, it's, it's been said before. There's no inherent notion of scarcity. So we have to create scarcity in the metaverse for ownership to be able to potentially exist. And then we have to make sure that the way we configure our metaverse is able to sustain ownership in a legal sense, in the sense that we understand ownership as, you know, as real people. And then we need to solve disputes relating to ownership. So I'm going to ask three questions. Uh, and these are going to be my three questions. So the first question is going to be, how do we carve scarcity into the metaverse? The second question is going to be, what kind of metaverse can sustain ownership in a legal sense? And the third question um, will be, how do we solve disputes if they arise in the metaverse? So first of all, how do we create scarcity? Well, if we want to create scarcity in the metaverse, we have to make sure that our world is consistent. The first step is making the world consistent. By making the world consistent, I mean that if tomorrow I purchase a desert island in the metaverse, the day after tomorrow, I don't want it to be surrounded by other islands, right? I don't want the world to change without my consent because otherwise my nice part of paradise is gone. So we want to bind the world. We want to bind every actor in the world and make sure that they don't change it randomly without following the rules. And in order to do that, we have to use a tool that property lawyers are very familiar with, which is a cadaster. A cadaster is a register of all of the plots of land in, in the country, in the world, in the territory. Um, so you survey the plots of land, you set boundaries, and you say, this is ocean, this is land, this is hill, this is whatnot. Okay, so we have to do that. And it's not very difficult because the way in which a game is programmed, there's a grid and you put data on the grid. So you can use the coordinate to create that kind of cadaster. And then of course you will have to put it on a blockchain so that it's unfalsifiable and it cannot be changed. So the first step would be to create that kind of record of real estate, but also of chattels movable things, and you, cannot, you cannot do that in the real world. You cannot have a cadaster for movables, but you could in a digital world because you can keep track of every single asset that exists in that digital world. So you would have to do all of that in order for the world to be consistent, for stuff not to be created randomly and, you know, uh, really ruining the whole idea of scarcity and therefore of ownership. The next step, once you have you know, made sure that the world is consistent. The next step is tokenization. So tokenization of assets has been mentioned before. 
Um, the idea is that when you're in the real world and you want to have a system of ownership, your ownership system is largely based on possession. You possess assets and possession means that there is a presumption of ownership. And so you use that, you use possession also to transfer ownership. You have some kind of uh, reference, you have some, some kind of crown to say this person is the owner. When you're in the metaverse, uh, you can't do that because possession in the metaverse is very difficult. Um, you know, a, a digital asset isn't, isn't very palpable. Usually you will, you will have IP rights that go to the creator of the asset, you will have a ton of rights that, that don't make the asset really your own in the same way as you can possess a physical thing. So the mechanism that would work in the virt virtual world is tokenization. You create basically non-fungible tokens, so NFTs or non-fungible tokens because they're attached to a particular asset, unlike cryptocurrencies which are just generic, like money. Uh, and this token has, so basically every item in the world has a unique ad, hash, a unique number, and the token attaches to one of the items in the world. So if you own, if you have a title to the token, you can own the asset that is linked to the token. It's not very different from stuff we already have in the real world. Uh, if you look at commercial law, well, bearer instruments like checks or you know any, anything that the bearer can, uh, you know, it's 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 just a credit instrument that if you have it, you go to the debtor and he has to pay you, no matter if you're not the original creditor. It's just because you have it in your hand. Well, the NFT is pretty much like that. It gives you a title to use an item just because you have the title. So it creates a link between you and that item. Now, the problem which we're going to face sooner, soon, uh, is that while well, the NFT acts as a vehicle, as an instrument saying that you have the right to use that item, it doesn't really tell us if it's a personal or a real right at the moment, but it tells us that you have some kind of title. So the second condition is to have this NFT, which is going to, um, well, fulfill your psychological need for ownership because you have a title. And it's also going to link the asset to you and therefore to the real world because the NFT is in, uh, in a wallet in, in, in the real world that is attached to you in the real world. So you know, it kind of makes things work together. The third step, is to make sure that your virtual title is reliable. And this step is very well known. You just have to put everything on a blockchain. You have to register every transaction of NFTs in the blockchain. Uh, so I'm, I'm not uh, going to expand very much on that uh, because I think this is rather well known. So you create the cadaster, you map everything. You create the NFTs. You basically create a title that links the stuff that's in the cadaster to the real person in the real world and the avatar in the metaverse. And then you put everything on a blockchain which acts just like a land registration system, but again, it also works for chattels. So the blockchain acts as a land registration system. And then anyone who knows property law a little bit will tell me, well, land registration systems don't work the same in every country in the world. Some of them are proof of title in the UK, for instance. Some of them are not proof of title in France, for instance. So we have some kind of a problem because if we want the blockchain to be proof of title, we have to be in a legal system such as the UK. Uh, half of the US don't have a proof of title registration system. France doesn't, a lot of countries don't. A lot of countries don't. So you know, we have to assume at this stage that legal systems will validate the general idea that the blockchain can act as proof of title because otherwise we'll have to we will have to prove ownership in other ways, and that's going to get messy. So we have to assume that. Uh, and once we meet these three conditions, we can have some form of ownership, ownership system. So that answers my first question. Technically, it's possible to create scarcity, and technically, it would be possible to have ownership. Which brings me to my second question. What kind of metaverse could sustain ownership? Well. Ownership is a real right, and a real right, um, a real right, well, th there are many definitions and it's very difficult to define a real right, but basically it's the most generic legal relation to a thing. It's an area of freedom enjoyed by the owner. 
And in particular, and of particular relevance here, I would like to stress that ownership is, you know, we have to distinguish between real rights and personal rights. And the best analogy I think we can find is with feudal titles. Feudal titles were concessions of land in which the fact that you had land, the fact that you got land, was tied to the fulfillment of certain obligations. So basically, if I give you a title to use a thing, but in exchange you have to fulfill services and obligations, it's not really ownership in the sense that we mean it nowadays that you know, most countries in the world have abolished feudalism. Scotland in 2004 and the Channel Islands haven't abolished it, but that's, that's pretty much it. So, uh, our understanding of ownership is an absolute title, a title that is not tied to an obligation. And then we have a problem, uh, because whenever you have a platform, whenever you have basically a contract with an end user license agreement, they're going to tell you that you have a certain number of obligations in exchange for being able to use certain items in the metaverse. And uh, well, this, this is actually the only part of my intervention that has been heavily studied by people and on which there's actual data. Uh, end user license agreements usually contain clauses um, that whereby basically the platform will retain actual ownership of all assets. So they just tell you you're not the owner, except you just haven't read the fine print. Um, so it means that you only have a license, a personal, li a personal license, a personal right to use the assets that you purchased as NFTs. So basically the NFT was an instrument containing a personal right and not a real right. Um, in, in end user license agreements, you also have for feature clauses whereby if you're banned from the metaverse for whatever reason, or if you leave the metaverse for whatever reason, they're not going to give you back your assets because they can't, and interoperability isn't actually a question at the moment. They also have end of the world provisions like, hey, we're shutting down the metaverse while well, you're left with nothing. So all of this is patently incompatible with ownership. I mean, you can't have ownership if they can take it away from you with no compensation and nothing in exchange, right? So th this is, anytime you have a platform, anytime you have an end user license agreement is gonna be incompatible with ownership in, in, in the way things are at the moment. But then I thought maybe we should look into decentralized autonomous organizations. So a fully decentralized metaverse that is not run on a single server. So basically, there is not one person who can ban you. There is not one person who can shut down the server because the metaverse is being run on the computers of its users. So as long as there is one user, the metaverse can exist. And because you don't have one central authority that can you know, ban people or apply certain regulations, uh, you basically have to have a governance system that is based on algorithms and direct democracy. So usually they have kind of you know, votes. They vote for regulations and then they implement them through algorithms and basically smart contracts. Uh, and in that case, I think maybe we could have a form of ownership that resembles the, ones, the one we have in our legal systems. Because the main difference between uh, you know, ownership tied to obligations and ownership that we have nowadays in contemporary societies is democracy. The main difference is that at least theoretically, we vote for the limitations that we set on ownership. There are a ton of limitations, you know, urban planning, whatever, tons of limitations, but we agree to them. So they don't come from above, they come from, you know, just us agreeing to them uh, through uh, representatives. So we could have ownership. The difficult point will be the processual aspect of ownership. Uh, because basically, if you look at the conflict of laws, the rules about conflict of laws, uh, it always points to the place where the thing is located. And if you have a decentralized metaverse, the servers are located all around the world. So you can't even take the place where the server is located. It doesn't work. It's located everywhere. So if you wanted to sue someone, you would have to find the actual person behind the pseudonym which is not gonna work. And then you would have to find the court, and, and well, finding a court might work, but you would have to find the applicable law, and that's not gonna work either because conflict of law rules will always bring you back somewhere else. 
Uh, so the only solution, if you want to have ownership in the metaverse, the only solution is to solve all conflicts within the metaverse itself, so you don't have to apply real laws from the real world. Which brings me to my third question. How do you solve property disputes in the metaverse, and how do, which property disputes can arise? And actually, it's very few of them. Well, when you think of property, the, the main thing people are going to think about is property-related torts. Uh, for instance, if I destroy someone else's property, or I cause nuisance to my neighbor, maybe I, I try to, to sell something twice, so I sell it to a first person, and then I sell it to a second person, bypassing the first person. Um, and all of that is never happening in the metaverse for one good reason. Code is low. If we don't, if we don't create a system in the code that allows me to pick locks and break people's windows and pry their, do their door, I can't steal anything. And if I can't steal anything, I can't commit a tort. You know, I don't think metaverse creators would go all the way to creating an ownership system and then ruin it for the sole purpose of creating litigation by turning the metaverse into Grand Theft Auto. It's a game where you just steal cars. Uh, you know, if you want to create ownership, you're not going to create the torts that come along with it. So that's not happening in any decent metaverse. Uh, same for fraud. I mean, if you record everything on a blockchain, it's not happening. So that's, that's not something that's going to happen. The other point is restitutions and injunctions. So let's say, for instance, you have some kind of easement. Highly unlikely because, you know, no one is going to think about creating a virtual canalization to flush of it virtual toilet, right? So very unlikely. But if someone was trying to think about that, well, they could always create injunctions or restitutions through the, the blockchain or, or through you know, just the game program by either forbidding you, preventing you from using the item if you're using it wrong, or preventing you from building against building regulations, you know, just not, sorry, not allowing you to do something. Or um, they could create a system, so they could enforce you to return an item, for instance, but they could create what the French call a strand, and I haven't found a translation, um, you could basically ask the person to pay a fine for as long as they haven't returned the item or done things right when they should. So a lot of, a lot of property-related questions can be solved in that way. And the last question, uh, very sh sh should be very quick, is about ownership. Uh, what do you do about proof of title? Well, you have the blockchain, which is supposed to be absolute proof of title. And since, since you're solving your disputes within the metaverse, you don't really care about the fact that French law doesn't like it. Um, one thing that you should create is adverse possession. Because, you know, uh, some people are going to leave the metaverse and land is going to be vacant. So you want to create a system of adverse possession. And you can create it through the blockchain, just like normal land registration systems. Uh, basically, if the possessor makes a claim on the blockchain and says, I want to become the owner of this, and if there's no challenge within a certain amount of time, then you become the owner. So that's entirely possible. And we could also implement securities in the same way. Real security is like a mortgage. Well, a mortgage you just register it on the blockchain, and upon defaulting on payment, the asset is transferred to you automatically. So all of that can be solved on the blockchain, which leads me to my conclusion. Um, so if we, if we have a proprietary metaverse with a platform, there's no ownership in it. If we have a decentralized metaverse, we have people who don't believe in ownership enough that they want a proprietary metaverse, right? So they want a metaverse that doesn't belong to anyone. Why would they create ownership? I don't know. But even if they did, we wouldn't need property lawyers like me because everything would be solved through the blockchain. So oh, property law is really not an issue with the metaverse. So uh, thank you for bearing with me. I really don't know why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so we just, is it there? Yes, we just mentioned tort law and now we are uh, about to talk um, 
about it. And usually when you start looking at the literature on the metaverse, you don't find many references to total. You find a lot of contrast of property that maybe makes no sense. Uh, of course, to IP and many other competition, but not really towards. Well, our claim is that tort is gonna matter in the metaverse too, and we have two elements that, I mean, two factual elements that support that claim. So the first one is rising metaverse disputes. Uh, let's say, dis when I say metaverse disputes, I mean disputes related to stuff associated with the metaverse, which I know is very uh, vague as a definition, but that's it. So we have example of actions brought by users against platforms for conversion of virtual assets, which is exactly what you were denying existing, but you know, lawyers bring claims and actions by users against other users for, for instance, sexual harassment that was mentioned many times. Uh, so we already have disputes. And the other thing is that we can see the potential of tort law if, you, if we review the terms of service of some metaverse companies. We pick up the nine, nine metaverse companies you see there. Uh, of course, only US-based or Western-based because we couldn't review uh, the terms of service of the East Asian metaverse companies, which would be uh, an, another side of the world very interesting to analyze. Um, and all these terms of service prohibit users from harming other users, which means you can do it. Uh, I mean, you can in the re somehow do it and then it's not, uh, by code you can do it, but it's not allowed by contract. Um, and also, they all skew out their liability vis-a-vis -vis users, both in contract and in tort, therefore implicitly and paradoxically admitting that accidents may occur. So, which kind of accidents may occur? A long list. We can imagine, you know, all the set of torts, maybe, you know, some less um, uh, easy to imagine in the metaverse, but with some lawyer's fantasy. We can put everything, every tort we know in the real world, we can translate it in the metaverse. And of course, these kind of torts are going to have many shape and size, give rise to a, uh, occur between different defendants and different plaintiffs. Um, our argument is that there are different sets of claims that can be grouped, uh, focusing in particular not really on the cause of action, but on the parties involved. And one first thing that might happen that is already happening is users bringing claim against the platform, so against the metaverse companies if it's not decentralized, of course, so provided that it's one easy to locate uh, company. And we can think here, you know, user suffering personal injury because of defective visors or using them too much or, uh, you know, users becoming addicted. Somebody remember that there is the new gaming disorder which uh, might have been caused by uh, the way in which the flat platforms make you addicted. But we might also think of users complaining against the platforms because they were harassed, frauded, attacked by other users and claiming that the platform had the power and arguably also the duty to somehow prevent that thing from happening. Now, this is one, one, one possible scenario. Of course, in the case of user versus users uh, kind of accident, users might also complain between each other. So we might also have a sort of, let's call them peer-to-peer -peer actions. So actions between people more or less located in the same position. Uh, and peer-to-peer -peer action also include those brought by non-users against users. Imagine, you know, you are with visors playing very deeply into Fortnite and you accidentally eat your mother passing, you know, in the real room uh, and she is a non-user suffering an injury because of the user in the metaverse. Um, and also non-user, so the mother eat by the son playing the metaverse or, you know, victims of people who had been attacked in the real world by other people who were users who got completely crazy after playing Fortnite for 36 hours. Uh, so non-users might also complain against the platform themselves. And this is similar to users against the platform with the difference that they are not bound by the contractual terms and services as users are. So all these kind of claims, like any cyber tort case actually, uh, are gonna make it very difficult for plaintiffs to obtain compensation. So we can imagine the claims existing, but then it's very hard to see them uh, like successful. Why? Well, there are, of course, the contractual limitations imposed by the platform, but also plaintiffs would have to identify 
uh, the correct defendant. It's very close to what you just said about identifying the correct jurisdiction, the current applicable, the adequate applicable law, and then find the evidence. Somebody rightly noted that if things are not recorded, it's going to be almost impossible to prove what happened uh, there. And of course, finding also the way to secure the financing for all these uh, litigation. And our claim is that obstacles to uh, tort law action are going to be very high in peer-to-peer -peer actions. So actions between users against users or non-users against users. Uh, because in this case, not only you, know, you have the virtual location of the accident, which is going to create big problems, and of course you have the absence of any supranational regulation or uniform law applying to that, but you also have digital agents, so you have avatars and the problem of identifying who is behind the avatars, and we are back to what we were discussing this morning, you know, how to locate and give a name to people. Um, and moreover, non-users are gonna, uh, non-users are gonna have also difficulties in acting against the platform, because uh, it's true that they are not bound by the contractual terms of service, but they are very, how to say, far away from the platform. It's very hard, it would be very hard for them to establish that the platform has some sort of duty of care towards them, which are, you know, not even users, are somebody stranger, completely unrelated to them, and that their injury was somehow foreseeable uh, to the platform. By contrast, our claim is that probably the, 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 the claimants that are more likely to come out in the future because they, they, are, they are the ones whose claim are a little bit more likely to succeed are users for tort accidents against platforms. Okay? Because here we have the terms of service, but also we have a relationship which, is, you know, which make parties somehow connected to each other. Uh, and that's why from now on I will only focus on possible tort claims by users against platforms. Now, users against platforms are going to have a problem with the terms of service of platforms themselves. So we review these companies' terms of services and we discover not only that they outlaw wrongful interactions between users um, and that all of them specify, I mean some of them specify that although they might be able to control what's happening, they are under no duty to do anything. So it's clearly written. But also, they make it also clear, as I said, that they are not going to be liable to users, neither in contract nor in tort, for anything that might happen in connection to the use of the platform or because of the inability to use of the platform or for anything platform related, like it's really uh, written clearly there. Moreover, the majority of terms of service also add exclusion uh, of liability clauses that limit uh, the liability and I usually cap it to an amount that in the majority of cases is no more than $100. So imagine, you know, if you get completely, uh, if, you, if you get a gaming disorder and then you are not able to work anymore, you know, $100 is not really the kind of harm, the value of the harm you probably suffer. Moreover, almost all metaverse companies foresee a binding arbitration clause with arbitration almost invariably, with very few exceptions, uh, located in the US. And of course, a class action waiver for consumer class action. So no class action, no collective actions allowed. The majority of the terms also specify that in the case in which the arbitration clause is not deemed enforceable, jurisdiction for disputes will lie exclusively in before American courts and coherently with all of that, the applicable law is usually, with the only exception of some where, where the central land doesn't define the applicable law, and uh, which one is that? It's sensorium uh, choose as applicable law, the Cayman Island law, but all the rest identify the applicable law in the law of one of the American states. Then it, they're mostly California, but not only California. Uh, now, our argument is that these deep and strong and clear preference of metaverse, at least Western metaverse companies for American law is not only due to the fact that most of these companies are actually based uh, in the US, but it's also due to the fact um, that American substantive legal doctrines uh, and, in, and legal infrastructures actually deeply apply to their benefit. Uh, from the point of view of metaverse companies, um, US law is very protective, first of all, because it gives the broadest space for freedom of contract, even in be business to consumers transactions. So essentially, you're free to agree on everything, including that your counterpart is not going to be liable for breach or for anything bad that might happen to you. And courts actually enforce this thing. And since um, 
And therefore, okay, so that's, we have a lot of clauses such as class action bans, arbitration clauses, exclusion clauses, liability caps, action waivers that would, are all perfectly fair under American contract law, even when uh, they are imposed on, a, on a, well, what we would call a consumer. And then second, even assuming that like by magic, a user can bypass all of these you know, contractual defenses, uh, then it will still have to make a claim under US tort law rules. And we don't go into the details of the different causes of action available, but if you get the main one, which is the negligence one, that means that the users does not only have to prove causation damage and fault, but also has to, pr pr to prove that there was a specific duty of care owed to him or her, uh, and that there was a breach of that duty of care, and that's gonna be extremely hard in every case where there is no personal injury involved. So any case involving purely economic losses or non-economic losses. And third, even assuming that you are able to do all of that, you then have another immunity coming either from the First Amendment of uh, the Bill of Rights of the US Constitution or coming from the famous Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act that says that an intermediary is not gonna be liable for stuff other people said on its, uh, in its environment. And this is being particularly uh, bad for those who can be, for instance, victim of hate speech because essentially there is no liability of the intermediary. Now, you might think, okay, that's, that's the word, it's bad, but you know, we are used to injustice. Uh, the point is, this is not the only you know, uh, legal framework that might apply uh, to torts that are metaverse related. And if we look at, uh, it, to the law in Europe, we discover that actually the situation in Europe, in theory, is completely different. We have EU-derived consumer law that, of course, prohibit. Uh, adding unfair clauses into B2C contracts and therefore any terms excluding liability for death or personal injury and any terms limiting their ability to take legal action would, are simply are presumptively considered as unfair and therefore not enforceable if they are added into a B2C contract. Um, moreover, it would be also beneficial to users to rely on European tort laws, which are based not on EU, but um, as I said, product liability, but are mostly national. Uh, here, there is a lot of variety, but many European countries actually allow, for instance, negligence claim only upon proof of causation damage and fault, like France, for instance, and have a lot of strict liability provisions, some of which we remember, we recall this morning, that may apply for the benefit of, uh, uh, of victims, and have also no a priori limitation for recovery of any kind of losses, symbolic damages or you know, non-economic damages or purely economic damages. And further, in Europe, we have the protection, of course, afforded in constitutional documents to freedom of speech, and we have certain immunities that were recalled just in the session before, uh, acting in favor of uh, online intermediaries, but these immunities are not as broad as are the federal preemption defenses under the First Amendment and under the uh, Section 230 of DCA. Now, you might say, okay, fine, that's European law, but how can we get, considering what we just saw, how can we get EU or European law applicable to a tort law disputes. And we think, I mean, we think we found a solution. It's actually a proposal for victims that we hope might be followed by somebody, if ever somebody will read uh, the chapter. So our claim is that EU rules on jurisdiction, since they claim that a, a consumer residing, at least if it's domiciled in the EU, so that's the criterion, the assumption we have to fit, that will not work for the benefit of an American uh, or a uh, metaverse user. But EU rule and jurisdiction provide that a consumer domiciled in, in Europe is always entitled, meaning that he cannot waive that right by contract. It would be like the clause is not written, even if it's actually written. He's always entitled to start a claim against a company before the court of the state where the consumer is domiciled, provided that the company pursues its commercial activities in that state. It's the metaverse, the metaverse is everywhere. So as long as there is a consumer playing, we can say, well, that, that means that that company is pursuing activity in that state. And then once we have jurisdiction before a European court, of course that court would have to check the applicable law. And she would find that there are provisions in the terms of service, but she would also find that the law applicable to a tort action under EU conflict of law rules shall be the law of the country in which the damage occurs. 
irrespective of the law of the country in which the accident took place or of any other law. And in most of the cases, in metaverse-related accidents, that law would be, once again, the law of the consumers. Now, of course, people might agree on the applicability of a different law, but they cannot supersede EU pro-consumer rules, which is exactly would be that one. Therefore, that means that if you are a metaverse user in Europe and something goes wrong, you can sue your American company, provided that there is one, but you can sue them in Europe, in our home, apply, applying your own law, which actually is much more beneficial to you than it would be the uh, correspondent uh, US law. Of course, I mean, this is, all imagine for the time being, and moreover, it's not as bright as it might seem. We have to take into consideration that that would only help users domiciled in Europe, first of all. So whoever is domiciled in Africa, in Asia, in America is out of this possibility. But we can imagine also people starting to get European citizenship in order to get advantage of that, you know, in changing domicile. Uh, but the other thing is that, of course, Europe is lacking many, uh, speaking of the tort law field, um, is lacking many of the features such as, you know, punitive damages and class actions and contingency fees, et cetera, that make, action, make, make litigation against American corporation in the U.S. attractive for plaintiffs. Uh, so just to wrap it up, oh, no, 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 this is thanks for your attention, just to wrap it up, the main idea is plaintiff will, there will be accidents, there will be victims, victims will face many, many hurdles. Uh, much of these hurdles are actually in common with any cyber tort, so with anything happening in the digital world, it's nothing particular from the tort law point of view with regard to the metaverse. Um, and it's also true that uh, on the top of the traditional hurdle, we have these uh, application of US law that will particularly uh, undermine if, uh, plaintiff's protection. But, you know, the, the ray of hope is that maybe European law can provide, can provide I'm sorry, a gateway for helping at least a uh, European-based victim. And we would like to know, and that's uh, an open call, to see whether, you know, this, something similar might happen in other regions of the world, something that we could not uh, check. So now it's the time for that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the floor. Uh, thank you to La Larry and uh, Michelle for the kind invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure now to conclude this uh, first day of conference uh, by focusing on the relationship between the metaverse and the criminal law. Um, and I will starting from uh, um, a news report that appears um, uh, one year ago uh, in, our, in our article of the New York Times uh, uh, introduced for the first time a topic that was widely debated in the weeks that followed and that was the rape in the metaverse. And in this case, uh, a female researcher uh, intending to study use of behavior uh, in a new create platform called Horizon Worlds was exploring the metaverse with the use of an Oculus Visual and um, at one moment uh, her avatar was uh, surrounded by a number of male uh, avatars who uh, began sexual uh, harassing her, ate her uh, with verbal comments uh, and uh, by physical uh, touching her avatar. So the researcher uh, reported the experience uh, in a um, different uh, article uh, stating that she considered the in the accident she was subject uh, to be um, a case of rape and that she experienced in fact uh, that she had been physically uh, raped. Uh, so, what are the, the reaction to this news that we can have uh, as, uh, um, in the matter of criminal law? It would be easy to qualify uh, the um, uh, researcher reaction as excessive uh, because uh, we can, uh, in effect, consider that avatars are not the physical bodies and a rape suffered uh, in, by an avatar in the metaverse cannot be a real rape, uh, just as the murder uh, of an avatar in a video games uh, cannot be a real uh, murder. 
But uh, as is often the case, uh, an, an, an analytical investigation revealed that the issues are more complex uh, and uh, we need to analyze them from the point of view of the principle of criminal law uh, without, however, uh, forgetting also the consequence uh, on the mental health um, that such crime can have uh, on the victim. Uh, in fact, uh, from these uh, um, from this case, um, uh, we have uh, different, uh, several questions that arise, um, and in particular, two questions. The first, uh, if, if the metaverse, uh, more than internet in general, has uh, abstractly uh, the potential uh, to become a privileged place for the commission of crime, especially against the person. And the second question, more specifically, uh, is if the, uh, if the action uh, performed by an avatar produce uh, um, criminal consequence and can be uh, blamed uh, on the physical correspondent uh, as long as the avatar can be considered as an expression, uh, as an expression of the person, personal identity. Certainly, um, in order to un try to answer to this uh, quest to this two question, we can consider that uh, this issue is not new, uh, because in the most contemporary legal system, we have already um, um, see uh, the introduction of num number of uh, offenses that can be committed on internet or through electronic tools. Uh, so we can still talk about uh, uh, stalking, harassment, digital identity theft, sexual abuse, revenge porn, and treat. Uh, and so all these offenses uh, can also be identified in the context of the metaverse. Uh, but the, with the difference that uh, compared to the offenses that happen uh, through uh, internet or through an, an, electric, uh, an electronic tools, uh, here um, uh, the metaverse is not to be understood as a medium, but um, as a, what we call in uh, Latin, a real locus committi delicti, the place in which um, this crime can occur uh, in consequence of the act of the avatars. And this is the, sec the second particularity that we have to highlight of the metaverse, is the fact that uh, we are in a social context in which the, corpora the corporality is replaced by the avatar. And at the same time, the platform offers the possibility uh, to leave the sensory experience that have uh, um, the capacity to impact the human mind by making it feel exactly as uh, in the real life. And this is an aspect uh, that criminal law also must be uh, taken in consideration. But from the criminal point of view, uh, could this uh, um, correlation, this uh, um, assimilation between avatar and the personal identity uh, of his user be enough, be sufficient to attach criminal liability to the physical person for the action performed by uh, the electronic counterpart from the uh, avatar? Um, we can um, argue two arguments uh, on, in order to answer to this question. Uh, one uh, um, first point of view um, uh, give uh, an affirmative uh, answer uh, to this question, in particular uh, considering the fact that uh, the, most, uh, the majority of legal system uh, in, the, in, in Europe um, now move uh, beyond the concept of uh, the personal liability intend as uh, a liability of the natural person um, um, as uh, the consequence of different uh, law that provide the uh, liability of the legal person for offenses. But uh, this analogy between um, uh, the 
um, legal person and the avatar pass over the fact that the criminal liability of entity do doesn't have a, strict, a strictly car criminal character uh, in all country. But we can see that in different country, um, uh, this type of responsibility is uh, called as a terzo terz genus, uh, like uh, a mixed liability between administrative and also criminal aspect. Um, and also the second uh, consideration that we can uh, um, make in relation to this theory is also the fact that uh, the criminal liability of the company arises from the fault of organization based on uh, the law regulation. At the contrary, here we have the behavior of an avatar that acts in a violent way uh, towards uh, another avatar. Uh, so we can move to a second um, answer to the question if we can um, attach a, a criminal liability to the physical user of the avatar. And the second, as, as, uh, the second answer is more complex because it's taking into consideration the principle of criminal law um, and try to uh, give uh, um, an answer that uh, need to mm, take into consideration in particular the principle of materiality, uh, which is one of the fundamental principles of the uh, majority of uh, um, a criminal system uh, in, in Europe. And so, um, in consequence, uh, uh, it will be false to say that, that uh, the, um, the criminal offenses uh, are not uh, considered in the metaverse. But we uh, have to uh, make a um, different consideration if we refer to criminal offenses uh, in which we have, uh, um, we need a, a physical con contact between the perpetrator and the victim and um, a second category in which uh, we don't don't have this uh, contact. So if I refer to this uh, last uh, category, so it seems possible that criminal offenses um, that no presuppose a physical contact between perpetrator and victim um, can be committed uh, through the metaverse um, when uh, this conduct uh, um, produce a perceptible uh, damage uh, in the real world. And in this sense, uh, we have some uh, um, cases that we can mention, like a thrift of virtual gods in, in which the physical person behind the avatar suffer a, a loss of the value of the god, or also the hypothesis of financial crime, uh, phishing, uh, fraud, falsification, uh, and also when the metaverse uh, is uh, used as a channel to uh, launder illicit found or also to raise found uh, from sanctioned actors, including those linked to terrorism. Uh, we can also take into consideration the case of defamation or treat when the sentence are direct to the person behind the avatar. So, with a real impact in the in the real world, it's possible also to uh, have um, uh, some hypothesis of identity um, theft uh, in the case of uh, computer hacking, um, and also the possibility to uh, have the constitution of uh, the offenses of sharing child pornography material, in particular when these offenses uh, is um, um, take the form of uploading downloading and uh, sharing uh, uh, image with sexual consent. So in such case, um, it will uh, either um, be possible to apply um, the rules of the criminal law that we apply in the real life, but also all uh, the criminal offenses uh, that uh, the majority of legislation uh, provide for crime uh, that um, um, happens through uh, internet or electronic tools. 
More complicated are the category that implies uh, the, the contact, the physical contact uh, between victim and perpetrators, so like uh, uh, battery, bodily harm, sexual, sexual assault, rape, and murder. And in particular, if we take this last example, uh, the murder, killing an avatar um, should not be treated similarly to the killing of a person, because in this case, we, do, we don't have the, uh, the loss of of deprivation of life of a human being. And this is a solution that we, um, this, this, ans this answer should be linked uh, to the application of some uh, principle of criminal law, the application of uh, materiality of um, criminal law, um, linked to uh, some expression like the expression Latin uh, cogitation imponem nemo patitur, which is, means that uh, no one can suffer punishment only for is true, or also uh, the provision in some criminal code in Europe uh, of the uh, impossible crime uh, that uh, is characterized by the fact that uh, the action don't have uh, the material uh, possibility to be realized because we don't have the physical um, object on which this action will take place. Um, so um, the same could that the same example that I gave for murders can be also applied to the hypothesis of rape or sexual assault because um, such offenses in the metaverse don't have the physical person on which the attack uh, happens. So therefore it seems um, that uh, the ratio for uh, providing a sort of classification of taxonomy of the criminal offenses in the metaverse um, must be based on the necessary um, compatibility of the of the metaverse with the principle of criminal law um, that animate the most um, criminal law system uh, and that require the presence of uh, a guilty act, a guilty will, the casual link and uh, the, uh, the damage. And in fact, in this case, a crime by definition is understood in the continental legal system as an act or omission that causes damage to one or more person defined as victim. Um, um, therefore, this consideration that I, ga I gave about the, 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 necessa the necessary respect of the principle of uh, criminal law, um, uh, it cannot be ignored that these uh, criminal offenses, and in particular the criminal offenses that I mentioned that, uh, that imply the, the, con the, the, the physical contact between the perpetrator and the victim, um, um, when happens in the metaverse, uh, they they give rise to stress and anxiety condition in the real life for the victim. Um, this is not a surprise if we consider that the brain of uh, the human being placed in this uh, virtual reality uh, is able to experience emotional response that are very similar to uh, those experienced in the real life. So it's possible that the consequence of a rape um, um, gave rise to uh, some stress condition or anxiety condition. So in this sense, uh, uh, there is nothing to prohibit uh, outside um, uh, the, the area of criminal liability uh, that one can turn um, to the civil authorities to obtain a compensation of, for the moral damages that it suffered in consequence of this act in the metaverse. But, at the cont um, but however, the broadening of criminal law um, to this hypothesis uh, appear dangerous because um, this will be um, an improper, um, in my opinion, association between the reason of social justice that place the criminal law uh, at the service of solving a situation that involves the violation of uh, a legal right which is protect in the interest of the community. And on the, on the, on the other side, we have uh, a logic of uh, um, uh, 
a, a, a situation uh, in which uh, a person suffered uh, a things uh, which is, is true because uh, it feel it but um, it is, uh, is a lack of materiality of the act and so we have the risk that this uh, solution uh, create what we call a category of perceived crime uh, in which the act uh, doesn't happen in on a real person uh, in, and in consequence, we have the violation of some principle, basic principle of criminal law, like the principle of materiality and the principle of offensiveness. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, because I don't know the, the time. Uh, in conclusion, in, and, and I also had some some uh, to, to this uh, hypothesis uh, of, of the materiality. I had also that we have to take in consideration that this system uh, offer also uh, some difficulties uh, due to the fact that uh, we have the possibility to um, uh, put an end to the situation simply removing the, the visual or also to uh, ask for a protection that some platform offer um, like a sort of protective shield for uh, the victim and um, also from a point of view of the procedural uh, law procedural criminal procedural law um, the fact that we can admit in these cases um, the, the, the constitution of this crime would be also a problem under the um, proof uh, so the, the, the need to, to give documents or uh, uh, of things that can prove the, the crime offices can be a problem and also um, at the end one another problem can be the identification of the offender behind uh, the avatar so these are some questions that can arise from um, the extension of the criminal law to the hypothesis of the metaverse. So in conclusion, in the light of this consideration, uh, the, we can consider that the virtual world, like the real world, is not without risk and uh, danger for the user, uh, but uh, um, uh, the lack of uh, a complete uh, taxonomy of what constitute uh, uh, criminal offenses in the metaverse uh, will make things more difficult because uh, we require a case-by-case -case assessment of the conduct in the light of the principle of criminal law and under now uh, we can consider that the use from judicial system of the existing model of criminal law and also the use of the existent criminal offenses provided by the legislator for crime committed through uh, internet tools give satisfactory result. Um, however, it's not certain that uh, in the future when the metaverse uh, evolve uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the future, uh, reference to this class classical principle uh, will be enough and uh, later new specific uh, and rules and principle uh, will have to be drafted uh, just for the metaverse. And finally, uh, I want just to say, uh, yes, just uh, um, after my um, uh, analyzing the critical aspect of the application of um, criminal law uh, to the metaverse, I want also to, um, um, uh, to, to, to say how uh, the metaverse can, at the contrary, uh, represent a sort of uh, resource, a sort of uh, um, um, possibility to enrich the capacity of the criminal law to uh, fighting uh, um, against existing crime. Uh, there is, um, um, they exist some new experience uh, like uh, in Spain and also in France uh, that allow um, to uh, the, the perpetrator of violence in particular in the case of violence uh, that happens uh, in the context of um, uh, domestic um, ambience uh, to uh, be uh, immersed in in the world, in the virtual world, and experience 
experience uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the violence from the point of view of the victim. And so in this sense, uh, the, the metaverse can also give us, uh, at the contrary, an help to fighting uh, uh, against what exists in the real world as a crime. So I hope that my reflection uh, uh, gave us some point of reflection for the future, and thank you for your attention. that real-life courts can't handle it. It's very easy to prevent conversion by registering on a blockchain not only transfers of ownership but also transfers of possession. So it would be very easy to prevent it, but it's not done at the moment because they know you're not owners anyway, so they don't really care. Thank you. Right. Questions at the back? Yes, thank you, thank you uh, the three of you, for your very enlightening presentations. Um, I just I want, I have many questions, but I, I have one question for Flora. Uh, and your reasoning was very clear to follow from a proper law perspective, so I thank you for that. I only had one question in respect of a digital assets as the subject matter of the property right. Um, especially there are some jurisdictions, in, for example, Germany, if I'm not wrong, that require that the subject matter of property rights is a corporeal thing. Uh, and I don't know if there are any studies, I'm clearly not in the field, yeah? so I don't know if there are any studies or any th uh, approaches in respect of the possibility of having digital assets, having data as a subject matter of property rights, uh, which could affect uh, the, any right of ownership in the metaverse. Thank you. Um, Yes, that is a very interesting question. Uh, if, if, if you look at all of the national laws of different countries, well, most of them, I think most of them would allow for incorporeal assets to be considered as property. But there is a difference between incorporeal assets that exist in the real world and incorporeal assets in a virtual world. And not all jurisdictions would agree on, you know, whether to classify them as being able to be property in any way, in any, you know, case. Uh, also, even if jurisdictions consider virtual assets to be property, they would probably classify them as chattels, so movable, even if they're virtual land. So, you know, uh, by looking at the specific laws of every country, we could reach very different results. Uh, I just, you know, want it as a proof of concept to try and say, okay, what happens if all of the stars are aligned for us to have ownership and and, and besides, if we're not solving it through the court system, if we're solving it through the blockchain, uh, we don't actually need to worry about what, what property law actually says in Germany because we're solving it through the blockchain and not through the court system. So at the end of the day, it wouldn't change much because we're not involving the court systems because from a conflict of laws perspective, they can't be involved anyway. Thank you. Short question for Flora. Uh, yes, you you said that uh, ideally the the law would be code, the, the principle would be code is law. Um, what do you think about mods process? You know, uh, users can uh, can use mods to modify the environment of the metaverse. So, what if someone with a mod process? modifies the the nft that you own and erase it you know you don't have a, an, an efficient property law per se you know you don't have a legal title of property well yes i mean there, there are a lot of issues with ownership and i i totally don't believe in it uh, obviously if you find a way to 
if you find a way to modify the item that is linked to the NFT, so you find a way to, so the person keeps their NFT, but you modify the item in the metaverse, then it doesn't have the same function or form anymore. So there is a part of this in my written paper that basically you have to make sure that whatever item you own as per the NFT is very precisely described in terms of form and function because property law requires specificity. There's a principle that the thing you own has to be this specific thing and not just, I don't own a pen, I own this pen. So it has to be described in a very satisfactory manner that would prevent such actions from happening. But obviously, you know, I, I don't think the blockchain is unbreakable. Uh, I, I don't think any of that is true. I don't think the blockchain is absolute proof of title of anything. You know, it's, there must be a way to crack it. Um, so that will happen. But then the, the conflict would happen at the interface between the metaverse and the real world. So we might be able to anchor it in some jurisdiction and be able to do something about it. I, Caroline. I think I heard you say that uh, if you, you, for certain crimes, you need physical contact. If it's not there, it can't be that specific crime, like rape. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm yeah. So, uh, but you know, all research at the moment and the things we see is, is that um, it's very much to the detriment of youngsters, women and minorities. Mm -hmm any form of sexual harassment. Uh, um, and you said, well, okay, then we have tort. And I just wondered, I'm, I'm, we always have tort. Huh? And then we end up with you, it, perfect. But I feel by now, when you're a woman, and th th that we need a bit more uh, beef to the criminal laws as to, you know, virtual uh, harassment. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I just wanted to say that, uh, that I, I would love like you to step up and not just say, oh, well, then we have tort. I mean, I think we need maybe some new versions of, of virtual harassment. And um, it would be a good thing if, we, if that would end up in your paper. I just want a public call. <laughs> yeah? I'm sorry, I was going to go back um, before to the previous discussion on uh, the, the property law thing. Um, I, I, I personally disagree with the idea that code is law. I, I think uh, I, we're on the same page on that. Uh, actually, property law is important, and we all know when we study law that, uh, that people writing codes or uh, um, write, drafting general terms and conditions, they cannot address any legal problem. And it's the same thing with, with blockchain and with metaverse. Uh, and it's not enough. We will have problems and we will need um, property law. But then property law is very much a territorial law. And as you mentioned, whenever you have one legal system recognizing proprietary, proprietary sorry, rights uh, in, in one uh, given legal system within borders, then the blockchain, the metaverse cross the borders and you're, prop, you're, you're, you're an owner, and then you're not an owner anymore uh, under the second legal system. I just wanted to mention um, in this regard that there is a uni droit work, working on, uh, they're working actually on uh, a common law, property law, on digital assets, so that would govern the NFTs after the MICA European regulation, that can be of any, well, they have a, a, um, an open paper now, we can give comments, and I don't know much about that because it's not my specialty, but I, I think that we need property law, but then we already addressed with conflict of law questions regarding uh, virtual assets with online goods, with like online defamation, with online, so yeah, I think we already have answer with conflict of law out of the legs, um, the, the, the place of the thing. We do have answers. 
Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm not an expert at conflicts of laws and certainly not as much as you are. I think it's a lot easier when you have a platform because you have a physical point that you can, you know, relate to. Even when you have a central server because you can yeah, yeah. put the item somewhere. Uh, I know that the British court had this wonderful solution whereby they, they said the digital asset is governed by the law of the owner of that asset. Well, if your conflict is about ownership, precisely you don't know who's the owner. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues, I think, with conflicts of laws. A solution would be harmonization. Uh, I don't think harmonization in terms of property law is coming anytime soon because, you know, they've tried before. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, so, you know, <laughs> well, hopefully they'll find something. Um, then, you know, you said you disagree with the fact that code is low. I used that in a very specific context, which was to say that uh, if the code does not allow me to pick locks, then I cannot pick a lock. So the code, the code is preventing me from doing certain things in the world. And if you want to create an intelligent ownership system, if you're not completely stupid, if you want people to actually uh, buy what you're selling, you're selling ownership. So, you know, I don't want to buy a Ferrari, a Ferrari in, in, in the game and then have it stolen by, by some guy. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to want to do that. So, if, I mean, if, if, if it's the far west, people are not going to want to buy things, I assume. So I suppose you would have to prevent them from stealing and breaking and, and you know, that kind of stuff if you want ownership to work. Uh, I, I, maybe I'm just, you know... Uh, but, insurance. But, is, well, yeah, but, yeah. but is it ownership? Well, you can sell insurance, but precisely, you know, uh, you just said something which is very true. People who code are not lawyers. They're not going to think, let's break things so we can sell insurance and lawyers in the metaverse. And that would be totally perverse. I don't want to believe in that. I want to believe there's good left in the humankind. I may maybe I'm just an idealist. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, all of you, right now and before, because, as you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I learn a lot. Um, when, when I did my, my talk I, uh, with uh, Mathieu, uh, we, we insisted on the fact that we thought that there might be metaverses, and it could be, we don't know, we really don't know, and uh, that's why we, uh, the title was Prospective Elements. And uh, I also chose uh, in the paper, uh, in the end, the part when I, um, uh, um, the, the part where we, we talk about the political aspects, and I would like to insist on this because I think um, uh, w when I hear all the discussions we had, I think there might be a possibility um, that, in fact, if he, if my idea is true, is that. We, will, we won't necessarily have uh, unique answers uh, for all uh, metaverses. And maybe, uh, maybe there will be metaverses where you have propriety law, M maybe some kind of, maybe uh, you, you will have the possibility to choose metaverses where it, there's no propriety law or there's no NFTs or uh, there is um, a material impossibility to uh, rape someone, or it, it, it is just, uh, f it is forbidden, but not uh, impossible in the way it is programmed. And uh, I, I think we might, uh, the, the, the possibilities, maybe it won't happen at all because we will have collapsed before, but if we have indeed the possibility of many kinds of metaverses, there might be many kinds of law in the metaverses, so maybe we would need to think of some kind of meta law of all the metaverses. Thank you. Was it a comment or a question? Yeah. Uh, definitely. <laughs> when we think about interoperability, we should think about interoperability between the rules governing each mm. metaverse because it's going to be a huge mess. Yeah, interesting. So I have a very last question, but before the question, it's for Marta. Uh, because after that uh, we'll be done. Thank you very much for your patience, for your presence. Um, for the speakers, uh, you know that there is dinner at uh, 7.30. You have the name of the restaurant, uh, the place, uh, <laughs> well, the location. Uh, I will probably stay at the university, in the office uh, until then, so if some of you w want to join, just um, 
20 past 7 in front of the building, then we can go together, but it's close to your hotel and you will probably uh, be willing to, to stop by the hotel. But just, so, thank you very much. Last question. Uh, I, I don't think, but I don't know if you ex explored it in your chapter, Marta, but did you consider the, the grounds of liability, okay? And so the, uh, for the liability for things in custody, the liability for others, because if we consider that, uh, you know, the users or the avatars are not persons, but maybe they are things or, you know, <laughs> whatever between a pers person and a thing, incorporate thing, uh, would, would that be a ground of liability for uh, the, uh, the platform, you know, or, or, or liability for, uh, for others, you know, uh, because the users could be considered as the, you know, the agents of... Uh, yeah, we, uh, you're perfectly right. I, it's something also, I think Stefan mentioned this morning as a possibility. Yeah. We actually did not go through that in the paper, but it for sure, it's for sure something related to the question of the relationship between real people and the avatar, and uh, we didn't go through that. But okay. yeah, I, I fully agree that it's something to look at. It's just that we were dealing with other things, and therefore that is mentioned like yeah, yeah. You know, okay. as a passing by, but yeah. And that's it. Yeah, that's it's it. Over. Thank you very much. <laughs> you will have the gifts. Oh, Larry, <laughs> you're back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, yeah. So, according to the EU regulation on uh, the, the applicable law in case of uh, extra-contractual damages, it's French law that applies to the damage you suffered, yeah? So if you want to, to sue the university, it will be a, a court in Lyon, I guess. Okay, so I think we are ready to start waiting for... Uh, the others to, to join uh, a bit later. So um, welcome back and uh, thanks for you know being still um, here uh, th this morning. Thank you very much again for um, the various presentations yesterday. So I would chair this morning a panel, at least a part of it, and maybe Larry, you would like to, to chair uh, the second half of uh, this morning panel, but uh, no, no pressure. It's well, um, Enrico Bonadio is um, the first to speak uh, today. Uh, thank you very much, Enrico, uh, for being with us. Uh, we first met with Enrico, and it will s sound strange because we are still relatively young, but we met first uh, 23 years ago. Uh, that's right, no? Yeah. Year 2000. Um, in, in Torino, uh, and ever since, uh, I think we met uh, almost uh, uh, several times uh, every year in conferences and other stuff. So en Enrico is a um, um, professor at uh, City University London uh, Law School. He's an award expert uh, uh, in intellectual property. Um, he gives lectures, conferences, uh, uh, in many different parts uh, of the world. Uh, uh, it was yesterday in Jerusalem and uh, some days before uh, in Kingston, or Jamaica, or somewhere in Jamaica. So if you follow him on LinkedIn, <laughs> you, you would think, hmm, his wife must be very, very kind, <laughs> okay? Um, so you, you can patient <laughs> in the so you can imagine how lucky we are to to have him uh, with us this morning and without further ado Enrico the floor is yours thanks Michel I am lucky to be here because I've been here at uh, Catholic I mean the first time I was here was 12 years ago as we said so I I'm teaching in the master here so thanks so much again for the invitation today um, I think we are on teams right we are on teams I, I guess yeah. So Rishab should be, should be there. So this paper um, uh, has been, I mean, is being coordinated by myself and Rishab Monot, who is uh, in India now. She is connecting from India. So we have, uh, as you know, we, we are finalizing the, this paper. It's still a work in progress. And uh, it's about trademark rights and publicity rights in the metaverse, right? So I will be speaking about trademark rights and Rishab will be speaking about image as we have divided the, the job like this. So trademarks, we know that 
you know, the registry and trademark is very important in the real, uh, real life world, but it is increasingly become important also in the virtual world, right? Uh, indeed, the several practitioners already recommend their clients or some of their clients to register the mark, the trademark, in connection with virtual goods and virtual services, right? That's a trend which has already started. Uh, so what we can expect is that uh, trademark, uh, trademark uh, registrations, trademark applications will uh, uh, materially increase in the next in the next years. It's already it's, it's, it's a trend which has already started. An important reason to include virtual goods and services in the trademark applications is, first of all, to also facilitate uh, licensing agreements with third parties, right? This is one of the reasons why they, they, they file applications with reference to virtual goods. Also, registering trademarks for virtual goods and services can send a message to the market uh, that the brand is forward thinking, thinking right? And uh, services are, I mean, and innovative. So it's also a question of image, of marketing and commercial image. Uh, indeed, those who have already registered their trademark for virtual goods and services have uh, gained significant publicity, Nike, Gucci, uh, in the field of fashion, in the field of fast food, McDonald's, uh, and so on. So for, for example, McDonald's, it filed several trademark applications for a metaverse restaurant uh, where a user can order food on, for online and real life delivery. So you order the food in the metaverse and you receive your Big Mac at home. Right? How fun, how, how great it is. I mean, how, <laughs> I wouldn't choose McDonald's, but still people like that. <laughs> so uh, if you look, at, we have looked at, at several applications and the, the goods which have been mentioned in the applications are uh, virtual goods such as footwear, clothing, uh, download, downloadable virtual footwear, uh, highwear to be used in the virtual environment, for example, avatars that wear some glasses sunglasses and so on and so forth. Um, so different classes of services, downloadable virtual goods and NFTs in class 42, right? And so on and so forth. So the main reason for registering trademarks in connection with, with virtual goods and the services is obviously to get a monopoly which then can be enforced against infringers. Now that's the main reason why any companies, any trader register trademarks. So. Uh, as a general remark, uh, trademark owners, uh, if they want to win a, an infringement case against infringers, they need to demonstrate uh, the, pro the, the risk of confusion right, on the part of the consumers, right? If the trademark is not famous, because if the trademark is well known, of course, you don't need to, to, to prove risk of confusion. But if it is not famous, you need to prove confusion. So the issue here is, uh, that uh, are real life goods and virtual goods similar? Can they be considered similar? Because one of the requirements is to prove the similarity or identity between uh, the goods of the complainant and the goods of the defendant, right? So we don't have yet case law on this, but this will be one of the next big issue in trademark law. Can we so if a, a trademark applicant registers only for real life goods, can then enforce such trademark against, against competitors which use the same trademark with, with reference to virtual goods? It's an open question. See, we don't have an answer, so we wait for some case law, either from trademark offices, for example, the EU IPO, or national trademark offices in Europe, or the US PTO, the U.S. Trademark Office. That's the big, uh, the big, the big, the first big issue. Let's say. Then, uh, so I just, get, I just this is a bit the first big issue. The second the big issue is you know bad faith applications because what we have seen in uh, the in the latest uh, in the latest uh, in the latest 
you know, ERC is that some, uh, some uh, competitors, some, uh, some companies, what they've done is to uh, register uh, uh, trademarks, uh, let's say, uh, which are similar uh, to other trademarks in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the metaverse. So some individuals and companies with, uh, let's say, malicious intentions uh, have attempted to gain control of valuable trademarks rights in the metaverse by filing for such trademarks. And there is already a significant number of, let's say, bad faith applications for metaverse science, and this is the case for well-known uh, brands such as Prada and Gucci. So what these fashion companies have had to witness is that other people have, have filed similar trademarks for the metaverse. And this, of course, presents a, an obstacle for those trademark owners to penetrate the metaverse. And the, of course, for the big fashion houses, it's relatively easy to fight these bad faith applications. They oppose them, they, they may take action in court, but for small and medium-sized enterprises, it's more difficult. These represent the costs, right, to fight these uh, bad faith applications. So. Uh, what, my, what we might expect in the future is uh, probably uh, some uh, tweaks in the legislation in trademark laws as we had, uh, you know, you remember in, for domain names at the end of the 90s, right? Uh, we might witness a change in the law, in trademark law, exactly to try to oppose or to slow down these bad faith applications. Then another issue is a cancellation for non-use, no? As a general remark, under trademark laws in most jurisdictions, if trademark owners fail to use their sign for an extended period of time, for example, under EU law is five years, right? The registration may be subject to cancellation, right? That's usually uh, by way of counterclaim. Usually the trademark, the alleged trademark infringer, usually what he does is to file a counterclaim for cancellation if the trademark owner has not used the trademark for, let's say, five years. Well, the same principle may apply in the metaverse, which is, as we know, a virtual reality space where people can interact with each other. So therefore, failure to use metaverse-related trademarks can make them invalid, in theory, because they do, they do not serve the purpose of protecting a particular product or service. So to maintain the validity of the trademark in the metaverse, uh, probably the, 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 the owner of the must use the trademark in, in the metaverse. So what we have witnessed so far is that certain companies, for example the big, have already uh, registered their trademarks with reference to virtual products, but they have not started using it. And this might be a problem down the line in the future if they don't start uh, using in the metaverse because you know a defendant in a possible litigation may say look yes you have registered it for visual goods but you never used it so i want the judge now to declare your trademark partially invalid with reference to those uh, to those uh, uh, virtual goods that you know in relation to which you have not used the the trademark uh, lastly, there is an issue of jurisdiction, which is not a new issue, let's say. Uh, of course, while metaverse platforms are and will even become more global in the, in the, in the, in the future, uh, trademark rights are territorial in nature, right? IP rights are territorial. We still have this principle of territoriality in IP law, with some exceptions, but this is the main principle, right? Not only for trademarks, but also for copyright patents. Uh, but the metaverse is global, right? And therefore, an infringement might occur within, uh, you know, many jurisdictions, right? Uh, this, as I said before, has already been an issue, an issue in relation to the exploitation of marks in the internet, right? It's not a new issue. We have been dealing with this issue for, you know, since the the boom of the internet in the late 90s, right? Uh, for example, some courts in the in European states, in UK, uh, they have ruled that the mere accessibility to a website in a certain jurisdiction is not enough 
for having an infringement, you need to target actively the customers in that jurisdiction. So I guess this principle might also apply with different uh, degree of intensity in the field of metaverse, of course. But again, we are speculating here because it's a new platform, we don't have case law, and uh, we will see what the judges will, 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 will say with reference to, to jurisdiction. So these are just a few of the issues that we will, uh, uh, some of the issues we will uh, deal with in the paper, in the final chapter. There will be other issues such as uh, exhaustion of trademark rights in the, in the, I see my friend Peter is, is giving the follow-up because you have studied exhaustion so much. So exhaustion will be another issue that uh, probably will need to be uh, analyzed. Does the sale of the virtual good exhaust the rights with reference to that? It's an open question and we will see how the courts will, 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 will reply to this question. So now I give the floor to, to my co-author Rishab. Rishab, are you there? No. He's in the metaverse probably. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is Rishab is there? I can he should up. be. Yeah, but I can WhatsApp him. Amelie is checking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello. Ah, yes, he's there. Hi, so, Rishabh. just hello, uh, welcome. Just a few words of introduction, which I should have known uh, earlier. So, um, Rishab Anjai Monod is uh, a commercial lawyer uh, in uh, Mumbai, so in India and uh, works uh, uh, with Enrico and especially deals with the intellectual property uh, issues, uh, of course. So um, it's very nice to see you remotely and the floor is yours for uh, approximately 10 minutes. Hi, uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for having me. Um, I will briefly take all of your time to discuss uh, the image right issues that can arise in the metaverse. Um, so before I actually go into um, the issues that might arise, um, it's helpful to discuss um, the nature of the metaverse in some ways. Um, for example, how will the metaverse be accessed by users? Um, we have some examples of metaverse-like applications and websites. We have Fortnite, which is a a game, we have Second Life, um, and we have several other simulations. And all these simulations are accessed by people through characters or, or what they call avatars. Um, these avatars are basically 3D depictions of people. So you have a choice of uh, choosing what kind of hair you have, what kind of height you have, um, you know, your clothes, and, and basically create a character that represents you in that metaverse. So this is how we see the metaverse evolving in the future as well. Uh, one doubt, I mean, we don't have case law, as Professor Bernardio said, on the metaverse. We also don't know whether the meta, we also don't know how the metaverse will look. We don't know how uh, technology will develop, for example, virtual reality and augmented reality. Will, will we be using goggles to enter the metaverse? Will the metaverse have um, real life depictions, basically, I mean, how you would see real people, or will they be avatars? These are all open questions, and, and so obviously these cannot be dealt with specifically. But the principle here is, is that if we have avatars, um, do these characters or avatars um, hold publicity rights or, or image rights? Um, so this is, this is the key question with, with image rights and the metaverse. And, and it may be helpful just briefly to discuss um, how image rights are protected. Um, so image rights typically refer to the right to control the use of one's personality, of one's facial features, any identifying characteristic. Um, it could be your voice as well. Um, and, and we have two concepts here, one of, a, of an image and one of a portrait. And um, different jurisdictions have different kind of words for these. But the idea is that image rights don't only protect actual images or videos of a person, but also identifiable characteristics. Uh, in cartoons, for example, or in animated videos. So um, we now move to how image rights are protected. And different jurisdictions have different methods. There are statutorily protected publicity rights, but several jurisdictions, for example, the US is one of them, India another one, 
where it is the common law or case law that is used to protect publicity rights. There is no specific statutory right. So we have a web of copyright law, trademark law, data protection law used intermingly, interminglingly uh, to protect uh, personality rights. For example, I mean, just last week we had a case in India where trademark law was used to protect the rights of uh, a very prominent Bollywood actor, Amitabh Bachchan, uh, in, in several advertisements and for commercial purposes. Uh, for example, in the UK, uh, facial features would, would constitute sensitive personal data and can be protected under the data protection laws over there. Now, now we move to the question of, of avatars. And, and would then the question, for example, if we were to go under data protection law, would avatars constitute um, sensitive personal data? If we were to go under copyright law, would avatars constitute artistic work that can be protected by the person it represents or the artist who creates that artistic work? Um, and, and these are questions that, that need to be answered because and create complications because there are several different types of laws that are um, that are being used to protect image rights. One very interesting case, um, although not entirely similar in its fact circumstances, is, is a case involving Max Verstappen. Max Verstappen is, is a Formula One driver. He drives with Red Bull. Uh, he recently won, won a championship as well. Um, and he was basically used uh, by a, a delivery company called Jumbo in Netherlands. Um, so the advertisement involved Max Verstappen getting into an F1 car with a, with a delivery package, using the F1 car to go really fast to someone's house and delivering the package. And, and the idea of the ad was, was to say, you know, we have super fast delivery speeds. Um, and, and, a and, and, and a few months later, a competitor of Jumbo, a company called Picnic, um, created a similar ad where they used someone who looks exactly like Max Verstappen, but is not Max Verstappen. They dressed him up in, in Red Bull attire, which is the F1 racing gear, put him in a car that looked like Max Verstappen's and had, did the exact same ad, basically a, as a kind of parody um, to show that um, their delivery is fast as well. And this, this case reached the Dutch Supreme Court. There were differing opinions in the lower courts. Uh, and the Dutch Supreme Court held that this is a violation of Max Verstappen's image rights, even though the person who was doing the ad was, was someone else, uh, was another person, was a lookalike. The image rights of Max Verstappen are, are violated. And one of the key principles from this case is that there might be, um, the audience might know that this is a lookalike and this is not the same person. But if someone intentionally creates a character, for example, by dressing him by dressing a person up in Red Bull attire to look like someone else. And that in turn results in certain commercial advantages, commercial benefits. Then the image right of the person who is being imitate, imitated are violated. And if we try to apply this principle to the metaverse, where we will have, for example, avatars or, or characters that are created in the metaverse, we, we can basically apply this principle to say that avatars that represent certain individuals in real life, even if not precisely, but if they communicate the message that they are that person, it is likely that courts can follow this kind of a logic and, and say that um, even those avatars violate the image rights of, of the person they imitate. We, of course, don't have exact case law on this point, and, and there may be some, some issues. For example, I mean, if there are lookalikes uh, in the metaverse, um, genuine lookalikes, doppelgangers, uh, how, how will that be dealt with? And, and these are interesting questions. But um, I think as a starting point, the Max Verstappen case is, is, is a good place to begin with. And, and, and that's about it. I think there are, there are several other issues that Professor Bonadio touched upon. For example, licensing issues, um, whereas existing licensing contracts, will they extend to the metaverse? Questions such as this. Um, but I will not uh, kind of repeat these these things. And, and so I'll, I'd like to conclude here and hand it back to Professor Bernardi. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Ishab, for, for this overview. And yet nothing. Just to conclude, there are common issues um, for both trademark rights and image rights. One is jurisdiction, as we have seen. We have problem jurisdiction. And also uh, interme intermediary liability. That's another big issue. 
will uh, the platform be liable or in which circumstances and there of course we will again need to verify whether we can apply the hosting exemption under the e-commerce directive or, uh, or of uh, 2000 of uh, 2000 yeah 2000 so uh, we will see the case law how the case law will uh, will will deal with these issues well as a way of concluding as i said uh, you know the metaverse will pose is already posing uh, new challenges or old challenges because some of these challenges have been already posed by the internet at the beginning so it is uh, a new wine, a, an old wine, a new bottle, or vice versa. We will see in the case law, and probably we will we will witness a, a, a change, a review of uh, of trademark laws or an image rights laws in the in the in the next in the next years. So we'll see whether this uh, revision will happen via a new. Uh, for example, in Europe, a new directive, uh, regulation, or via case law, we'll see. But these are the main issues that we will deal in the, in the paper. So thank you for your attention, and of course, we are looking forward to the questions and comments. Thank you very much uh, uh, to the two of, of you. Um, and with your presentation, actually, we cover, you know, uh, with the presentations by Yoni and Peter yesterday, you know, uh, intellect, the, the wide, wide range of intellectual property. So that, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so now um, uh, I, uh, I am very happy to give the floor uh, remotely to uh, Mateja Durovic. We, we will start uh, with uh, Mateja and then Francisco. Uh, a part dedicated to consumer protection in, in the, the metaverse, uh, starting with unfair commercial practices um, uh, with, the, with Matea. So just a few words of introduction, and most, many of you already know uh, Matea. Uh, so Matea is a reader, reader in contract and commercial law at King's College uh, London. Um, he, he writes uh, and publishes extensively in uh, European private law, European consumer law, and in the past years in uh, all the issues connected to uh, the impact of new technologies on, um, on, on the law, and is uh, also the uh, co-director of the Center of Technology, Ethics, Law and Society at King's College, so in a quite uh, good position to address the issue of unfair commercial practices in the metaverse. So, hi, Matea, it's, very, it's uh, very nice to have you with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michel, for such a kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my really great pleasure uh, and honor to be again with you in, uh, in Lyon, although remotely. Can you hear me? That's the most important question is online. Uh, yes. Pietro, uh, Pietro says yes, but the others in the room? Yes, I hope so. Uh, I said, unfortunately, I have to be remote because I have uh, myself uh, here I just finished a conference on private law and new technologies at, in London, and I'm very sad that uh, Michelle and Larry could not participate because they were having this amazing conference, super, super interesting. And, you know, when you talk about metaverse the, and the kind of its implications for consumer law, and in particular for the unfair commercial practices, when I got invitation for this conference, my first thought was, oh, wow, it's amazing. It's a great follow-up to this Leon conference on smart contracts that uh, Larry, uh, Michelle, and Christina organized five years ago, exactly, in May 2018, where the main topic was exactly smart contracts and its implications for the legal system. And, you know, that's, again, a great topic because, you know, I think five years later, when it was actually one of the first conferences on smart contracts, but, you know, even five years later, what is still to me a puzzle is really how much smart contracts have really changed our life and how much actually are they being applied in practice. And we are still discussing potential legal issues more than kind of real legal issues posed by the smart contracts. So to apply it to metaverse, it's kind of, I think, similar thing. It's something that was kind of great idea, great kind of potential. But we still do not know. And, and when I was kind of reading about the metaverse, whether it's kind of uh, described as a success or a failure, and you really you can see mixed mixed kind of descriptions. However, uh, still when we talk about metaverse, I think that on the one side we still need to kind of discuss it and to see what are some potential legal implications for the impact commercial practice. 
But on the other side, when we talk about the rules on unfair commercial practices, it is a really one of few areas of law where we already have some case law. I mean, we already have some problems, legal problems, like concrete situations both in connection to, to, to the metaverse. Why is that? Well, it's primarily because metaverse, I mean, now we have all this kind of description that it can be used, I don't know, in the, in the, in the kind of medical sciences as a way to kind of simulate uh, different medical uh, surgeries, uh, to kind of kind of cure particular diseases, to, to take care of the patients. Then, for example, also people studying, uh, let's say, the Ice Age, it can simulate how it, it used to be to be in the Ice Age. It can really like... Uh, in, in so many disciplines can be applied, but this is still being tested. This is still kind of not being something broadly, broadly used and broadly applied. But in one sector, we we we, we use really metaverse more and more, and that's gaming sector, which is also very booming. Why is this matter from the practice of unfair commercial, from the perspective of unfair commercial practice? Well, this is important because who are primarily the users of unfair, of uh, of uh, Kind of who are, who are the people playing these games within kind of the uh, relying on, on metaverse avatars? Well, these are primarily children, and in the context in the system of unfair commercial uh, practices, children are particularly uh, protected category of consumers. So that immediately opens a number of legal questions. Okay, uh, how to protect uh, children in the already existing uh, cases that there are many uh, problems. Arose uh, from the metaverse, and they deal with different issues. And th that's that's kind of something very important to be addressed. So, as I told you, like when you talk about, and that's something I, I will address in my paper, that you know, uh, from the perspective of commercial practice, we address two types of legal issues. One is, you know, what's really happening now, and I told you this is actually an exa excellent example. You know, gaming sector and children as consumer. This is this is already reality. And second thing is, you know, what are some potential implications? How can we kind of, you know. Uh, uh, imagine what are kind of the possible developments of the metaverse that might kind of uh, be kind of interfering with the rules on effect commercial pets. So these are kind of the, the, the two main. Now, when we speak about the setting of the, the kind of setting the landscape of the rules on effect commercial practices, we have this famous in U the European Union directive 2005-29 on effect commercial practices, which provides the most complete, the most advanced level of consumer protection to consumers, protecting them in the widest possible number of cases, uh, whenever economic interest in any way may be hindered by the trader's behavior. So, very broad uh, application. Also, I mean, I don't want to step into Francisco's presentation, but, you know, in the context of uh, what's also important to remember that, you know, these rules of commercial practices are really kind of something that's spread throughout the world. So it's not only the European Union. If you look at other, even Hong Kong has them, Australia has the very developed rules. In the US, California, for example, of course, UK is the legacy of the of, of, of its European Union membership. Then many of the other Asian, African, South American countries. It's much more developed than in case of, you know, consumer contract law, where we have much more kind of less developed rules worldwide outside of the European Union. So in that sense, it's also Interesting to look at uh, cases outside of, of the EU when we talk about the uh, commercial base. Now, again, when you talk about the landscape of the uh, and, uh, uh, by the directive, we have this famous three-level hierarchical mechanism for assessment of fairness of commercial practice. And to start with, we have these 31 uh, practices which are always considered to be unfair as uh, defined by the Annex 1 of the directive. And of course, because this is something that the, the piece of legislation developed almost 20 years ago. Of course, there is almost nothing in relation to the digital age, in particular nothing in relation to the uh, uh, metaverse, uh, with the exception of one that can be potentially uh, 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 useful. And that's point 25 of the Annex 1, which is one of the aggressive commercial practices, which is always automatically to be considered as unfair, which basically points out that you know a commercial practice will be always the case when kind of trader includes in an advertisement a direct exhortation to children to buy advertised products or persuade their parents or other adults to buy advertised products for them. This is a really important uh, point potentially because it also opens all these kind of question because in, for example in, in this gaming setting children are kind of really being targeted a lot 
to buy different uh, virtual products that will kind of enhance their position in the game, that will, uh, that will kind of, you know, support uh, their kind of gaming strategy and whatever. So in that sense, there is a lot of, in a way, illegitimate pushing of children as kind of game players to buy particular products. So we can kind of immediately to, to, to subsume. And that was already the case. I mean, if you look kind of, you know, in Europe, still not, but in the US, especially on the ground of California, rules and African countries, we do have cases that exactly re, uh, refer to this kind of association of the of the children and the, in, in the context of metaverse, how they're being pushed to buy the different products. And this is kind of considered to be a breach of, 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 of the rules and effect commercial price. So that's one kind of potential thing. Here in what I have to say that, you know, this list of 31, that is something that is being uh, currently discussed and revised by the European Commission. It's kind of second refit project where uh, the European entire European consumer law is being uh, tested and is being kind of uh, verified to check whether it is fit for the digital age. And Hans Schulte Noike and me, we are part of this kind of academic advisory team. Where And one of the ideas is definitely to try to kind of expand this list. And there is definitely going to be something in connection to the metaverse because that's something that potentially uh, needs to be needs to be addressed, addressed in, especially in the context of the children. That's that's kind of a next uh, next step. I mean, the, the legislative reform. We already do have this uh, first reform of the, the rules on a commercial practice in Europe, which is the directive, the moderni modernization slash omnibus directive of 2019, which has in, in reality brought four new practices. But this is something that uh, does not, of course, it was again five years ago, when it was kind of ratified four years ago, that did not address the question of matters. Uh, Second step, second hierarchical step for the assessment of uh, fairness of commercial practices is uh, are the three small general clauses that uh, are there to secure that consumer makes a free and informed choice. And again, there is nothing so specific for the digital age, but there is something again potentially useful, which is this idea that how in the last, and uh, that we can, for example, see in the European Union and some other places in the context of TikTok cases, uh, connection of how data protection has actually uh, become extremely connected with the, with the, with the rules of the commercial practice and, and generally speaking with, with the consumer law. Why is it? Well, because in the last years, of course, I mean, all this that has been repeated a million times, data is new gold, data is new oil, etc. The idea was, you know, that also metaverse is now being used uh, to actually to extort data from the consumers. And again, as I keep telling you, you know, children are currently the main users of this kind of framework. Uh, and then, you know, this data is being stored somewhere, it's being uh, used for different purposes, it's being commercialized, it's being sold, then to be used for different, you know, profiling in the context of, you know, profiling from relevant from from the consumer law perspective, like to targeted advertisement, targeted, you know, a personalized pricing, etc. And that's kind of, again, quite problematic and shows to you the very tight connection between the rules on data protection and consumer or consumer line in particular the rules on a commercial practice. And that's kind of, you know, we can kind of rely on the rules on misleading, uh, uh, both misleading actions and misleading omissions that are kind of the, the, uh, the, the, the two small general clauses of the second step. Why is that? Well, because again, this kind of practices of the trader where he kind of uh, does not clearly dis describe and explain to the consumers for what and for what kind of the purposes uh, a particular data is being used, it's being collected, and whatever, is also seen as a form of, of a commercial uh, practice under this kind of misleading, misleading uh, small general clause. So that's another kind of potential where we can kind of still rely on the existing system. And eventually, what we have is this uh, famous Article 5, which is the General Fairness Clause. And General Fairness Clause, you know, at the time when it was developed, I remember that 20 years ago, and I'm, uh, as, as Michel said, we are not that old, but I mean, that was the time when I was writing my period, so I remember all this, uh, reading this Trauma Preparatoire and everything. I mean, it was very interesting because it was very heavily criticized because, you know, we have this General Fairness Clause for no purpose, because, you know, everything is already covered by the, this 31 uh, uh, explicitly mentioned uh, forms of, of a commercial practices, which are all prohibited and three small general clause. So why do we need it? It just brings legal uncertainty because, you know, 
we don't we do not know what what kind of a court in the member state can subsume under this kind of general fairness principle. But we can see now in the digital age that this is really something they have kind of the the the, the, the drafters of the directive say this is kind of to secure future proof of the rules of the directive, and it is really true because really it kind of helps, you know, the general fairness principle, which, which basically says that commercial practice, which is contrary to the requirements of uh, professional diligence and, you know, uh, causes a consumer to make a uh, transactional decision uh, uh, under, under, under the impact of this uh, commercial practice, uh, is something that, you know, is definitely something applicable to the to the to the system of the metaverse and to kind of protect consumers in in, in, in the metaverse system. Of course, I mean, in that sense, this is part of the more kind of general debate about you know the regulation of the new of the new technologies, because again, on the one side, if we kind of go to very sp specific rules, let's say on the commercial practices, like we can add in the this annex one is kind of forms of American commercial practice which are always uh, prohibited. That's kind of good because it gives you a lot of legal certainty. But the problem is that, you know, technology now develops at such an incredible pace, so it's uh, really difficult for law to follow it. And that opens, again, a number of questions of, you know, law reform and the time it takes. Whereas if we have this kind of Article 5 of the directive, it is great because it's kind of general principle that, that allows for kind of easy adaptation of the law to the new challenges brought by the new technology, including the metaverse. But on the other side, the problem is, you know, you don't never know whether these kind of developments, for example, also kind of different uh, metaverse, whether this is something which is legal, which is in compliance with the applicable law or not. And that opens a number, number of legal questions. Now, again, the new kind of development, especially the, the on, on, on the European level, Digital uh, Services Act, again, I mean, it just kind of provides an additional level of protection to the to the to the children as consumers but we are still kind of to see because its connection with the rules on uh, unfair commercial practice is still kind of unclear and we'll still see how this enforcement will look in practice but there is also potential especially as i'm telling you in the in the in the context of where metaverse is already being extensively used which is the gaming sector to kind of you know uh, see and use uh, 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 the 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 the, the the, the rules on uh, kind of unfair commercial practice and, you know, DSA, which kind of strengthens protection of consumers and the participants of the digital of the digital market. And this is all kind of a broader, kind of opens a broader number of questions of kind of, again, the need to kind of clarify the relationship between the rules on data protection and, 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 and the rules on unfair commercial practice in the digital sphere, because now we can see that for something that was, you know, 10 years ago, totally separated, but now, there is more and more kind of connection. And Metaverse also opens another important question, which is again, better regulation of this concept of digital vulnerability and how really properly to protect people who are kind of definitely vulnerable. Because, you know, hypothetically speaking, we can also imagine that Metaverse might be for different reasons. I mean, I'm not now on Saturday morning and then I, I even thought of that yesterday, but you know, for example, for the elderly population, where they can kind of be uh, relying on the Metaverse, maybe in the context of uh, Alzheimer or these kind of things to put them, you know, in the, in, the, in the more familiar world of the childhood or something like that. But these are kind of just some some of the of the potential. But again, from the rules, from the perspective of the rules of the commercial practice, that's something that needs to to be to be adapted. So I would like to conclude with my presentation to try to say that you know, from the perspective of the rules of the commercial practices, we have kind of two potentials, you know, and that's what my chapters will address. It's actually already the existing problems posed by the metaverse, and I here I refer primarily to kind of children and consumers in the gaming sector where metaverse is extensively used. And on the other side, you know, this idea that metaverse will be kind of broadly, much more broadly used and applied in practice. And, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, to see, to try to identify what are kind of the potential challenges and how the rules of commercial practices sh shall adapt. Again, thank you very much for your attention. Again, many thanks to Larry and Michel. They keep organizing, you know, the, 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 the excellent conferences and to be really at the forefront of all these uh, challenges uh, brought to the law by the new technology. So really congratulations on that. And I wish I was you, I was with all of you in person. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Matea. Um, yeah. <coughs> As you said, indeed, uh, among others, you, 
uh, the, the game sector is one one of the uh, uh, example of metaverses where probably uh, the, the issues are uh, quite concrete uh, right now. Uh, I've read recently that uh, there are uh, 3.5 billion uh, billion persons around the world, so more or less half of the population, <laughs> um, uh, going on uh, game game platforms. So, uh, well. <laughs> Uh, th there might be uh, indeed a, a field of, uh, of research uh, there and uh, of legal analysis indeed. Thank you very much. So uh, with your presentation, Matteo, we, we had the, let's say, uh, the regulatory approach uh, with unfair uh, commercial practices and I guess that uh, Francisco now will um, uh, cover the other aspects of consumer protection and probably um, uh, the uh, private enforcement uh, side, uh, when consumers can uh, file claims on the basis of the various uh, uh, legal provisions, uh, especially in, in the European Union law. So, uh, Francisco de Elizalde is an associate professor at uh, IE University in Spain, in, in Madrid. Uh, he's a very good friend as well. Um, so, uh, Professor de Elizalde is uh, specialized in EU law and EU consumer law, among others. Um, he was um, uh, he, he, he was appointed the director of the Zomonet uh, Center of Excellence for Law and Automation, um, uh, which is a, a quite well-known center uh, in Europe um, regarding uh, law and, and technology, of course. He's a, a visiting professor in many different institutions. Um, in his training and afterwards he visited many prestigious uh, institutions and we are very happy to have you eventually here in Lyon after several attempts in the past years um, and with some disruption. <laughs> so the floor is yours, Francisco. Thank you. So thank you, Michelle, for your kind introduction and for your invitation as well. Thank you, Larry, for having me here. The last time I wanted to come here was in April 2020. So I hope uh, the, we don't have a disaster after this conference. Huh? So uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, also for being here this morning. I also see some students who might receive a better grade for being a Saturday morning. No, Michelle, I assume that the dean will have this into, into account. <laughs> Uh, so, I was in charge to speak about consumer protection in the metaverse, and um, after seeing my very bright friend, uh, Matej Durovic, speaking about the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, which is probably the, the most significant for this context, I opted to challenge and see how consumer protection is being affected in the digital world by the interaction with data protection laws, market regulations laws. and especially how consumer protection is moving, or better, the, the fact of being a consumer in the digital world is approaching issues of citizenship. And I just put an example. Uh, according, to, uh, according to a study some month ago, uh, generation seed uh, people interact more via video games uh, in Web 3.0 than at school or at work. So which means that the immersive reality is not only a matter of buying and selling, it's a matter of relationships, it's a matter of interacting, which through the door of consumer actions, we become affected in more personal sites. Um, so this is why I want to show or try to make the argument that EU, cons EU law is not improving consumer rights in the digital world but on the contrary, it is dismantling consumer protection. I know this is a lot to say, but I'll try to make my argument. I put here the Statue of Liberty because of Larry, and I joke aside, because the PowerPoint when I created this image. Um, so to show the shift, I want to just give a brief introduction is how consumer law is status-based and how we are departing from that. So, Consumer law takes what's called the position logic, okay? What we are concerned about is in a esteemed situation is who is a consumer and who is a business. Because if you are in a B2C relationship, this applies. And that is 
consumer law and many laws in private law in the European Union take this position logic. It's not as in traditional private law where it was about individuals. It is about whether you're a consumer, where you are an investor in financial markets, and this is objectively defined in the sense that you're a consumer when you're acting outside um, purposes uh, related to trade, business, or profession, okay? And you instead, you're a seller, a trader, or a business when you're acting for purposes related to your trade, business, or profession, okay? And this is, and this is very important, this is independent of your knowledge or expertise. Okay, so to put an example, if you're buying some financial product as a consumer for your personal purposes, you will be protected as a consumer even though you are a financial expert. Okay, in this case, the case Costea of the Court of Justice was in relation to unfair terms, was very important. Costea was a, could be any of you. It was a commercial lawyer challenging terms of a credit agreement that he had entered into for personal purposes. And the other party said, come on, you did this on your daily life, okay? You should have known better. And the Court of Justice said, the definition of consumer is objective. Whoever buys for personal purposes is protected, disregarding knowledge or expertise. And this is very important, and this was repeated in further arguments in the concept of Brussels Convention in, in Schrems and uh, Jana Petru Wojcowa. This is also present in respect of transparency, okay? For example, in the Unfair Terms Directive, we have the case Kostler, which says that transparency for the purposes of the Unfair Terms Directive is referred to the average consumer. Okay? And the average consumer, and we see it around in consumer law, is that well-observant, circumspect person, then we see how courts apply this, disregarding expertise. We also see this, and this is very important for contract formation, because your consent is not yours. Think, for example, in French law, think of mistake and the excusability of mistake. Huh? If you are a financial expert according to traditional French law, they will look, and you want to say, I didn't understand what I was buying. They will look to your expertise and see, hey, you have an MBA in whatever, you are an expert in financial markets, the mistake is not excusable. I don't recall now the exact article of the French Civil Code, but that is there. This is not the case in consumer law. We don't look at you. So even parties who are knowledgeable can challenge consumer contracts. This was called the option for maximum welfareism, okay? We protect everyone who acts for personal purposes. This is also present in the directive that Matea was commenting on and fair commercial practices. For example, the misleading action, okay, when you receive, for example, incorrect information, it looks at the average consumer understanding, okay? When there is omissions, information that was not given, again, Article 7, you look to the average consumer needs, and it takes the average consumer to take a transactional decision. So it's not as classical contract law that you take a decision, it's the average consumer which takes or is likely to take a transactional decision, and same for aggressive commercial practices which are very important in the digital world and in the metaverse, is the average consumer's freedom of choice, okay? So it's not the individual uh, and you influence that the consumer might have. What is the effect that this has on enforcement? And this is the important part, okay? And uh, this was a bit theoretical, but this has a lot of practical effects. The first one has to do with individual challenge of contract con contracts, uh, of, of consumer contracts. Because if your expertise is irrelevant, and many, I would say, all in this room are above the average consumer, you can challenge any contract, okay? So you are better protected by consumer law than by traditional national law. This is also very important for collective redress, okay? Because we are saying, okay, now the European Union has a collective redress uh, directive, we're improving collective redress, what the Americans call class actions, similar. We are improving collective redress. But for collective redress, you need some commonalities, okay? And here the 
the, the uh, American uh, uh, federal uh, civil procedure rules are very clear, is you need some common facts or common rules of law. Because think of a mistake, for example, in national law, okay? So Larry is a smart person, much smarter than me. He probably will not be mistaken in lots of circumstances, according to the law, than I would be, and a lay person even more. So the question is, you cannot have a class action. You cannot have collective redress if we have to analyze one by one. Okay, and this has been said in many cases. Whereas if we don't care about the individual, if we consider the average person, the average consumer, the who a consumer is, of course you enhance consumer redress. This is very clear, for example, in unfair terms. Once you have an unfair term, this is unfair to everyone. Okay? And of course, this enhances public enforcement. Okay? When you have any different forms of public enforcement, you need some sort of commonality uh, and some sort of general interest for the public authorities to act. So there is where we were. Okay? But from there, we start to interact with data protection laws. And as I'm saying, I think that we are deconstructing consumer law. Why so? How do we interact? Okay? The European Union considers data is one world, consumer protection is a different world. This, and if we'll see, you have seen in the digital markets, we'll see it even more in, in the metaverse or in Web, web 3.0 applications, is to begin with, your data is treated whenever you want a provision of goods or services in the digital world. Okay? The famous accept, accept, accept that we don't even read. That is there. Second, and this is connects a lot with citizenship rights, you are being profiled, you are being targeted, okay? You are receiving personalized prices, a lot of studies, even in Europe, in respect of personalization of prices. And of course, we've seen many cases throughout the world of politically tailored uh, um, initiatives based on your consumer track. Okay, so they know what you buy, they know what you like, they know what you want, they assume whom you will vote. So that is how your consumer life, okay, even social media, etc., what traditionally was considered your consumer life, is getting interconnected with more citizenship aspects, including political decisions, including free moment of expression. We've seen this with Twitter uh, in, in many situations. And of course, now data is accepted as counter-performance, especially we have the cases of, of, of social networks, no? Instagram, I always put the example of Facebook, but my students said that this is too old, and I now need to speak about Instagram. So, when, and we have the digital content directive, which accepts that this is equivalent to a means of payment. Okay, so your data, your data is part of the consumer transaction. And that is why data world and consumer protection become intertwined. And why about citizenship? Well, of course, as I was telling you, so the digital environment, and this, there are many studies on this, as how digital marketplace exploit and as ex designed to exploit your vulnerable aspects, okay, in many, in many fields. And also it's relational vulnerability because the better they know you, the worse for you, okay? Some say it's okay. There was a big debate on personalizing law, especially in the US and personalizing things because that would be better for the consumer, the evidence, empirical evidence, is that it's worse for you. The better they know you, the worse for you, okay? And when it comes to the metaverse, well, the avatar, we also have even a more important impact in your personality. There's some study that what I found that was conducted in Stanford some, some years ago, seeing how the avatar, your behavior, impacts your future contact, okay? So you choose an avatar, and you start to behave certainly online as the avatar you choose. Okay, there are people who are probably shy, and they choose some type of avatar that empowers them, or some people who probably wouldn't do some harm in the physical world, they, they do it with, with the avatars. And this brings another problem, is that if you are behaving with your avatar, you are start to be connected with your avatar, there are also issues of digital inheritance, which is a diff a, a, also a debated issue, is can someone inherit your avatar, can someone inherit your 
your activity and what you have gained in the digital environment, especially in the metaverse. Okay, there are many platforms that deny this right in the terms and conditions, and there is a debate whether this should be an unfair term, uh, and there's a proposal by the European Union on that. And lastly, in respect of this connection between citizenship and consumer law, we have the issue of freedom of expression. For example, we have the issue of Twitter. Okay, Twitter was a consumer application. You simply entered into there to show your expression. We can think about LinkedIn, you can think about others. And we've seen how Twitter had seen many cancellations. Uh, so there was a shift in the policy and there were seen many cancellations in the, past, in the past years. And now the Digital Services Act deals with this and says, regulates especially how limitations of rights should operate with these uh, providers of intermediary services and is regulating terms, something, terms, and terms of services, something that was historically a matter of consumer law, and especially in the respect of fundamental rights. But as I was telling you, for the European Union, there are different worlds. Consumer law is about market protection, it's about market law, with the idea, historical idea, and of course there are very uh, lots of, of um, debates as to what is the economic constitution of the European Union, but most say it's auto liberalism. So we, 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 we control uh, the, the supply side and we foster the demand side, okay? Let's make these people, the consumer, spend more by being safe on their rights, okay? And this side, the economy will move. I know this is also changing with sustainability issues and others. Whereas data protection is, of course, a a concerning the, the, one of the freedoms and in respect of the freedom of, of, of free flow of data, but it's also concerning as fundamental rights. And even it's based on a different treaty provision. It's based on Article 16 of the Treaty of the, Fundament of, of the Function of the European Union. So when you think about markets, and of course market regulation is, is based on market, but when you think about a fundamental right, you're thinking about autonomy, you're thinking about protecting individual choice, which is also embedded in consumer law, but it's not alone. And we see the changes, how we move from the status to the individual. So it's not about the average consumer, it's not about the objective definition, but now it's about the individual. So in data protection, in the GDPR, you protect the data subject, which is the natural person. It's not that who buys for a purpose outside his trade business or profession. It's the natural person. In the DSA, we speak about the recipient of the service, which is again the natural, or in this case, the legal person. In the e-privacy directive, again, is the natural person. Okay, so what happens, let's imagine, when you are subscribing a contract with LinkedIn, with Instagram, which used to have, you, we would used to, and there are some terms that you don't understand. Shall we apply the traditional average consumer or shall we look to each one of you? It's a completely different criterion. Are we going back to national law where we look to each one individually of you? Well, the Court of Justice for the time being has only said, uh, has given uh, opinion on this in a case that's called Orange uh, Romania. Uh, and in this case, the court says that what's important is the data subject, the individual data subject, okay? And in the, more importantly, because when you read in literature, they say, okay, they coexist. There are two regimes. On the one hand, you have data protection. On the other hand, we have consumer protection, and we don't know how they interact. Well, this has ceased to be true, because in the Digital Content Directive, you read recital 38 and article 3.8, it says, when it comes to data treatment, and they say, especially when it comes to consent, the GDPR and not consumer law applies. Okay? So, my take into this, of course, this takes time, it's slowly, but my take into this is that beyond the claim of improving consumer rights in the digital age, from a practical perspective of enforcement of consumer rights, we are deconstructing consumer law, at least as how we understood it in the past 20 or 30 years in the European Union. Michel, I know you have one more minute. Uh, at least, yeah. Ah, yeah. And I will finish with this, because I, I told you the dark side, okay? The dark side. 
Now, let's look to the bright side of the metaverse, okay, in one minute. Uh, this balance already shows my uh, opinion. No? Uh, so first, to begin with, it has to do is how the metaverse can enforce transparency, okay? We are now clicking and accepting terms without reading, huh? and the law assumes that this is efficient. We don't read it. But in this immersive reality, we can take some already existing legislative provisions that would allow to give a more realistic information and would convey a more realistic understanding of the terms, okay? For example, there's uh, the GDPR speaks about icons to provide information. The DCA speaks about machine readable terms. We can speak, think about giving key information by sound. We can think about giving key information by any reading, but in shorter terms. I think that the metaverse is an opportunity of actually rethink what is going on in respect of transparency of uh, terms. And lastly, and this I do think is the real bright side of the metaverse, has to do with enforcing consumer rights on the uh, blockchain, okay? Uh, and of course, this connected to, to smart contracts. There have been some initiatives, I think, was for the German Senate that was put aside on enforcing uh, passenger rights on smart contracts. And on this, I think we need to choose which law can be enforced. And I think that the passenger rights is a good idea uh, because it follows the conditional logic of blockchain, okay, of zeros and ones, uh, in the sense that hopefully the law is always interpretable. We are there, that's our job, okay, we have to interpret problems and, and, and uh, in connection with the law. But this uh, and, uh, air claims compensation regulation is quite straightforward in the sense that if the plane has arrived late or has been cancelled for more than X hours in the case of delay, you have a right to compensation. This is zeros or ones. Has the flight arrived late? Yes, no. Okay. Uh, has it arrived more than X hours? Yes, no. And moreover, there are lots of companies in the legal tech market that they do this automatically in connection with flight data. Uh, and in terms of compensation, it's very standardized, 250, 400, and 600, depending on the whole of the flight. This is also zeros and ones. And so I think that, and I have many smart contractors here in the room, uh, I think that would, this could be a good provision to in, enforce this type of consumer rights on the blockchain, in the metaverse, and that could be a distinctive side of consumer protection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Very, very interesting and uh, st stimulating, actually, uh, in these dif different aspects. May maybe we, we, we could wish uh, a kind of dry word, you know, uh, a word based on, uh, on the dry language and not na natural language, and dry computer language where everything, you know, it can be automated. Uh, <laughs> this is probably <laughs> because of what you have been doing uh, in, in the center of law and automation in the past years as well. But uh, yeah, very, very interesting and, and numerous uh, 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 ideas in order to, uh, to, to deepen the analysis of, uh, of what is going on uh, in the India. Thank you. Uh, so for the... Last presentation before a short uh, a short break. Uh, we are very happy to welcome um, uh, Anup Ashok and uh, Sunil An Anand from uh, Bangalore, India. Thank you very much for traveling uh, to to Lyon, to France uh, for the, the conference. Uh, um, you are both uh, practicing uh, lawyers and. Uh, involved in uh, the uh, commercialization of uh, many different IT uh, uh, products uh, connected to Web.3. Uh, so it will be very interesting to, to listen to you and to see some uh, use cases, uh, actual use cases in your market, but also beyond the Indian market as far as I could understand from our uh, conversation yesterday. And it's uh, um, a great compliment to what we heard so far as well in terms of theoretical analysis and practical as well, but having a real uh, life example uh, will help a lot. So uh, 20 minutes for the two, what, well, 10 minutes <laughs> each, but um, the floor is yours in uh, whichever order you prefer. Hi. Yeah, thanks everyone. Firstly, thanks Larry, thanks Michelle, and thanks University for having us here. 
I think conferences like this are really important because they promote dialogue in this very highly emerging field. Um, so, yeah, like you said, we're practicing lawyers in the field, so we've taken more of a pragmatic approach than an optimistic approach, um, as it makes sense at this stage. So, this topic is very interesting for us because I think banking law and the metaverse by itself is a contradiction because when crypto assets first started, the, the technology and the purpose of it was so that banks are not really involved. Um, they wanted people to be in charge of their own data, their own money, and not have any third parties like banks involved. So, banking on the metaverse, I see at this stage is not really an effective uh, concept because we do in fact see banks who've entered the metaverse, the use cases will be built by Anoop, but um, not necessarily for offering banking services. Um, one quick example here is, um, I think HSBC Bank has bought like a land in decent land because I think they just wanted to put the footprint of being in the metaverse. But apart from that, we haven't, I haven't seen any real utility of banks offering full-fledged services in the metaverse. So I don't think it's very relevant at this stage. Um, also because regulators still don't fully understand how crypto assets and blockchain work. Um, for example here, Ethereum was formed somewhere in like the mid-2000s and it's still being debated in the Congress and by the SEC if it's a security or not. And this is seven and eight years after the token has been functioning with a multi-billion dollar market value. So. Um, I mentioned this because crypto assets is a very important part of the metaverse because they're all interconnected, intertwined at some point. The same goes for NFTs, which I think is a very important and pivotal gateway to get into the metaverse. So um, another thing to notice, because we're going to be talking about a lot of use cases, is the difference between Web2 companies entering the metaverse, like Meta. We saw how that ended because they pumped in billions of dollars and then they ultimately had to shut down their program. Um, but we also see native Web3 companies that with the boom of crypto and tech started. And an example here is Yuga Labs, which own possibly the biggest NFT um, brands in the world like Bored Apes, uh, CryptoPunks, um, and uh, Bored Kennel, I think. So yeah, the biggest are owned by them. And they're actually using NFTs very interesting because they're building a whole metaverse called The Other Side. And the NFTs are essentially going to be a gateway to enter the metaverse. This is also in line with the definition that I think most people have said, although I still feel the metaverse is more of a concept than an actual thing because it's, it's not something that just came a couple years ago. It's been pondered about in like different sci-fi movies, but it's only gaining traction now because after the NFT, um, you can say the NFT narrative came out somewhere in 2019, 20, the metaverse came right after. And also, this is also no brainer because the two are very closely linked together, which is why we have a lot of different academics and authors and like even um, people in the field trying to give a definition. So, um, yeah, so I think the metaverse is not like a single event. I think it's, it should exist in the plural because it's, it's not a single world, it's a culmination of different worlds and concepts that collide. Um, also to set the premise, I've not noticed um, the fact of the open versus the closed metaverse being mentioned before. I think that's very important because um, they do exist and it will make a difference in how regulator, regulators actually look at it. So for the context of our paper, we've actually kept it or limited it to the open metaverse because it makes more sense because the closed metaverse uh, will have to have its own regulations and will have its own set of challenges, but the open metaverse is the preferred choice here because it's more interoperable and people can move between different worlds seamlessly. So um, there was another quote by Gantner that in 2026, about 25% uh, of users will spend an hour in the metaverse. I don't necessarily hold this statement to be true because I think the biggest limiting factor or the barrier to entry is access to the metaverse. Because um, in Web3, which essentially uses the internet, all you need is a computer and a self-custodian wallet to start off with. But I think in the metaverse, for people to actually be able to use their avatars. They need maybe a headset, which I don't think everybody would want to put money into because it's still a very nascent field. So people existing in the metaverse, I don't think will still happen at a very accelerated pace than most statistics show because I don't think it's there yet and it's a constantly evolving concept. Um, yeah, so we've seen the evolution of traditional banking and modern banking. So in traditional banking, you had like paper-based services and branch-based activities where uh, a person had to go in person to maybe open a bank account, get a check deposited, and use other banking facilities, which is also very limited in terms of accessibility. 
But with the use of the internet um, and modern banking as we know it, you have online mobile banking, you have a 24 seven service, you have a customer support, and you can use it pretty much in any part of the world in a, in a couple seconds. So we've seen that evolution, which has largely revolutionized uh, the concept of banking. And we also see fintech companies that are actively not exactly banks, they're like fintech companies as the name suggests, but they do in some jurisdictions end up getting a banking license because the services that they offer do end up being uh, those of banking services. Um, another thing that you have to consider when you look at banking law in the metaverse is the concept of CBDCs and stable coins, which are largely emerging. And um, this is very promising, but they come with their own set of issues. So stable coins as we know it right now um, are coins that are ideally pegged to a stable currency. The biggest ones are pegged to the dollar, so you have like USDC, you have USDT, you have BUSDA. All of these are actually controlled and owned by private companies so far. So Paxos is the largest issuer so far. Circle also is uh, the issue of USDC stablecoin. Um, although the coins are ideally supposed to be pegged to the dollar, we have seen events in the last couple of weeks where the, the, the stablecoins have actually de-pegged, which means that they've actually lost value. And these are just by certain catalysts in the market, such as um, the USDC coin very specifically depacked to 0.87 on the dollar. So you actually lost value just by holding the coin and doing nothing. And this was, um, this happened because of the collapse of the massive banks in the US, the two big banks in the US, SVB and uh, Silvergate Bank. But it did repeg initially. Um, so stable coins are an interesting concept to be seen in the metaverse, but c there's more dialogue about CBDCs being used in the metaverse, which I don't really think makes sense again. Because as the name suggests, the central bank digital currencies are issued by a central banking regulator, where in the metaverse, it's not really, it doesn't really make sense because you have different jurisdictions which have different central banks that govern the whole banking and finance system. And if they go ahead and offer their own CBDCs, the users will be in a bit of a fix of uh, what to use because um, if you have an open metaverse, I mentioned that there has to be interoperability, and I think this would pose a massive issue because you can't have, mass, you have, you can't have um, too many CBDCs on the market that uh, will essentially lead to no, um, will basically not make sense. Um, yeah, another thing I think that CBDCs should have is that it should exist both online and offline for it to actually make sense. Right now, um, most countries which Anupul touch upon, um, the CBDCs are still in the pilot concept, which means Different countries have sandboxes, regulatory sandboxes that uh, the central banks are trying to test it out and see if it actually makes sense. But in simple terms, and as the way the concept exists now, it's just a tokenized form of um, the national currency of the country. So yeah, like I said, uh, the biggest issue of why you can't really have banking regulations in the metaverse is because in most jurisdictions you have a central, centralized regulator, such as a bank, but the problem of um, different metaverses colliding, if you have a closed metaverse, is going to be a massive issue. Um, the other thing is that the metaverse doesn't really have any geographical boundaries, and it has many virtual environments that essentially collide or exist together. So I'm really curious of, um, to see how regulators will actually make laws for this, because um, they're still not clear on what the technology that currently exists, which is blockchain and crypto, because there's still a lot of dialogue. And very few countries have actually gone to the limit of enacting a bill which has actually passed the law. Uh, one of the countries is, I think, the UAE, because I've worked in the jurisdiction. They have the VARA law, which is the Virtual Asset Regulator Authority. Um, this is a very forward-thinking law, because um, there have been certain definitions set globally by uh, the, C the FATF, which is the definition of a virtual currency and um, a virtual asset service provider. And most countries will have no other choice than to make their own laws which have definitions that are in line with the global definition because if two different countries look at the same um, asset or look at the same token in different perspectives, it's gonna be an issue because again, like you guessed, um, it just will not fit in together. Um, lastly, from my part, um, you can clearly see the difference between um, a real world centralized regulation and a potential metaverse regulation for banking. So in the real world, you have a clear jurisdiction where you have geographical boundaries, um, everything's set in black and white. 
you have established legal frameworks and you have enforcement mechanisms where authorities for the, for the specific uh, jurisdiction can enforce the regulations through fines, penalties, and legal actions. But in the metaverse, this does pose to be a bit of an issue because you have, a, you have an undefined jurisdiction because it's the metaverse. You can access it from any part of the world as long as you have the tools to access it. Um, there are evolving frameworks, but it might not fit exactly into the existing frameworks because as we've seen from the many uh, sessions that we've had, um, there is a lot of dialogue going on which is mimicking the existing real world laws to the metaverse because um, you know, there are a lot of concepts that overlap but I don't think it's going to be as simple as that because we have to go back to the question of is it even possible to regulate anything in the metaverse because it's still a concept and it's evolving. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about this concept where, uh, of decentralization and self-governance. So um, Metaverse also uses a blockchain-based system uh, for the governance structures. And here, I think the concept of DAOs became become really important. So DAOs, in short, are decentralized autonomous organizations. And this is true decentralization because it lets people who are part of the network or who are part of a system to vote for answers which completely restricts the use of a centralized entity of, or a centralized body to take decisions. So these will be something to watch out in the metaverse because if there is even dialogue for regulation in the metaverse, I think DAOs are going to become really important. So I think Anup will uh, talk about a couple of use cases and thank you for listening. Can I use this? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Larry. Thanks, Michelle, for inviting us for this conference. Uh, like my colleague Sunil stated, uh, we want to bring about a lot more practical and pragmatic approach to dealing with the metaverse and different concepts that exist around it. Uh, our area of topic, the presentation that we're doing and the paper we've written, uh, is with respect to banking in the metaverse, right? So, uh, like Sunil stated, uh, banking as a concept has existed for a millennia now. Originally, banks operated in a very traditional ecosystem due to lack of technology, where there was a lot of interpersonal connections between people and uh, bankers built relationships with individuals and that's how they got business done. But then you fast forward to, let's say the dot, dot com era and every single bank wanted to get onto uh, basically the internet in order to maximize their reach and increase profitability. Now what this led to was uh, a lack of personal relationships that bankers could build with consumers. And due to this, uh, there, uh, uh, an aspect of that interpersonal connections lacking uh, led to uh, uh, a lot of loss of revenue to uh, a lot of banks. And uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, correct this, a potential that exists is in order for these banks to get onto the metaverse, where it's still going to be digitalized, People can access it across the world, but there still would be a possibility for interpersonal connections to be built between the bankers. And uh, with respect to this, uh, there are a bunch of use cases that have come up uh, over the last few years with respect to uh, a couple of big banks that have gotten onto the metaverse. So uh, one of the biggest banks, JP Morgan, got onto Decentraland uh, in 2021. And in fact, they opened a lounge called Onyx in the Metajuku Mall uh, in the virtual world. Now, uh, what's interesting to note is there's a, there's a portrait of their CEO, J Jamie Demon on, on that lounge. And uh, like Sunil stated, uh, a lot of these banks, even though they, 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 they are getting onto the metaverse right now, there's no real use case that exists because regulations don't exist for having banking across the globe uh, and uh, to tackle events which I will deal with uh, a little further uh, with respect to say KYC, AML, uh, countering any aspects of finance of terrorism etc. Uh, another bank that's also 
gotten onto the metaverse is HSBC, uh, which has gotten onto the sandbox in order to allow uh, uh, its users and consumers to engage with online sports fans and uh, esports enthusiasts, right? And working in India, uh, we've dealt with a lot of startups. And uh, like Sunil stated, uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between Web 2 companies and Web 3 companies getting onto the metaverse. And uh, the difference is a lot of fintech companies, uh, a company that proclaims itself as the bank of the metaverse called Zelf, uh, basically wants to allow uh, consumers to um, take uh, money from the real world and use it in the virtual world for in-game purchases. So there are a lot of financial and fintech companies that are coming up in this space that want to get into the, uh, I mean, want to revolutionize banking in the metaverse. But at this stage of time, there isn't much that has happened. And um, like I stated, a couple of key aspects uh, that have to be kept in mind with respect to banking specifically uh, in the metaverse is uh, the KYC and AML regulations. So KYC as a concept exists across uh, pretty much all jurisdictions in the world where centralized banks require retail banks uh, to know their customer in order to ensure that there's no fraud that happens uh, between customers uh, so that they don't get duped by various vendors, etc. And in order to have uh, compliances with their local legislations, right? And uh, the other aspect is uh, anti-money laundering, where every jurisdiction has its own uh, specific legislation, which deals with how uh, they can counter any aspect of money laundering. And uh, the FATF and the IOSCO in order to prevent any aspects of terrorism or drug trafficking, etc., ensures that uh, there is no uh, bank which can take up money from consumers unless it abides by certain AML and KYC regulations. Now, the very concept of metaverse being decentralized and eventually cryptocurrencies being used on the metaverse basically defies this very aspect of KYC and AML which is why we've taken a very pragmatic approach in our paper uh, to deal with the fact that uh, banking right now in the metaverse cannot truly be regulated. Uh, at this moment of time, yes, it could because traditional companies are dealing with it on the metaverse, but once, it, once technology develops and the uh, aspects of metaverse is truly adopted by the general consumer, it might become much harder and of course law would definitely need to evolve in order to tackle the new technologies that exist. Uh, another aspect um, that uh, I need to uh, deal with is uh, or certain statistics that we came across was there are 100 plus metaverses that are active or under development as of date, right? Now, how each metaverse is going to interact with one another, uh, that's a question that still needs to be addressed. As of 2021, uh, $501 million worth of real estate transactions have occurred over the metaverse. And uh, I think in 2022, uh, in New York, a person took a mortgage worth $45,000 in order to buy land on the metaverse. So clearly there are certain use cases that uh, uh, have come up and that, you know, has been backed because uh, clearly banks do understand that there is a large potential uh, uh, to the metaverse. So just to conclude uh, with respect to our paper, like we stated, we've taken a very practical and pragmatic approach. We understand that uh, basis our research that ultimately metaverse is inevitable, right? It is, it is the future because uh, technology, you can't stop technology from growing and evolving. Now, but as, as of this moment, a fully developed metaverse that is decentralized and uh, powered by an entirely new technology, it's still an idea and it's, it's, it's not truly a reality. Uh, and uh, the last statement is, yeah, we, we definitely do not have adequate laws and procedures to deal with 
many legal issues, be it on the consumer front, being it on, be it on uh, money laundering, uh, in 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 the meta banking reality. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you indeed, uh, and open Sunil. Um, well, actually, it made me think about, uh, um, in part, your, your uh, presentation. You know, a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, you remember that uh, you know Facebook had the project of the li Libra, Libra. You know, the the currency, and and he met uh, you know several central bank bankers around, that, and yeah, <laughs> it kind of didn't work. But it, it, back in those years, you know, you would think. Uh, you know, with the three, two billion uh, members of Facebook and so on, if there is consensus among this community, you know, to rely on an alternative currency and so on, so, yeah, it can be a, pr a pretty big experience. And then you can develop, uh, of course, your own banking system and, uh, and whatever. So, But thank you very much indeed. Uh, there is time for questions now. Uh, yeah. So I have a question. This would be for Enrico. Yeah. Uh, Enrico and <clears throat> Rish Shab. Uh, it seems like there's a really important part of your paper that is missing, and that is that most trademark law, most especially, I guess I'm more focused in the area of image rights is really to protect celebrities and famous people. In trademark, you have the idea that it's based on economic value. There's got to be some sort of economic value that trademarks protect. And in publicity rights and image rights, it's generally the old kind of uh, litigations involving, once again, the use of a famous person's image or caricatures or voice, that sort of stuff. And they have also an heightened right to privacy, not to be spied upon and stuff like that. And what to me the, makes the metaverse different is the ordinary person, right, who creates an avatar and unique to them, but probably of absolutely no economic value. But still, it's a creative type of thing that they want to keep control of and to have rights over. And I don't see anything in existing law, trademark or image rights. Uh, so either trademark law has to be expanded or we need a completely different legal regime. Once again, the issue is just an average person creating something in the metaverse. What law protects that? Can I, can I add one thing to, yeah. to exactly that? Um, you upload your photo and the avatar is created by the relevant platform. So, you know, who, whose right is it if it is based on your portrait, but it is generated by the AI of the relevant site? And I would like to have that avatar for me, just for me, and not you. You're getting with a or whatever photo, getting a similar. My point is, did you think about that? Because that is. And the other thing to add is, you know, um, you can choose your clothes and your things. And what if there's three stripes there? Is it then an infringement of the? Um, uh, of the platform generating the clothes? Is it me wearing it? I mean, it, I, I think I know the answer to that, but I, 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 <laughs> do you discuss it in the paper? I mean, image rights, in theory, are for everybody, right? For any kind of person. But the cases we have witnessed in other, you know, in the real life uh, world is that, you know, celebrities take action because they have uh, huge damages claim to, 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 to claim. So the case law we have witnessed that, you know, re relates regards celebrities, basically. 
uh, also in uh, in UAK we had passing off actions and you know these famous people uh, took action but in theory image rights can be enforced by anybody but uh, so, but it's not going to be enforced, right? Because of what you just said, the economies, the econ economics, there's no real economic value there to protect, per se. It could be some avatar could become very, like, like a content provider or persona on the internet and generate revenues and would want to be protected. So do we need more of a system like we have with domain names where you can register your, uh, your mm -hmm. avatar, you could register your avatar uh, without any costs, and at least, you know, uh, someone before they could use that avatar would have to get your permission. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a major uh, a change could be foreseen in trademark law more than in major rights law. Uh, well, that's my feeling. That's my feeling that. Trademark law might need to be updated to for this new platform, but image rights are still for everybody. Of course, we may want to facilitate enforcement for normal people, right? And uh, yes, there might be some tweaks in the legislation for allowing normal people to for long, to, to make their action more, you know, easy to do, and uh, because they might also lack an economic incentive, as you said, right? Because, you know, the damages that I can get if they copy my image for the other are minimal as opposed to, you know, it's the, psycho it's the psychological harm. It's not economic harm. This is my creation. This is my persona. I'm attached to it. Now yeah. somebody else is using it. But so so uh, it seems like you need some sort of government regulation where the government would enforce not the private individual because that just doesn't work. Mm. I just wanted to add then, we come back to what we were saying yesterday about, in my opinion, about the possibility of qualifying the avatar as, as a personal, a part of the personal identity or digital identity of the person. Then if we, if we argue that, then there should be a protection against others using the avatar or against somebody infringing the sort of the, the sort of image or whatever of the avatar and that would be the, the sort of general protection against that i believe yeah and i think in continental european countries image rights are already strongly protected uh, rather than in common law jurisdiction for example in the uk not us but in the uk and ireland we use passing off but you need to demonstrate that uh, you know there has been uh, uh, goodwill, uh, misrepresentation, and damage. Not the trinity there, and so that might be difficult for normal people, because of course Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi, they already it's easy for them to demonstrate uh, goodwill, uh, misrepresentation, and damages. But for a normal person, that's that's more difficult. So I guess in common law jurisdiction, where you know. In the U.S. it's different because there are you know, public, strong publicity rights, but in the U.K. and Ireland, no. So I guess in those countries we need uh, a, more, uh, a more significant change, legislative change. But in continental European countries and U.S., I mean, I, I already know that major rights are already strongly protected. Of course, we can and we could facilitate uh, this action for normal people by tweaking the legislation. That's, that's, that's something that we want to also deal with in, our, in the final version of our paper, yes. I gotta ask another question. So the other question is, you know, McDonald, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think with regard to image rights, um, you need to look at the context if Web2 companies do it or Web3 companies do it, because the concept of avatars is not something new. Games have had it for years, like if you play The Sims or if you play any of the game, you spend at least 30 minutes when you turn on the game setting up your avatar, which is a preset model of different skin tones, different hair types, eyelashes, it goes to very specific details. So there is a chance of overlapping avatars in the space and you can't really do anything about it because it's in the ecosystem of the said entity if it's either the game or the system. But in Web3 companies, this is actually a very remote possibility because, um, again, quoting the example of either the Board Ape or there's another uh, metaverse company called Virtua, which I used to, uh, which is one of my clients. So they started off as an NFT marketplace and they minted about 10,000 randomly generated images 
So there's zero percent chance of it overlapping on two images looking the same because the way the NFTs are programmed is because it's randomized. Um, its value is also based on the rarity of certain items. So all of this is in code and two NFTs will never be the same. And if these NFTs are actually avatars that are used in the metaverse, there is no chance of overlapping or another person be, being able to use your image or identity, you see? So there is a clear distinction in that aspect. So this really won't apply for Web3 companies. While I have you, I'll ask you a question. Sure. Uh, for the novices in this field, you mentioned closed and open metaverses. Mm -hmm. is, is the analogy uh, public blockchain versus private blockchains, or is it just completely something different? It's, yeah, you can say it's just either a closed or an open ecosystem. Like a closed metaverse, a clear example is Meta, where you can use... Yeah, yeah. It's it can be used only in an ecosystem that the infrastructure is built for. Like Meta is the best example. Um, an open metaverse, the uh, possibility is endless. I don't really think I've seen an open metaverse, which is why it's a concept that is still getting a lot of traction. Um, it could also be a culmination of different entities coming together and making a massive metaverse that is interoperable, because that's the key word for the definition of an open metaverse. So. Maybe a similar example, which I can maybe quote from a crypto asset point of view, is a utility token, where the purpose of the token is only within the ecosystem it's built. Or say, if you look at another example of airline miles, you can only use it for the specific airline. I mean, you do have airlines that merge and you can swap and do stuff, but you get the point. It's, you can use it only for the ecosystem it's built in. Okay, thank you. I think we're done, right? Or well. In the U.S., no? Cele uh, publicity rights in the U.S. are strongly protected for celebrities. You know that not just the likeness. Yeah, every protect The voice. Yeah. Elvis Presley. There have been some cases right. about uh, right. Elvis Presley voice and Elvis Presley's way of uh, uh, clothing. Yes. So, sozia. So, I guess for celebrities, it might not be too difficult to, to enforce their rights on the metaverse. No. Taking into account these strong cases, look, which I also have criticized in other, in other papers because, in my opinion, it's... It's too broad, I mean, to expand the image rights, to cover voices, the, the, the sozia or the way of uh, dressing, I, I, but that's another, another question. But for normal people, I agree. For normal people, it's more difficult. Um, yeah, could, could you save the, the question, Yanni, for uh, the, the break, maybe? Yeah, so, yeah, actually, we, uh, we, we, we have two last presentations, but a, a short break as well. So what I can uh, well, thank you very much again to, uh, to the, the four, five uh, of you, uh, six, actually. Um, so I, what we could do is grab a coffee and something to eat if you want and come back. Maybe uh, you know in a few minutes back, and so we 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 can have the the last two presentations. So pre please feel free to come back as soon as possible with your coffee, with your croissant, brioche, and whatever, and uh, and we'll resume uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Pietro, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you see Great. me or not? I see the whole room. It's quite oh, dark. Okay. Yeah, we're connected. It's nice, nice seeing you again. Likewise. You like, Likewise. Uh, you look a little tired to me. <laughs> yes, I am. Like, uh, <laughs> like you have a newborn child that you're Indeed. Indeed. sleeping you up. Okay, <laughs> keeping you up. All right. So uh, I think our final little panel here is just two presentations. Um, I actually, Peter. Uh, Pietro is the first one to go, and I'm uh, just going to say a few words about him. Uh, I have a little, a little note here, but I've known uh, Pietro for a while, and uh, he co-edited a book with some of us, and he did uh, most of the work, I have to admit. He was very, 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 very good partner. You have to choose your partners wisely, as my mother said to me at one time. So uh, that's the important. And Pietro is a great partner when it comes to uh, scholarship and doing books and things. 
For whatever reason, I can't find what I'm looking for. Oh, there it is. Uh, so Pietro is a the professor of digital conflict re resolution. I mean, that in and of itself is cool. You know what I mean? It's, it's specific, it's tech savvy, like that uh, chair that he has or title. At Redboud University in the Netherlands, he has acted as an expert for the European Parliament and the European Commission. He has published in many international journals, including the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, the Journal of International Dispute Settlement, and the Leiden Journal of International Law. And he's just an overall great guy. So I turn it over to Pietro. Thank you so much, Larry. Well, after this, I can only disappoint the audience, of course, but thanks a lot to you, to Michelle, for having me. I'm really sorry I cannot be there in person, but I'll try to make it worth your while via Teams. Um, I have a, a very ambitious topic and a very vague topic, as the entire uh, theme of the metaverse risks to be sometimes. That is to say, dispute resolution in the metaverse. And I echo what Matea was mentioning before the break, that is to say, it's very tough to give precise legal answers given how uncertain the whole idea of the metaverse is at the moment, even more than smart contracts, for example. So before jumping into the topic of um, dispute resolution, in the first part of my very short presentation, I will try to ask and reflect on four basic questions on what the metaverse is. And I will echo many of the ideas that we discussed yesterday and earlier uh, today, because I think this general background is necessary to then situate the specific problems of dispute resolution and the open questions that we have with respect to dispute resolution. So the first question uh, that we already mentioned earlier today is whether we should decline this word, the metaverse, in the singular or in the plural. In other words, at the moment we have certain examples of what the metaverse could look like in the future, certain iterations of the metaverse to come, so to speak, especially in the world of gaming. But the question is whether in the future we will have one single metaverse like we have, at least in some parts of the world, one single internet, right? Uh, the idea is that if you have different siloed, isolated, walled gardens, iterations of the metaverse, then you have a lock-in of users within one specific instantiation of the metaverse. And on the other hand, if you want to have one single integrated metaverse, you need interoperability rules, compatibility, so that users can freely roam the entire unified space, so to speak. That sounds very abstract, but I think it has some important implications when it comes to dispute resolution. The second question, the second doubt on the table is whether uh, in the long run, the metaverse will become integrated with the real world or it will remain kind of an escapist space like video games, for example. Well, uh, take the example of the Catholic University of Lyon. The question for them could be, will they be on the metaverse? Will they provide education on the metaverse? Take the example of the Hospital of Lyon. Will they uh, provide certain healthcare services on the metaverse? Take the example of a museum in Lyon. Will they maybe have a collection of digital arts that can be accessed on the metaverse? So in other words, the question is whether real life institutions and the real world as a whole will uh, extend its activities to the metaverse and progressively the two worlds will integrate each other or not. Once again, this is not something we know yet. So these are open questions that have a, a reflection and effect on the topic of dispute resolution. The third interrelated question is whether the metaverse will remain an entirely private endeavor, like for example, a private company creating a video game or creating a virtual space with digital assets circulating on a blockchain, for example, or whether progressively public uh, institutions will also uh, access this space. And that is, of course, uh, relevant from many points of view, but from the, from the point of view of dispute resolution, of course, raises the question of what is the role of public uh, dispute resolution institutions, such as courts, for example. 
And the last question I would like to briefly mention before uh, going to the topic of uh, dispute resolution is the question of intermediation. Now, at a very basic level, the metaverse is at the very least a stack of technologies, a set of technologies, both software and hardware technologies, probably in the long, long, long run. And on top of that, it is a set of experiences. For example, uh, a metaverse university or a metaverse game or a metaverse museum or a metaverse hospital and so on. Now, the question that is relevant for the purpose of dispute resolution, I think, is whether in between these two layers, there is an intermediary la layer of platforms putting the users in touch with the experiences using the technology. And even though I haven't mentioned the name yet, of course, the mind runs to Meta that uh, rebranded as Meta exactly for the purposes of uh, extending its services to the Metaverse and essentially uh, profiling themselves as an intermediary of the space, just like they have successfully profiled themselves as intermediaries of internet-based communications with social media like Facebook and Instagram. So is there an intermediary layer of intermediation indeed or not? That is another open question that we don't know the answer to just yet. Why are those questions interesting for dispute resolution, from a dispute resolution perspective? I think because depending on how you answer those questions, you want to build the metaverse in a certain way or in a different way, right? And whatever your preferred answer will be, different companies will have different preferences, of course, different rules will become necessary. And this is a point I would like to drive home. I think when it comes to building the metaverse, it's not just a matter of developing technology, it is also a matter of developing rules. So the legal aspect, the legal component is not an afterthought. It's not that the metaverse is created and as a result of it, then interesting legal problems come to the fore. That of course is true. But on top of that, my point is more radical. You cannot build the metaverse. You cannot answer those questions, those basic questions, without rules. So making rules is a constitutive element of the metaverse. Let me give you a couple of examples. It sounds otherwise too abstract. Let's suppose that you want uh, the metaverse to be plural. So a number of walled gardens, a number, number of siloed iterations of the metaverse, each of which is not compatible with each other. Well, you need rules to prevent one metaverse to bleed into other metaverses. For example, you need to lock in your users with software and hardware that is incompatible with other metaverses. But to a certain extent, to avoid compatibility, you also need legal rules preventing interoperability. And that might be uh, contractual rules, for example, terms of services preventing somebody from using a digital asset outside of a certain iteration of the metaverse, or it could be IP, but whatever that is, those barriers against uh, integration are not only technical, they are also legal barriers. On the other hand, if you want to build one single global metaverse that integrates all of these examples that we have at the moment, you also need rules. And we know that already from the experience of social media. Now, if, if you look at social media, progressively companies have acknowledged that to have a global platform with users from all over the world, all over the free world participating in it, you need also global rules. For example, a global understanding of freedom of expression, of what type of speech is allowed on a platform or is not allowed on a platform. So in other words, building the metaverse is not only building technology, it is also building rules. And here is where, in my opinion, dispute resolution will become very important because the uh, mechanism for the creation of those rules will likely be very often judicial lawmaking. It will be through dispute resolution. And I will give you a couple of uh, thoughts on this topic, uh, covering both public law aspects and private law aspects. Don't worry, just in a few minutes, and then I, I, I uh, leave the floor to the next speaker. Um, starting with public law, how do you make those rules and why do you need those rules? Where, well, 
We have already mentioned that in the ambitions of those who see in the future a very advanced and integrated metaverse, all sorts of services will be provided on the metaverse and all sorts of public goods will be uh, delivered through the metaverse. For example, education, healthcare, culture, entertainment, and the list goes on. Uh, so unavoidably, if such a global uh, space is going to be built, different difficult questions will come to the fore. For example, is there a right to education on the metaverse? Is there a right to healthcare on the metaverse? Do they look the same as the offline counterparts or are they different or they simply do not exist? Well, we don't have the answer to those questions, but I would say, especially if somebody wants to profile themselves as an intermediary, like Meta probably wants to do, right? So essentially putting users in touch with experiences and those experiences might be an education experience, a healthcare experience, and the list goes on they will need an answer to those questions. They will need to a certain extent to make difficult decisions on fundamental rights. And we have already seen this with social media. Eventually, Meta acknowledged that if you run a global platform, you do adjudicate difficult freedom of expression cases. And they acknowledged that to such an extent that they uh, set up their own external body to review complaints about the content moderation decision that they make, called the Oversight Board. Now, the Oversight Board is a small but very interesting experience. It was initially conceived as a Supreme Court for Facebook. And the idea is that uh, essentially a global platform cannot escape its adjudicative role. Uh, they need to make difficult decisions. They need to make tough calls on freedom of expression, for example, whether Donald Trump is allowed on the platform or not. And to uh, do it consistently, you need rules, you need global rules. And those global rules in the absence of global democratic institutions are developed uh, by way of case law, by way of precedent. And that's exactly what the Oversight Board has been entrusted to do, to develop a body of precedent guiding the decision of the company on difficult cases. Now, if companies like Meta have the ambition of extending their activities to all sorts of problems, so not only online freedom of expression, but also online provision of services such as healthcare, education, museum, culture, and the list goes on, the same question will uh, become even more important, right? And I think uh, in the absence of democratic lawmaking institutions, the only way forward is dispute resolution. It is building a transnational body of precedent to govern those issues. You might think this is very science fiction and theoretical, but if you read the uh, yearly report of the Oversight Board, they already mentioned this. They already write that they noticed how Facebook rebranded into Meta and is trying to transition to the metaverse. And they are thinking of ways to extend their jurisdiction, so to speak. Of course, I'm using these words improperly because the Oversight Board is not a court, to the metaverse. And how to produce a body of precedent guiding the choices of the company with respect to the metaverse. So it's a very interesting time to be alive, if you will, because the questions that arise and will arise if the metaverse is to be built are huge and we don't have huge global lawmaking institutions to get the job done. So I think dispute resolution will be the space to watch. Let me uh, also briefly touch upon private relations, private law. Now, what we see, and we have seen it already for quite some time, is that as uh, increasingly a number of assets becomes digital or digitalized, uh, there are increasing spaces of self-enforcing adjudication, self-enforcing private dispute resolution. Traditionally, private dispute resolution has always existed, and we call it arbitration mostly, and uh, arbitrators have the possibility to resolve private disputes that are arbitrable, but traditionally they do not have the power to coercively enforce the decision in the absence of spontaneous uh, cooperation and uh, compliance. So what an arbitrator can do is issue an award and then in the absence of compliance, the court uh, and the uh, enforcement authorities of the place of enforcement 
uh, offer under certain very specific conditions the service of recognition and enforcement. So they execute this decision. And that has to do, of course, with the state monopoly over the use of force. Now, with digitalization, that monopoly is partially crumbling because it is increasingly possible to devise private forms of adjudication where the outcome is enforced not by a public authority, but by means of technology itself. We saw it already with blockchain, with digital assets, with smart contracts, for example. And of course, if the metaverse is to become an equivalent of our real world, at least to, for certain purposes and to a certain extent, for those purposes, the technology will allow the coercive allocation of disputed assets in the absence of the involvement of any state authority. And that, to me, raises a very worrisome but interesting question, that is, how do you guarantee the due process of those procedures if those procedures will never be reviewed by a court ever? Why? Because traditionally, the due process of arbitration is uh, controlled in a number of ways, but the most important one probably is the validity of the award and the recognition and enforcement of the award. If the uh, right to be heard, for example, was not guaranteed, a court or another enforcement authority of the place of enforcement will deny recognition and enforcement, right? But if recognition and enforcement happens automatically, then you don't have the check anymore. And do you need to build, as a lawmaker, a different type of check, a different type of control? I think we're already seeing this a little bit in Europe with the Digital Services Act. The Digital Services Act doesn't concern the metaverse. It concerns uh, social media and online content. And it builds a number of procedural guarantees and procedural avenues for complaints against a con uh, content moderation decision, exactly because the lawmaker realized there is some due process to be injected in these procedures that are private, but they do deal with very important legal entitlements. And I think a challenge for all of us is, do we need the same for the metaverse? How do we get it done? That is an open question, of course. I cannot give you the answer to that question today, but I think the locus of decision making in the future will be distinctively adjudicative. It will be dispute resolution. And so I'm biased, of course, because as Larry said, I'm a professor of digital conflict resolution, but I think that is a space to watch with extreme interest. Uh, I hope I kept it to my uh, allocated time. I thank you once again very much for uh, your attention. Sorry I'm not there in person, but great to see you all on Teams. Thank you, Pietro. Uh, so now we've saved the best for last, of course, a very exciting but difficult topic called applicable law that's going to be presented by Cecile Pellegrini, who is an associate professor at this fine university. Uh, she has an LLM from Penn, but is it Penn State or the University of Pennsylvania? U Penn. Well, you, you should put U Penn. I should. Yeah, you know, because but that's I don't want to brag. elite people. Where, you know, you, we say U Penn. Uh, so, which is of course one of America's great law schools. Uh, well, a top there's five, a, six, seven. Number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she passed the New York bar on the seventh time. No, I just added that. <laughs> uh, I just either. sorry. Uh, it's been a long weekend, you know and the Paris Bar. Uh, her areas of expertise is European private law, European consumer law, and digital contract law. So I turn it over to her and uh, apologize for being the last one to go. One but, but it's your boss who set the schedule. Nice. I want you to know that. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, of course, in my turn, I would like to thank you, uh, Michelle and Larry, uh, for organizing uh, this event, who were united experts on this hot topic, that is Metaverse. Uh, it's a heavy task for me to keep you interested at this point of the conference. Um, 
not repeat things that have been said already, um, and I tried to do my, my best. I made a PowerPoint with a lot of funny stuff, hopefully that will keep you focused. And also already I must say that Larry's socks made my day since I saw your beautiful flamingos. <laughs> so this is fun already. Uh, although I, uh, international private law is not that fun, uh, let's dig in. So you, um, this, this journey, this journey through metaverse uh, arrived to its end. And I'm the last speaker of these two days. And from the previous contribution, we can already infer that metaverse is not uh, just a hot and trendy topic, but an absolutely necessary one to address. Uh, and uh, it raises many legal questions, uh, but among them, uh, with all the contributions already, maybe the first question to ask is what is uh, applicable law? Uh, the question uh, that Michel and Larry entrusted me with today. Uh, so to start with, uh, Metaverse appears uh, international by essence. Uh, as it is virtually accessible from any place in the world, and as we all know, there is no international system or international court that covers all legal topics and which would magically answer and cover the legal questions arising out of the metaverse. Therefore, the topic is huge. The topic is immense. Uh, in the very absence of an hypothetical international private law treaty, which would be more likely than uh, any uniform rules of law on these issues, it is the mechanism of private international law Peel that offer the key. This meta law for the metaverse uh, will help pointing at first the competent uh, international judge on one hand and point at the applicable law uh, that the said competent judge, the so called for or forum, will apply. Uh, although I just wanted to mention what I just what I said mentioned yesterday already, there is a, a work in progress regarding NFTs. Uh, I chose to take a European uh, international private law perspective as there is no international worldwide private international law, even though there are a few conventions. So I took the perspective of the harmonized international private law, the European one. And also I will focus on the uh, civil and commercial matter since I cannot go through all the topics. So international private law International private law is a law of characterization. You know, we get interested in what are we talking about? What is this object? And also a law of localization. So I use these two perspectives to address the unavoidable meeting between applicable law and metaverse. What for international private law is the metaverse? So don't worry, uh, to start with, we won't go over the whole definition or history of the metaverse as it's already been produced previously addressed by uh, contributors, but uh, for the moment, let's just agree on the fact that there is no legal definition of the metaverse, um, and rather there are some common features uh, defined by different experts which do not even always agree between them. So this word, this metaverse word, appears to be a catch-all term for the technologies that point to this sort of virtual immersive uh, experiences. So, good, let's go back to that crucial question. Is there one or is there many metaverses? Um, when we are trying to consider the law applicable to metaverse, we're not sure whether to address the metaverse as a whole or the metaverse operators or the various situations arising from or in the metaverse. So metaverse could either be seen as a platform, that's, that's something that is uh, currently uh, uh, in, in, uh, in everyone's mouth, it was shown yesterday by, by uh, Christina Bonsibu and uh, Luigi Cantizani, or it could be seen as the future uh, internet or web tree, depending on whether there is one metaverse or several metaverse. Um, as, as, as we've talked about, the, the metaverse as a single metaverse will be the one that is decentralized, that is unique, and the condition for a unique metaverse is interoperability. Regarding this interoperability doesn't exist yet, but uh, numerous projects are already aiming um, to create a, such a single interoperable virtual universe. Um, for now, 
we do have um, many metaverse, this single, this unique common metaverse, interoperable, called by all the prophetic dystopias and uh, the uh, Silicon Valley actors, it doesn't exist. It just has given way to many virtual worlds remaining un unconnected one to another. And, sorry, and they absolutely not. <laughs> That's the problem of the remote. And so this, uh, this single interval metaverse doesn't exist yet. And we um, rather have many uh, virtual worlds reproducing the economic model of platforms. This single metaverse may nonetheless exist in the future. So I decided to address both cases. In the first place, the idea of the applicable law to metaverse as a platform, and then the question of the applicable law to metaverse as the next internet as the next web point three. So in the first place, the question of the applicable law to metaverse as a platform. A platform, a metaverse are, are contract-based architecture. Well, when you get to, when you try to enter into a metaverse, uh, they often advertise the idea that they will operate with their own rule and related to the laws of a given state because this metaverse is thought of a, as an extraterritorial creation with its own private rules. And for the moment, they behave like platforms uh, with a contract-based architecture and general terms and condition. Usually the user needs to uh, accept these general terms and conditions and uh, uh, it's often a prerequisite, and as a reminder, uh, it's just this click, wrap acceptance is admitted by European law. Although you accept those terms, this doesn't mean that they are valid regarding to European law. If we take a closer look to the choice of law clauses of some of sorry, of some of the existing metaverse, we can observe that the platform's provisions are often drafted in favor of the metaverse self law community rules and they do provide for legal provisions. Uh, when they do, they often uh, point at American jurisdiction or American law, but it is not necessarily valid. They are themselves depending on the applicable international conflict of law applicable rules. Whenever such contract between the user and the platform operator is concluded with a European user, the European consumer, consumer protective rules may apply. As it was reminded just before this morning, uh, consumer contract exists whenever you exchange your data as a counterpart. That's the Directive on Digital Content. And the first uh, consequence of such a B2C relationship will be the protection of private international uh, law rules. Uh, either Brussels one, Rome one, regulations will apply and their protective terms apply. So in the first place, the choice of jurisdiction clause will be limited. According to the Brussels 1 bis regulation, as you can see, a choice of jurisdiction, the competent judge, will be accepted only if the choice, the clause is entered into after the dispute has arisen, so the consumer knows where he stands. Um, and if it gives more choices to the consumer also. Thereby, contracting parties, including a consumer, may only depart from the forum, the protective forum, by an agreement enter after the dispute has arisen. I wanted also to mention that as long as the, the European law will be applicable, the, any national judge will have the duty to examine ex officio the unfairness of such clause. And whenever such clause is not clear enough on the possibilities for the consumer to be protected, it will be deemed unfair and it will be erased. It will not be valid under European law. 
that's the famous uh, VERA Info Consumer Information, the VKI case from 2016. That's for the, the case of a choice of closed, uh, a close of choice of jurisdiction, sorry. So in the absence of a choice of jurisdiction, we go back to, to the default rule. And the default rule is that whenever the consumer is concluding a contract with the metaverse platform, he will benefit from a European jurisdiction. On the condition, nonetheless, that and it can also have, um, be applicable to a uh, company that is not domiciled within the EU, with an American company. How does that work? It's uh, uh, whenever the business is not domiciled in the EU, but by any means direct their activities to the member states or towards different member states. So question will be, does that apply to a metaverse platform? Regarding choice of law and not choice of jurisdiction anymore, the Rome 1 regulation will apply. Here again, there is a protective rule for the uh, law chosen. Anytime that uh, the, there is a uh, first, there is a choice of law, it will be framed by the Rome 1 regulation. Any choice of law made in the metaverse platform general terms and condition will be uh, invalid if it contradicts any mandatory protective rules from the um, place of the consumer residence. So it's not because there is a choice of law in your general terms and condition with the platform that it will apply, that American law will apply, not if there is a consumer, a European user of the platform. Again, very important. You can see the criterion of directing such activities. These consumer protective rules, the, the, the applicable mandatory rules of the consumer will only work if the platform, if the metaverse, if the website for now is directing their activity towards Europe. Very important because now this criteria of directed activity is uh, expanding to many other texts. Um, so that's exactly what I said before, a choice of law may not have the result of depriving the consumer of the protection afforded to him by provision, so provisions that cannot be derogated from by agreements that are mandatory provision, basically all consumer law. European consumer law is all imperative and it will apply. So no choice of law may have the result to deprive any European user from European consumer law. That criterion of directed activity is interpreted the same way between the Brussels 1 regulation, the Rome 1 regulation, and new regulation within Europe using this criteria. It was interpreted by the Court of Justice in the Palmer and Alpenhoff case law. That is a very important one. Um, the question was, if there is a website that is accessible, is this mere accessibility considered as like the website is directing its activity towards Europe? Because, I mean, you know, if you want to interpret directed activity, if you just access the website, is it a directed activity? So the Court of Justice answered that the mere accessibility is insufficient. The website, or the platform in our case, or the metaverse in our case, would need to direct their activity. And to understand that criterion, the court gave a list of, um, of elements to take into account to consider whether that website is directing their activity towards Europe. This has been very criticized because it's blurry and it's not very practical. And what do we do with websites that are not particularly addressed to European consumers or users, but just, you know, .com addressing everyone like Facebook. So this will be the same question with the metaverse. How do we apply this criterion of the directed activity to a metaverse that is not necessarily directing their activity? I, I wanted to go back quickly, but I don't know if I can, to the, con to the general terms and con condition of meta that I uh, shown previously. And Facebook, which became Meta, 
already took into consideration this uh, necessity to address specificities of consumer uh, European law. And so they, they adapted their general terms and condition to explain to the consumer that it benefits from a specific forum, a protective one, and specific uh, consumer law that is protective as well. If they didn't do that, then it would be applicable anyway, and any choice would be invalid. So they took into account European consumer law because they had troubles with, with, with European jurisdiction already. So, question. Is this directed activity applicable to metaverse? If it's not, then any choice of jurisdiction favoring American courts, because 99% uh, of the general terms and conditions hold such a clause, uh, or American law choice, will be valid and will be enforceable. Such decision rendered by a, an American court will then be un legally enforceable in Europe. Besides giving specific protection to European users of online platform, we also see that the, the European framework is now addressed to your platforms operators, even if they're not domiciled within Europe, but directing their activity towards uh, Europe. Whether we can characterize Metaverse as platforms in regard to the DSA, the platform to business regulation, the DMA, my answer would be yes, depending on what activity is at stake. As you can see, the DSA defines a digital platform as a provider of an online marketplace, a social network, a content sharing platform, an app store, a search engine, and it's defined very, very widely. So why not consider the Metaverse platform as such? And again, when does it apply? When will DSA apply to Metaverse platforms? Uh, they use, irrespective of their place of establishment, they will look at whether the services are offered to the recipients that are their place of establishments or are located in the union. And this, unanimously by academics, is interpreted as the directed activity criteria. Once again, if the service is directed towards European Union users, the DSA will apply. Same criterion is used with DMA, GDPR, is etc. We move from international private law to extraterritorial applicability of European text. It's the marketplace approach. The market place approach subject every service that is aimed at EU citizens to the European instrument in question, independently of where the service is hosted or administered. For instance, the DSA or the DMA apply to all services offered to recipients established or located in the EU, and they require just a substantial connection to the union. Here again, it will raise question of interpretation. Where is the substantial connection? Is the activity directed? Same question. The idea for Europe is to create a safe place with European fundamental values respected. And if you cannot have that by international private law rules, you will have that by extraterritorial applicability of European rule. We're just defining our scope of application. Now, very quickly, because I think my time, I have no idea my time, but very quickly, second hypothesis. We do now have this huge single metaverse, and uh, it's interoperable. It's like the web point, point three, so we don't have a real intermediary. We don't have a platform with obligation to set, that we can set to it. So what would be the applicable law to metaverse as web point, point three? Private international law is a law of localization. Savini's method is choosing among the law, how we choose among many laws applicable to an international situation. We regard, we analyze the nature of the legal question, of the legal situation at stake, and we deduce which element locates it. 
which, did, which determines the legal order which, which it objectively presents the most significant links. So we call connecting factors. We take a situation, we locate it with a legal system with connecting factors. These connecting factors usually are materials, they're territorials. Just a quick, uh, a quick bracket, we could think first that we would have international private law dedicated to internet or to virtual world. We don't because of the principle of technological neutrality. There are no specific rules because technology is evo evolving, so we want to have like neutral rules and they will evolve with the, the technology. But this also it can be criticized because sometimes we need dedicated rules. So cyberspace, when we go back to these methods used by international private law of localization, cyberspace is not a territory. How do we link a situation created in the cyberspace with any national legal system? We have difficulty, hard time localizing the seat of any situation created in the metaverse because metaverse is beyond the universe, it's beyond any national territory. A few examples that can be taken, because I cannot go over any connecting factor that we use in international private law. When for contract law, for provisions of service, the criterion used to define a national legal system will be the place of delivery. What if you have a contract between two avatars deciding that the place of delivery is the metaverse itself? No place of delivery, no connection to any territorial. Although we could say that there is nothing new, nothing new with these questions, because the, 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 the previous immateriality of internet situation already confronted international private rules with difficulties. So we already had to adapt our connecting factors with fictitious localization. So we've already met, there is a sensation of déjà vu, because this problem of immateriality of situation happened before we used fictitious localization. What does it mean? It means that instead of using the place of damage, for example, there is no place of damage if the damage is online, we move towards the people from one side to another of the online communication. So we moved from material or geographical connection to more personal connection. We use the people, but using the people with the metaverse confront international private law to a new level of difficulty. First of all, avatars, anonymity. How do you, co do you connect uh, personal, connect how do you connect any person, and this goes uh, with everything that was said before, with avatar anonymity, and even though if you could uh, um, overcome this anonymity problem, then how to localize in the blockchain. All academics who has written on the subject so far agree on the fact that there is no way to localize any situation on the blockchain that is decentralized, where you don't know the uh, identity of anyone, and so this is a really new um, uh, paradigm in international private law. So the reaction of international law is extraterritoriality and using every time the place of the victim of the contract, uh, the contract uh, non-performance obligation, uh, sorry, the contract in execution or uh, the damage, for example, we go back to Lex Fori, we go back to any court of the victim, but then how do we know if someone brings a claim against someone she doesn't know who? Who, 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 how do you identify the person you're bringing a claim against on the blockchain? You don't. So we could go with uh, non-anonymity by design, maybe with blockchain, but for now there is no regulation. I think that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Cecile. Conclusive word now. Okay, uh, I don't, we, we're a little over time, so we're gonna limit any questions, but does anybody have, is Pietro still with us, you know? I think so, yeah. I think he's still on, even if we don't. 
Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Would you like Joe Biden running. Well, actually, maybe it's not exactly a question. It's more a point of discussion. Uh, I think uh, we all agree that unless um, you know, you implement something else, another mechanism in addition to the blockchain to understand and recognize the user. So, you know, you have blockchain that provides for uh, pseudonymization, anonymization, depending if you are able to trace back to the user. And then you have an additional layer within the platform for a traditional registration. Okay, in that case, it's possible to understand hopefully, where the user is located. But apart from that case, as you said, it becomes difficult. So uh, thinking back at the use case that I brought yesterday, you know, I would like to have your, opi your opinion. Like, you can understand where the corporations are located because maybe corporations are forced to provide more details for the purpose of the registration and so for the for purpose of jumping in uh, this metaverse platform. But if users are not required the same, then it becomes difficult to understand what, uh, if and to what extent uh, European legislations might apply. Because you have information about business users, but maybe you don't have any useful information about consumer users. So this is how I see the problem, and I would like to hear your opinion about this and how to solve this issue. And if you believe that given this gap, requiring additional mechanism, like Web2 mechanism, like provide your name, your surname, you know, traditional stuff is required for uh, enabling enforcement of these uh, regulations. Well, there is two questions in, uh, in what you say. The first is that when you have relationship in the metaverse between users, between consumers, how do you identify whether you're, you're dealing in a transaction with a consumer or a business, or is it B2C, is it B2B, is it C2C? And that is something that we can impose on platforms as long as we have intermediaries of platforms. As long as we have platforms, we, can, we have a grasp and we can frame. Uh, but as, uh, uh, the next point is that when you have an open decentralized blockchain and you have no intermediary, uh, then you have a hard time grasping anyone to impose obligations, so that's for sure. But um, there are examples of blockchains who lifted the anonymity. For example, in Delaware, uh, the blockchain for incorporation for societies and everyone knows in the US how Delaware is attractive for societies and how many societies are incorporating in Delaware, so it's not a few. Uh, they can incorporate there and on the blockchain and they are not anonymous. Uh, I would say um, this question of, um, I mean, the, the spirit of the blockchain is comes from the originating the libertarian approach of internet. So it's a fight between the regulatory wish of the states whenever they have interest and the wish of uh, uh, IT believers in this libert libertarian approach. And how can we technically frame such situations? How can we bring back regulations? Europe is trying with extraterritorial uh, text to get some power back, in my opinion. I hope I answered. <laughs> or even so the approach, shall we force consumers and users to be protected even though they wish, they do not hesitate to surrender all their biometric data, for instance. We're gonna end it there. We're not gonna have a uh, seminar within our conference, uh, especially for some of us who then get a good night's sleep last night. Did you get a good night's sleep? Yeah. 
Okay, good. Uh, Pietro, I think we're not going to have a question for you, but That's I do okay. have one. Are you are you an avatar that I'm looking at, or are you the real Pietro? <laughs> it's true. Even this is real. Yeah, it's, yeah it's this blurred, is blurred. Like, looks but fake. it's a it's real blue blurred. case. There's no, no real it's books all, there. It's all physical. It did. Yeah. So we've entered the metaverse at the end of our conference. It's a great thing. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. I, I would, I just a few closing comments, right? Uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that we have some Ukrainian